Preface to Crime, Its Causes and Remedies by Caesar Lombroso, translated by Henry P. Horton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Crime, Its Causes and Remedies by Caesar Lombroso, M.D., Professor of Psychiatry and Criminal Anthropology in the University of Turin, translated by Henry P. Orton, M.A., with an introductory by Maurice Parmeli, Ph.D., Assistant Professor of Sociology in the University of Missouri, author of Principles of Criminal Anthropology, etc. Copyright 1911 by Little Brown and Company. All rights reserved. General Introduction to the Modern Criminal Science Series At the National Conference of Criminal Law and Criminology held in Chicago at Northwestern University in June 1909, the American Institute of Criminal Law and Criminology was organized, and, as a part of its work, the following resolution was passed. Whereas, it is exceedingly desirable that important treatises on criminology in foreign languages be made really accessible in the English language, resolved that the President appoint a committee of five with power to select such treatises as in their judgment should be translated, and to arrange for their publication. The committee appointed under this resolution has made careful investigation of the literature of the subject, as consulted by frequent correspondents. It has selected several works from among the mass of material. It has arranged with publisher, with authors, and with translators, for the immediate undertaking and rapid progress of the task. It realizes the necessity of educating the professions, and the public by the wide diffusion of information on this subject. It desires here to explain the considerations which have moved it in seeking to select the treatises best adapted to the purpose. For the community at large, it is important to recognise that criminal science is a larger thing than criminal law. The legal profession, in particular, has a duty to familiarise itself with the principles of that science as its sole means for intelligent and systematic improvement of the criminal law. Two centuries ago, while modern medical science was still young, medical practitioners proceeded upon two general assumptions. One as to the cause of disease, the other as to its treatment. As to the cause of disease, disease was sent by the inscrutable will of God. No man could fathom that will, nor its arbitrary operation. As to the treatment of disease, there were believed to be a few remedial agents of universal efficacy. Calomel and bloodletting, for example, were two of the principal ones. A larger or smaller dose of calomel, a greater or less quantity of bloodletting, this blindly indiscriminate mode of treatment was regarded as orthodox for all common varieties of ailment. And so his calomel pill and his bloodletting lancet were carried everywhere with him by the doctor. Nowadays, all this is past in medical science. As the cause of disease, we know that they are facts of nature, various but distinguishable by diagnosis and research, and more or less capable of prevention or control or counteraction. As to the treatment, we now know that there are very specific modes of treatment for specific causes or symptoms, and that the treatment must be adapted to the cause. In short, the individualization of disease in cause and its treatment is a dominant truth of modern medical science. The same truth is now known about crime, but the understanding and the application of it are just opening upon us. The old and still dominant thought is, as to cause, that as crime is caused by inscrutable moral free will of the human being, doing or not doing the crime, just as it pleases, absolutely free in advance, at any moment in time, to choose or not to choose the criminal act, and therefore in itself the sole and ultimate cause of crime. As a treatment, there are just two traditional measures used in variant doses for all kinds of crime and all kinds of persons. Jail or a fine, for death is now employed in rare cases only. But modern science, here as in medicine, recognises that crime also, like disease, as natural causes. It need not be asserted for one moment that crime is a disease, but it does have natural causes, that is, circumstances which work to produce it in a given case. And as to treatment, modern science recognises that penal or remedial treatment cannot possibly be indiscriminate and machine-like, but must be adapted to the cause and to the man as affected by those causes. Common sense and logic alike require, inevitably, that the moment we predict a specific cause for an undesirable effect, the remedial treatment must be specially adapted to that cause. Thus the great truth of the present and the future for criminal science is the individualization of penal treatment for that man and for the cause of that man's crime. 
Now, this truth opens up a vast field for re-examination. It means that we must study all the possible data that can be causes of crime. The man's hereditary, the man's physical and moral makeup, his emotional temperament, the surroundings of his youth, his present home and other conditions, or the influencing circumstances. And it means that the effect of different methods of treatment, old or new, for different kinds of men and of causes, must be studied, experimented and compared. Only in this way can accurate knowledge be reached and new efficient measures be adopted. All this has been going on in Europe for 40 years past, and in limited fields in this country. All the branches of science that can help have been working. Anthropology, medicine, psychology, economics, sociology, philanthropy, penology. The law alone has abstained. The science of law is the one to be served by all this. But the public is general, and the legal profession in particular have remained either ignorant of the entire subject or indifferent to the entire scientific movement and the ignorance or indifference has blocked the way to progress in administration. The Institute therefore takes upon itself, as one of its aims, to inculcate the study of modern criminal science as a passing duty for the legal profession and for the thoughtful community at large. One of its principal modes of stimulating and aiding this study is to make available in the English language the most useful treatise now extant in the continental languages. Our country has started late, there is much to cap it up with in the results reached elsewhere. We shall, to be sure, profit by the long period of argument and theorizing and experimentation which European thinkers and workers have passed through, but to reap that profit, the results of their experience must be made accessible in the English language. The effort in selecting this series of translations has been to choose those works which best represent the various schools of thought in criminal science, the general results reached, the points of contact or of controversy, and the contrast of method. Having always in view that class of works which have a more than local value and could best be serviceable to criminal science in our country. As a science has various aspects and emphasis, the anthropological, psychological, sociological, legal, statistical, economic, pathological, due regard was paid in the selection to a representation of all these aspects. And as the several continental countries have contributed in different ways to these various aspects, France, Germany, Italy, most abundantly, but the others each chair, the effort was made also to recognise the different contributions as far as feasible. The selection made by the committee, then, represents its judgement of the works that are most useful and most instructive for the purpose of translation. It is a conviction that this series, when completed, will furnish the American student of criminal science a systematic and sufficient acquaintance with the controlling doctrines and methods that now hold the stage of thought in continental Europe. Which of the various principles and methods will prove best adapted to help our problems can only be told after our students and workers have tested them in our own experience. But it is certain that we must first acquaint ourselves with these results of a generation of European thought. In closing, the committee thinks it desirable to refer the members of the Institute for purposes of further investigation of the literature to the preliminary bibliography of modern criminal law and criminology. Bulletin number one of the Gary Library of Law in Northwestern University, already issued to members of the Congress. The committee believes that some of the Anglo-American works listed therein will be found useful. Committee on Translations, Chairman John H. Wigmore, Professor of Law in Northwestern University, Chicago. Ernst Freund, Professor of Law at the University of Chicago. Maurice Parmel, Professor of Sociology in the State University of Missouri. Roscoe Pound, Professor of Law in Harvard University. Robert B. Scott, formerly Professor of Political Science in the State University of Wisconsin. W. M. W. Smithers, Secretary of the Comparative Law Bureau of the American Bar Association, Philadelphia, PA. Introduction to the English Version The treatment of the criminal up to the latter part of the 19th century is dominated by the theories of the classical school of criminology. This school is based upon the thought of the 18th century philosophers. Its chief founder was the distinguished Italian criminologist Caesar Beccaria in his great work entitled Crimes and Punishments, published in 1764. He condemned the almost unlimited power which judges frequently had in determining the punishment of criminals. This power frequently led to an humane and unjust treatment of the criminal. Filled with a humanitarian feeling, 
and dominated by the democratic ideas of the time, Beccaria insisted that no punishment should be greater than the crime warranted, and that all men should be equal in the eyes of the law. Thus the fundamental principle of the classical school was that the treatment of a criminal should be determined by the character of the crime that he had committed. In each criminal case, it was to be determined what crime had been committed, and then the penalty designated by the penal code was to be applied regardless of the personality of the criminal. We can now discern many variations in the treatment of the criminal from the principle laid down by the classical school. Criminals guilty of the same crime are very frequently not subjected to the same penalty, and the variations in their treatment are not usually due to the differences in their social standing as is frequently the case previous to the time of the classical school. The treatment of the criminal is being based more and more upon his own characteristics rather than upon the character of the crime he had committed. How has this great change come about? The largest credit for it is undoubtedly due to the great Italian criminal anthropologist Cesar Lombroso, who died in October 1909. Few men have suffered the amount of criticism and abuse that Lombroso experienced during his lifetime. But if the degree of interest and difference of opinion aroused by his ideas and the extensive literature devoted to the discussion of them are any indications of his influence, Lombroso is certainly the most important figure in criminological science since Beccaria. Let us see what were the characteristics of his teaching which gave them so great an influence. Lombroso was one of the group of great thinkers of the 19th century who had the courage and the wisdom to apply the positive inductive method of modern science to the study of human and social phenomena. He was not the first one to search for the causes of human conduct in the physiological and mental characteristics of the individual for others, such as Galenus, Gaul and Morel, had preceded him in this study. But no one of these had carried his analysis very far, and the methods used were not always very scientific. Lombroso devoted his whole life to his study and used thoroughly inductive methods. His teachings immediately aroused great opposition, in the first place because the prejudice which existed against attributing human conduct to natural causes. But because of this opposition was also due to the fact that in his first writings he attributed criminal conduct almost entirely to the characteristics of the criminal himself. That, however, he recognised later in the social cause of crime is indicated by this book in which ample weight is given to these social causes. Lombroso commenced his studies by spending several years in studying the characteristics of the criminals in the Italian penitentiaries. In 1876, he published the first edition of his Le Homo Delinquente. In this book, he set forth his theory that crime is caused almost entirely by the anthropological characteristics of the criminal. But in later editions of the same work, he gave more and more weight to the social causes of crime, and ultimately published the work of which the present volume is a translation. While several of his less important books have been translated into English, neither of his two principal works have ever before been translated. Thus, it is that the English-speaking world is acquainted with his theories largely through hearsay. The Committee on European Translations of the American Institute of Criminal Law and Criminology has chosen the second of his great works for translation in the belief that his theories should be better known in the country. The Institute has devoted itself to the work of applying science in the administration of the criminal law, and we are glad to know that Lombroso approved of its work in the following words written shortly before his death. I beg to express my satisfaction at learning of the call for the National Conference on Criminal Law and Criminology to take place in Chicago. It will mark a new era in the progress of criminal law. If I could offer any suggestion to so competent a body of men, would be to emphasize the importance of apportioning penalties, not according to the offence, but according to the offender. To this end, the probation system, which it is the great credit of America to have introduced, should be extended so as to suit the offender's type and individuality. It is futile to fix a term of imprisonment for the born criminal, but it is most necessary to shorten to the minimum the term for the emotional offender and to modify it for the occasional offender and to place a letter under the supervision of a judge, and not to let the fate be so fixed that it amounts merely to a modern form of slavery. The present volume discusses, in the main, the social causes of crime. It has seemed well to the committee that in this introduction there should be given a critical summary of Lombroso's theory as to the anthropological causes of crime 
has set forth in his great work on criminal man. A quotation from Lebozo's opening speech at the 6th Congress of Criminal Anthropology at Turin in April 1906 will give the key to the first stage in the development of his theory. In 1870, I was carrying on for several months researches in the prisons and asylums of Pavia upon cadavers and living persons in order to determine upon substantial differences between the insane and the criminals without succeeding very well. At last I found in the skull of Rigand a very long series of atavistic anomalies, above all an enormous middle occipital fossa and a hypertrophy of the vermis, analogous to those that are found in inferior vertebrates. At the sight of these strange anomalies, the problem of the nature and of the origin of the criminal seemed to me resolved. The characteristics of primitive men and their inferior animals must be reproduced in our times. Many facts seem to confirm this hypothesis, above all the psychology of the criminal, the frequency of tattooing, and of professional slang. The passions, as much more fleeting as they are more violent, above all that of vengeance, the lack of foresight which resembles courage, and courage which alternates with cowardice, the idleness which alternates with the passion for play and activity. His first conception of the criminal, which was greatly modified later on, was, then, that the criminal is an atavistic phenomenon reproducing a type of the past. In order to find the origin of this atavistic phenomenon, he goes back not only to savage man, but also to animals and even to plants. Crime and criminals are, strictly speaking, human phenomena, and are, therefore, not to be found outside of human society. But when a criminal displays a strong tendency towards crime which results from abnormal or pathological, physiological and psychological characteristics, it is necessary to search in the lowest species for characteristics which correspond to those of the criminal. The acts which result from these characteristics Lombroso called the equivalents of crime. Among plants he finds such equivalents in the habits of the insectivorous plants. It is questionable, however, if the so-called murders of insects by these plants can be considered as equivalents of crime, since they are committed by one species against another and belong in the same category with man's habit of eating animals and plants. But among animals are to be found veritable equivalents of crime, in acts contrary to the general habits and welfare of a species by one of its members. Cannibalism, infanticide, and parricide frequently occur, while murder, maltreatment, and theft are used to procure food, to secure command, and for many other reasons. In the past, the idea that crimes are committed by animals was so strong that in ancient times and in the Middle Ages, animals were frequently condemned according to juridical forms or acts harmful to man. Various causes for these equivalents of crime among animals have been noted, as for example, congenital anomalies of the brain. Veterinary surgeons recognise these anomalies to give them as the causes for the misbehaviour of horses. Other causes are antipathy causing murder, old age resulting in ill temper, sudden anger, physical pain, etc. Not only the equivalents of crime, but those of punishment also have been noted among the lower species. Many cases are on record of a group of animals having torn to pieces one of its members who had committed an act contrary to the welfare of the group, or had failed in performing its duties towards the group. In this blind act of vengeance, we see the embryo of the form of social reaction called punishment. There are also many habits of the lowest species, which, because they are natural and normal, cannot be called the equivalent of crime, but which, when reproduced among civilized men, become criminal. The same is true of many habits of savages. For example, Homicide is frequently practiced under social sanction, such as infanticide, murder of the aged, of women, and of the sick, religious sacrifices, etc., while cannibalism is prevalent in many tribes. Theft also exists under social sanction, though it is not so common because the institution of private property is not highly developed among savages. The veritable crimes among savages are those against usage in which an established custom or religious right is violated. In like manner, as among the savages, characteristics are to be found in the child in a normal fashion, which will be criminal in an adult, such as anger, vengeance, jealousy, lying, cruelty, lack of foresight, etc. For the first year or more of its life, a child lacks a moral standard, and its development is determined largely by its surroundings. There are, furthermore, many abnormal children, 
in whom a tendency to crime manifests itself early. It was the consideration of these facts with regard to the lower species, savages and children, which led Lombroso to formulate his first theory that crime is atavistic in its origin. This theory, as we shall see, he modified greatly later on. He discusses the atavistic origin of crime in the first part of his work, and then proceeds to the study of the constitution which the criminal inherits. This we will now briefly summarise. The first series of the characteristics of the criminal is the anatomical. The study of 383 skulls of criminals gives him the results which he sums up in the following words. On considering the results that these 383 skulls give us, it is found that the lingens most frequent are great prominence of the superciliary arches, 58.2%, anomaly in the development of the wisdom teeth, 44.6%, diminution of the capacity of the skull, 32.5%, Synostis of the Sotyrs, 28.9%. Retreating forehead, 28%. Hyperostis of the bones, 28.9%. Plagiocephaly, 23.1%. Warmian bones, 22%. Simplicity of the Sotyrs, 18.4%. Prominence of the occipital protuberance, 16.6%. The middle occipital fossa, 16%. Symbolic Sotyrs, 13.6%. Flattening of the occipital, 13.2%. Osteophytes of the clovis, 10.1%. The incas or epactical bone, 10.5%. A union of many of these anomalies is to be found in the same skull in a proportion of 43%, while 21% have single anomalies. But these figures would have little value if not compared with the corresponding figures for non-criminals, such a comparison results in destroying the significance of some of these anomalies, since they prove to exist in about the same proportion among the latter. But there are others, on the contrary, which are present in a double or triple proportion in the criminals. Such are, for example, sclerosis, the abactyl bone, asymmetry, the retreating forehead, exaggeration of the frontal sinus and the superciliary arches, oxycephaly, the open internasal structure, anomalous teeth, asymmetries of the face, and above all, the middle occipital fossa among males, the fusion of the atlas and the anomalies of the occipital opening. Comparison with the skulls of the insane shows that criminals surpass the insane in most of the cranial anomalies. Comparison with savage and prehistoric skulls shows the atavistic character of some of these anomalies. Atavism, however, does not permit us to explain over the frequent obliquity of the skull and of the face, or the fusion and welding of the atlas with the occipital, or the pleidocephaly, and the exaggerated sclerosis, anomalies which seem to be the result of an error in the development of the fetal skull, or a product of diseases which have slowly evolved in the nervous centres. As to the significance of the cranial anomalies, he says, Is it possible that individuals afflicted with so great a number of alterations should have the same sentiments as men, with a skull entirely normal? And note that these cranial alterations bear only upon the most visible modifications of the intellectual centre, the alterations of volume and of form. A study of the convolutions of the brains of criminals reveals many anomalies, of which he says, it would be too rash to conclude that at last have been found, with certainty, anomalies peculiar to the cerebral circumvolutions of criminals. But it can be very well be said already that in criminals these anomalies are abundant and are of two orders some which are different from every normal type, even inferior, as the transverse grooves of the frontal lobe found by flesh in some cases, and so prominently that they do not allow the longitudinal grooves to be seen. Others are deviations from the type, but recall the type of lower animals. As a separation of the colcanian fissure from the occipital, the fissure of Sylvius, which remains open, the frequent formation of an operculum of the occipital lobe. The histology of the criminal brain also shows many anomalies due in most cases to arrested development. Anomalies of the skeleton, heart, genital organs and stomach are also noted. Then he passes to the study of the anthropometry and physiognomy of 5,907 criminals examined by himself and about a dozen other criminologists. In the anthropometric measurements it may be noted that the type usually reproduces the regional type, that they reach from finger tip to fingertip, with the arms outstretched, is usually superior to the height, frequent left-handedness, and prehensile foot in which the great toe is mobile, 
has removed an unusually long distance from the other toes. Precocious wrinkles, absence of baldness, a low and narrow forehead, large jaws, etc. In the physiognomy, he discusses peculiarities of the hair, iris, ears, nose, teeth, etc., noting difference between different kinds of criminals. In general, many criminals have outstanding ears, abundant hair, a sparse beard, in almost frontal sinuses and jaws, a square and projecting chin, broad cheekbones, frequent gestures, in fact a type resembling the Mongolian, sometimes a Negro. In summarizing the anatomical study of the criminal, he says, The study of the living, in short, confirms, although less exactly and less constantly, this frequency of microcephalies, the asymmetries of oblique orbits, of prognathisms, of frontal sinuses developed, as the anatomical table has shown us. It shows new analogies between the insane savages and criminals. The prognathism, the hair abundant, black and frizzled, the sparse beard, the skin very often brown, the oxycephaly, the oblique eyes, the small skull, the developed jaw, the zygomas, the retreating void, the voluminous ears, the analogy between the two sexes, a greater reach, a new characteristics added to the characteristics observed in the dead which bring the European criminals nearer to the Australian and Mongolian type, while the strabism, the cranial asymmetrics, and the serious histological anomalies, the ostomates, the meningetic lesions, the hepatic and cardiac, also show us in the criminal a man abnormal before his birth, by arrested development or by disease acquired from different organs, above all from the nervous centres, as in the insane, and make him a person who is, in truth, chronically ill. The study of the anatomical characteristics of the criminal enabled him to separate the born criminal from the criminal of habit, of passion, or of occasion who is born with very few or no abnormal characteristics. Leaving aside for the moment the latter classes of criminals, he takes up the biological and psychological characteristics of the born criminals, the first being the psychological characteristic of tattooing. One of the most characteristic traits of primitive man or of the savage, is facility with which he submits himself to this operation, surgical rather than aesthetic, and of which the name even has been furnished to us by the oceanic idiom. By means of the statistics of 13,566 individuals, of which 4,376 were honest, 6,347 criminal, and 2,943 insane, he shows that tattooing is quite common in some of the inferior classes of society, but is most common among criminals. It may be said that for the last, it constitutes an account of its frequency, a specific and entirely new anatomical legal characteristic. He cites many causes for tattooing, such as religion, imitation, carnal love, vengeance, idleness, vanity, and above all, atavism. But the first and principal cause which has spread this custom among us is, in my opinion, atavism or this other kind of historic atavism called tradition. Tattooing is in fact one of the essential characteristics of primitive man, and of the man who is still living in a savage state. After noting peculiarities of the molecular exchange, as indicated in the temperature, pulse, and urine, he discusses the general sensibilities of the criminal. The special taste of criminals for a painful operation so long and so full of danger as tattooing. The large number of wounds their bodies present lead me to suspect in them a physical insensibility greater than amongst most men, an insensibility like that which is encountered in some insane persons, and especially in violent lunatics. Numerous experiments have revealed obtuseness in the sensibility of many parts of the body. Peculiarities have been noted in the visual acuteness and visual field, in the smelling, the taste, and the hearing, in the motility, in the reaction to various external influences, and the vasomotor reflexes. From all of these facts, it could be deduced that nearly all the different kinds of sensibility, tactile, olfactory, and of the taste, are obtuse in the criminal, even in the occasional criminal as compared with a normal man. While in the criminal, as in the insane and hysterical, the sensibility to metals, to the magnet, and to the atmosphere is exaggerated. Their physical insensibility recalls quite forcibly that of savage peoples who can face, in the initiations of puberty, tortures which a man of the white race could never endure. From this study showing the marked analgesia of the criminal, he passes to his affected sensibility. In general, the criminal man, the moral insensibility, is as great as the physical insensibility. Undoubtedly, 
the one is the effect of the other. It is not that in him the voice of sentiment is entirely silent, as some literally men of inferior ability suppose, but it is certain that the passions which make the heart of the normal man beat with the greatest force are very feeble in him. The first sentiment which is extinguished in these beings is that a pity for the suffering of another, and this happens just because they themselves are insensible to suffering. Then he discusses various psychological characteristics of the criminal, showing his instability, vanity, lasciviousness, laziness, lack of foresight, etc. He shows that his intelligence varies greatly among the different classes of criminals. He discusses at some length the argot or professional slang of criminals. Atavism contributes more to this than any other thing. They talk differently from us because they don't feel in the same way. They talk like savages because they are veritable savages in the midst of this brilliant European civilization. In a similar manner, he studies the hieroglyphics, writing, and literature of criminals. In the first volume of this work, Lombroso describes the characteristics of the born criminal, who, as we shall see, he believes represents a distinct anthropological type. In the second volume, he takes up first certain analogies which he believes exist between the born criminal and certain other abnormal types and then deals with the other classes of criminals. At first he deals with the analogy and indeed the identity which he believes exists between congenital criminality and moral insanity. The characteristics of the born criminal that we have studied in the first volume are the same as those of the moral imbecile. Under the name of moral imbecility, psychiatrists have classified the insane, whose most prominent pathological characteristic is a complete or almost complete absence of moral feeling and of moral ideas. The famous English alienist Henry Maudsley has described this class in the following words. Notwithstanding prejudices to the contrary, there is a disorder of the mind, which without illusion, delusion or hallucination, the symptoms are mainly exhibited in a perversion of those mental faculties which are usually called the active and moral powers, the feeling, affection, propensities, temper, habits and conduct. The effective life of the individual is profoundly deranged and his derangement shows itself in what he feels, desires, and does. He has no capacity of true moral feeling, or his impulses and desires, to which he yields without check, are egotistic. His conduct appears to be governed by immoral motives, which are cherished and obeyed without any evident desire to resist them. There is an amazing moral insensibility, the intelligence often acute enough being not affected otherwise than in being tainted by the morbid feeling under the influence of which the persons think and act. Indeed, they often display an extraordinary ingenuity in explaining, excusing, or justifying their behaviour, exaggerating this, ignoring that, and so coming the whole as to make themselves appear the victims of misrepresentation and persecution. Such a person may very easily become a criminal. A person who has no moral sense is naturally well fitted to become a criminal, and if his intellect is not strong enough to convince him that crime will not in the end succeed, and that it is Therefore, to the lowest grounds of folly, he is very lucky to become one. Moral insanity may be caused by various abnormal or pathological mental characteristics, congenital or acquired in the individual. Whenever one of these characteristics destroys the capacity for moral feeling and for comprehending moral ideas, the individual becomes a moral imbecile. Moral insanity, therefore, is not a morbid entity in the sense that it arises out of one pathological mental characteristic or state of mind. It is, on the contrary, as Bayer has said, a symptom common to various cerebral diseases. Lombroso, however, apparently regarded it as such an entity, for he frequently spoke of it as if it were a distinct disease, and furthermore, he identified it with a born criminal who he considered a distinct type. He cites a good deal of evidence in support of this identification. One of the things which proved directly the identity of moral insanity and of crime, and which at the same time explains to us the doubts with which the aliens have been possessed up to this day, is the extreme rarity of the first in the insane asylums, and its great frequency, on the contrary, in the prisons. After supporting this statement with statistics, he demonstrates many likenesses between the moral imbecile and the born criminal, with regard to the weight, the skull, the physiognomy, the analgesia, tactile, sensibility, tattooing, vascular reaction, affectability, etc. By contending that there is an identity between the moral imbecile and the born criminal, 
It does not, however, mean that every moral imbecile is a criminal. For that matter, not every person born with a criminal temperament becomes a criminal, for external circumstances may resist and overcome the innate criminal tendencies. But he believes that in physical constitution and mental characteristics, the two are fundamentally alike. This identity of the moral imbecile with the born criminal is, he believes, still more conclusively proved by a similar likeness which he finds between the criminal and the epileptic. The objection has justly been made against this fusion that the cases of true moral insanity that I have been able to study are too restrictive in number. That is true, but is after all very natural, for precisely because moral imbeciles are born criminals, they are not found as frequently in the asylum as in the prison, and it is also for that reason that it is not easy to establish a comparison. But there exists in epilepsy a uniting bond, much more important, much more comprehensible, which can be studied upon a great scale, that unites and bases the moral imbecile and the born criminal in the same natural family. As in the case of the analogy between the moral imbecile and the born criminal, he demonstrates many likenesses between the epileptic and the born criminal, in height, weight, the brain, the skull, the physiognomy, the flat and prehensile foot, the sensibility, the visual field, motility, tattooing, etc., Criminality is therefore an atavistic phenomenon which is provoked by morbid causes of which the fundamental manifestation is epilepsy. It is very true that criminality can be provoked by other diseases, hysteria, alcoholism, paralysis, insanity, prenasthenia, etc. But it is epilepsy which gives to it, by its frequency, by its gravity, the most extended basis. But while all born criminals are epileptics, according to Lombroso, not all epileptics are born criminals. In all three, congenital criminality, moral insanity, and epilepsy, we find the irresistible force which results in crime or similar irresponsible acts. The perversion of the effective sphere, the hate exaggerated and without motive, the absence or insufficiency of all restraint, the multiple hereditary tendencies are the source of irresistible impulses in the moral imbecile, as well as in the born criminal and the epileptic. These two analogies between the born criminal and the moral imbecile and the epileptic mark the second stage in the development of his theory. The studies which form the first part of this volume accord admirably with those which have been developed in the second and third parts of the first volume to make us see in the criminal a savage and at the same time a sick man. In other words, he no longer sees in the born criminal only an atavistic return to the savage, but also arrested development and disease thus making the born criminal both a nativistic and a degenerate phenomenon. He now passes to the treatment of the classes of criminals, other than the born criminal. The first of these is the criminal by passion. Among the criminals there is a category which is distinguished absolutely from all others. It is this of the criminals by passion, who ought rather to be called criminals by violence, because as we have seen, and as we shall see better still in their etiology, all these crimes have for substratum the violence of some passion. These criminals are quite rare, are usually young, have few anomalies of the skull, a good physiognomy, honesty of character, exaggerated affectabilities oppose the apathy of the born criminal, and frequent repentance after the crime, sometimes followed by suicide or reformation in prison. A larger percentage of them are women than among other criminals. The passions which excite these criminals are not those which rise gradually in the organism, as avarice and ambition, but those which burst forth unexpectedly, as anger, platonic, or filial love, offended honour, which are usually generous passions, and often sublime. On the other hand, those which predominate in ordinary criminals are the most ignoble and the most ferocious, as vengeance, cupidity, carnal love, and drunkenness. But in them, as in ordinary criminals, are found sometimes traces of epilepsy and impulsive insanity, shown by the impetuosity, suddenness, and ferocity of their crimes. The frequency of suicide among criminals by passion also indicates a pathological state of mind. A special kind of criminal by passion is a political criminal. In nearly all political criminals by passion, we have noticed an exaggerated sensibility, a veritable hyperesthesia as in the ordinary criminals by passion, but a powerful intellect, a great altruism pushed them towards ends much higher than those of the latter. There is never wealth, vanity, the smile of woman, even though often eroticism is not lacking in them, as in Garibaldi, Mazzini, Cavour. 
which impel them, but rather the great patriotic religious scientific ideas. Statistics show a much higher proportion than the average of insane persons among criminals, and therefore Lombroso deals next with insane criminals as a special class of criminals. A study made upon 100 insane criminals, chosen by preference from those who had become insane before the crime, with the exception of the epileptics, has shown to me the frequency of the criminal type, that is to say, the presence of five or six characteristics of degeneracy, and especially outstanding years, or Zanans. Frontal sinuses, a voluminous jaw and zygoma, a ferocious look or strabism, a thin upper lip, in the proportion of 44%. This fact, however, does not lead him to identify the insane criminal with the born criminal, but he finds numerous analogies between the two in the weight, height, skull, tattooing, etc., and also many psychological analogies in the manner of committing a crime. He connects certain kinds of crime with certain kinds of insanity. I've just mentioned the existence of certain kinds of insanity, which reproduce each other subspecies of criminality, so that to the judicial figure of incendiarism or of homicide can be opposed the psychiatric figure of pyromania, homicidal monomania, paradoxical sexuality, etc. Thus he opposes to the judicial figure of theft the psychiatric figure of kleptomania, to habitual drunkenness, dipsomania, to rape and bedistry, sexual inversion, to crimes of lust, cetriasis, and nymphomania, to idleness and vega bondage, to neurasthenia. He then discusses the psychological differences between the born criminal and the insane criminal with respect to the different kinds of mental maladies, and to the differences in motives for crimes and the manner of committing them. He finishes the study of the insane criminal with a study of three special kinds, the alcoholic criminal, the hysterical criminal, and the criminal matoid. The last part of his work is devoted to the occasional criminal. Of this study, he says, If I have been forced to delay for several years the publication of this book, it has been on account of this part in particular. For though in possession of numerous documents, direct contact with the facts failed me in the measure that I was trying to approach myself to them. The abundance of the facts also, their excessive variety, constituted for me a cause of uncertainty which prevented me from reaching a conclusion. The first group with which he deals is that of the persuader criminals. These criminals are those who commit crimes involuntarily, who commit acts which are not perverse or prejudicial to society, but which are called crimes by the law, who commit crimes under very extraordinary circumstances, such as in defence of the person, of honour, or for the substance of the family. These crimes are rather judicial than real, because they are created by imperfections of the law rather than by those of men. They do not awaken any fear for the future, and they do not disturb the moral sense of the masses. The next group is that of the criminaloids. Here, the accident, the all-powerful occasion, draws only those who are already somewhat predisposed to evil. The occasions out of which these crimes arise are the temptation to imitate, the constant opportunities offered by the commercial profession for fraud, abuse of confidence, etc., the associations of the prison, a passion less intense, then the criminal by passion which draws an honest man slowly to crime. The criminal couple, the stronger member of which, having evil tendencies, perverts the weaker epidemic, allurement, etc. These are individuals who constitute the gradations between the born criminal and the honest man, or better still, a variety of born criminal who has indeed a special organic tendency but one which is less intense, who has therefore only a touch of degeneracy, that is why I will call them criminaloids, but it is natural that in them the importance of the occasion determining the crime should be decisive, while it is not so for the born criminal, for whom it is a circumstance with which he can dispense, and with which he often does dispense, as for example, in case of brutal mischievousness. This position of the criminaloid between the born criminal and the honest man is in harmony with all natural phenomena, while the most striking phenomena are in continuity with a series of analogous phenomena less accentuated, just as in the moral sphere we have genius, talent, intelligence, etc. In the pathology of degeneracy, the cretin, the cretinous, the subcretin, the idiot, the metoid, the imbecile, etc. The third group of occasional criminals is that of the habitual criminal. The greatest number of these individuals is furnished by those who, normal from birth and without tendencies for a peculiar constitution of a crime, not having found in the early education of parents, schools, etc., 
This force which provokes, or better said, facilitates the passage from the physiological community, which we have seen belongs properly to an early age, to a normal, honest life, fall continually lower into the primitive tendency towards evil. So that these individuals without an abnormal hereditary are led not by one circumstance offering the occasion for crime, but by a group of circumstances conditioning their early life into a career of crime. Associations of criminals, such as those of brigands, mafia, and camorra in Italy, and the Black Hand in Spain, etc., contain many members drawn to crime by their associates. In the classes in which, on account of wealth, power, etc., their conditions are against the commission of crime. The criminal tendencies of those born with such tendencies remain latent or manifest themselves in other ways. Finally, there is a class of epileptoids in whom there is a substratum of epilepsy, which sometimes forms a basis for the development of criminal tendencies. In the first edition of this work, Lombroso gave excessive weight to the anatomical and anthropometric data, which was not very surprising, since they were the most obvious and the most easily obtainable. The excessive emphasis laid upon the anatomical characteristics of the criminal led him to distinguish but one type, the criminal as an atavistic phenomenon. This immediately called forth the charge of unilaterality. The idea still exists that Lombroso recognised but one type of criminal who was a result of a single cause, namely atavism. But the brief summary of his work, which I have so far given, is sufficient to disprove this. We have seen that the addition to studying the anatomical characteristics of the criminal, he makes a lengthy study of his biological and psychological characteristics as well. In the latter editions of his work, he rejected in part the atavistic theory of crime, no longer considering atavism as the only cause of crime, and adopted the theory of degeneracy as one of its causes. In this edition, I have demonstrated that in addition to the characteristics truly atavistic, there are acquired and entirely pathological characteristics. Facial asymmetry, for example, which does not exist in the savage. Strabism, inequality of the ears, dyschromatopsy, unilateral paresia, irresistible impulses, the need of doing evil for the sake of evil, etc., and the sinister gaiety, which is noticeable in the professional slang of criminals, and which, alternating with a certain religiousness, is found so often in epileptics, the very added meningitis and softening of the brain, which certainly do not result from atavism. In his studies on moral imbecility and epilepsy, he has demonstrated the analogies between these two and congenital criminality. Though his identification of the moral imbecile with the born criminal and of the born criminal with the epileptic may be disproved, his demonstration of the pathological likeness of the three to each other is incontestable. In his study of the insane criminal, he has exposed the characteristics of another very abnormal criminal type. He has demonstrated the abnormality of certain of the criminals by passion. In the criminal lawyer he has shown a criminal partially abnormal, who, however, would not commit a crime until a good opportunity presents itself. The habitual criminal, though born without criminal tendencies, has then developed in him by the circumstances of his early life. Finally, in some of the criminals by passion, and the pseudo criminal, we find entirely normal persons who have committed crimes under very exceptional circumstances. Thus we see how very synthetic in his study of the characteristics of the criminal, since it ranges from the most abnormal to the perfectly normal, and their borders upon the study of the social causes of crime, which he takes up a great length in the work which the present volume is a translation. The theory which is most closely connected with the name of Lombroso is that of the criminal anthropological type. That is to say, his theory that there is an anthropological type which corresponds to habitual criminal conduct. This has been the most contested idea in criminal anthropology and the one that has received the largest amount of discussion in books, congresses, etc. Though this idea of a criminal type has been suggested several times in the past, it was fully dealt for the first time by Lombroso. We have already surmised his conception of the born criminal who constitutes for him a distinct criminal type. A quotation from his speech at the Congress of Criminal Anthropology at Turin in 1906 has shown that his early studies led him to regard the criminal as an atavistic type, as reproducing the characteristics of lower races and species. This theory offered in his early works, as an explanation of the congenital criminal tendencies, was severely attacked on account of its unilaterality. These criticisms and his further research has led him, as we have seen, to modify his theory and to recognise degeneracy as the cause of congenital criminality. 
He even came to regard atavism as a form of degeneracy, as where he specs the criminal type as the presence of five or six characteristics of degeneracy, and especially outstanding ears, orels and hounds, frontal sinuses, jaw, and zygomas voluminous, a ferocious look or strabism, thin upper lip. This recognition of degeneracy as a cause of crime has made Lombroso's doctrine more Catholic, so that it is much easier to connect the criminal with the social and physical conditions out of which he has evolved. But it is questionable, as we shall see, whether degeneracy can be regarded as a form of atavism. In order to make more distinct his conception of the criminal type, he discusses the character of a type in general as follows. In my opinion, one should receive the type with the same reserve that one uses in estimating the value of averages in statistics. When one says that the average life is 32 years and the most fateful month is December, no one understands by that that everybody must die at 32 years and in the month of December. The type is, therefore, an abstract conception including the characteristics which are most common in a certain group of individuals. But this does not mean that every individual in the group must have all these characteristics. As Isidore G. St. Hilaire has said, The type is a sort of fixed point and common centre about which the differences presented are like so many deviations in different directions and oscillations, varied almost indefinitely about which nature seems to play, as the anatomists used to say. Applying this general conception of a type, it is evident that every criminal representing this type need not have all its characteristics. In fact, it is doubtful if any one criminal ever did have all these characteristics. Furthermore, he discusses what percentage of criminals represent the criminal type. This number he places at about 40%. The objection has been made that it is impossible to talk about a criminal type when 60% of the criminals do not represent it, to which he replies as follows. But in addition to the fact that the vigour of 40% is not to be disdained, the insensible passage from one character to another manifests itself in all organic beings. It manifests itself even from one species to another. With more reason, it is so in the anthropological field, where the individual variability, increasing in direct proportion to improvement and to civilization, seems to efface the complete type. We can give no more space to this summary of Lombroso's theory but must now make certain comments and criticisms. Strange to say, Lombroso seems to have been somewhat ignorant of biology, and especially the theory of hereditary. This is indicated, for example, by the loose way in which he uses the term atavism. It is true that biologists recognise that atavism, or reversion, as they usually call it, takes place when they reappear, individual of the present day characteristics of an earlier type. If this reappearance is a result of hereditary forces, that is to say, if earlier characteristics which have long remained dormant reassert themselves in the germplasm at the time of conception, there is a true case of reversion. But it is very evident that many of the criminal characteristics which Lombroso calls atavistic are not hereditary in their origin, but are the causes of arrested development, either before or after birth. This is the case when he speaks of degeneracy as a form of atavism. For it is very evident that most, if not all the characteristics he has in mind, are not congenital. The fact that the individual has them at birth does not indicate necessarily that they are congenital, for they may be the result of rested development during the antenatal period of the life of the individual. In other causes, he calls characteristics atavistic, which are simply habits which have been transmitted by social means. For example, he seems to regard the habit of tattooing as an atavistic trait, but tattooing is no more than a habit which could not possibly be transmitted by hereditary means. This indicates that Lombroso may have believed in the hereditary transmission of acquired characteristics, though he nowhere explicitly states his opinion as to this point. But he again and again speaks as if habits, or the effects of habits, are transmitted by hereditary means. The consensus of opinion of biologists today is that no acquired characteristics can be transmitted by hereditary means. Therefore, Lombroso was very much in error in this respect. Lombroso believed that there is a criminal anthropological type, or rather there are several such types which correspond to habitual modes of criminal conduct. Here again he seems to be holding the belief that acquired characteristics are inheritable, for otherwise it is conceivable that any anthropological type necessarily possesses certain habits. Such a type may possess congenital tendencies which make it more likely to acquire certain habits, but this is not necessarily the case. 
It is true that the laws of recognized and environmental forces might prevent the individual from expressing these inborn tendencies to certain kinds of action and acts. But he laid too much emphasis upon the extent to which the habits of a person are determined by hereditary forces. But whatever may have been his faults, Lombroso was a great pioneer whose original and versatile genius and aggressive personality led to the great movement towards the application of the positive, inductive methods of modern science to the problem of crime and who stimulated, more than any other man, the development of the new science of criminology. The breadth of his treatment of the subject of crime is nowhere illustrated better than the present volume, in which a large number of the complex causes of crime are discussed. It is therefore to be hoped that through this volume, the English-speaking world would acquire an adequate idea of his genius and the great services he rendered to the study and treatment of crime. Maurice Parmel The Author's Preface To Max Nordau To you, as the ablest and most beloved of my brothers in arms, I dedicate this book. In it, I attempt by means of facts to answer those who, not having read my criminal man, of which it is the necessary compliment, nor the works of Pellman, Carilla, Van Hamel, Salilis, Ellis, Bleuler, and others, accuse my school of having neglected the economic and social causes of crime, and having confined itself to the study of the born criminal, thus teaching that the criminal is riveted irrevocably to his destiny, that humanity is no escape from his atavistic ferocity. Now, if this charge were true, the unfortunate nature of the facts revealed could not be urged against a school which discovered them. But the truth is that, while the old jurists had nothing to propose for the prevention of crime more efficacious than the cruel and sterile empiricism of the prison and deportation system, and while the most practical peoples have arrived at good results, only sporadically, and as a chance outcome of unsystematic groupings, my school has devised a new strategic method of proceeding against crime based upon a study of its etiology and nature. In the first place, the distinction which we have made between the criminaloid, the occasional criminal, the criminal by passion, and the born criminal, as well as a study of the more important classes of crime, enables us to determine with precision the individuals to whom we can apply our curative processes and the method appropriate to each case. With a born criminal to be sure, only a palliative treatment is possible. This is what I have called a symbiosis, the attempt to utilise a criminal's evil propensities by diverting the course of the criminal instinct. The measure for the attainment of this object, however, can only be individual. But with criminaloids, whose evil propensities are not so deep-seated, we may often hope for better results. Here again it is necessary to commence the treatment in early youth by what I should call moral nurture, which would withdraw the young criminals from the influence of depraved parents and from that of the streets, and place them on farms in the colonies. In this matter, legislation and social influences are of great importance. Thus, emigration from overpopulated countries towards those less thickly settled wards off one of the worst influences, that of a dense population, divorced parents, adulteries, poisonings, etc. While the war made upon drunkenness by religious associations and temperance societies, and through the enforcement of penalties, prevents much brawling of violence. All this has been established by statistics. These directly preventive measures, it is true, do not always suffice. Since it is a need of cerebral stimulation that leads men to drink, and since this need grows with the progress of civilization, it is necessary to get at the root of the evil, and satisfy this need by means less dangerous than drink, such as shows, coffee rooms, etc. But here another difficulty arises. Namely, that nearly all the physical and moral causes of crime present a double aspect, often contradictory. Thus there are crimes which are favoured by density of population, like rebellion, and others, like brigandage and homicide, which are occasioned by sparseness of population. So also why there are crimes caused by poverty, there are almost as many which are encouraged by extreme wealth. The same contradiction is reserved when we pass from one country to another. Thus, when homicide decreases in Italy with the increase of population and wealth, in France this crime increases with the increase of these two factors, a fact which is to be explained by the great influence of alcoholism and of foreign immigration. Religion, which among Protestants appears to prevent many crimes, in many Catholic countries multiplies them, or at least fails to prevent their increase. 
and if education appears to be useful in preventing homicide, theft, assault, etc., it is very often when to advance, seems to encourage fraud, false testimony, and political crime. Difficulty is increased still more by the fact that, even if we find effective methods of combating the influence of environment, it is not easy to apply them. It is possible, for example, to counteract the effect of heat upon the frequency of crimes of violence and immorality by means of cold baths, but it is not easy to bring a whole section of the people to the bathhouses or to the sea, as was done in ancient Rome, and as a practice still is in Calabria. The statesman, then, who wishes to bring crime ought to be eclectic and not limit himself to a single course of action. He must guard against the dangerous effects of wealth no less than against those of poverty, against the corrupting influence of education not less than against that of ignorance. In this labyrinth of contradictions, the only safe guide is the study of the criminal combined with the study of the etiology of crime. From all this we can understand the uncertainty and embarrassment to which these contradictions ex expose our public officials, and can see why men whose trade is law-making find that the most obvious recourse is the modification of a few pages of a penal code. This is why the prison, the worst of all remedies, if we can call it a remedy at all and not a poison, will always be applied to the simplest and most practical means of safety. It has antiquity and custom on its side, and these are points of great importance for the ordinary man. He finds it easier always to apply the same remedy and to find a number of different remedies suited to differences of age, sex, and education. I have traced above only the outlines of the system of criminal therapeutics, which I intend to set forth in this book. But to tell the truth, it is not a system that is entirely new. It has been stated that certain practical nations, less smothered than our own, are not too glorious past, and for that reason less infatuated with the ancient codes, have already here and there arrived empirically without knowing a word of criminal anthropology at several of the forms that I shall suggest. The Asylum for the Criminal Insane, the Truant Schools, the Ragged Schools, the Societies for the Protection of Children, and the asylums for alcoholics are institutions which, without being a part of the criminal code, have been applied more or less completely in North America, England, and Switzerland. For these are happy countries, where religion is less a mass of dogmas and rights than an ardent war against crime, set in these lands, and especially in London itself, where wealth, density, and immigration would naturally favour crime, the conquering march of criminality has been checked. These attempts, however, being partial, scattered, and without contradiction, lack the effectiveness in the eye of the world which proceeds from a complete demonstration, at once theoretical and practical. Yet they have a great value, because practical applications always proceed and repair for a scientific codification, and also because for timid spirits they give to our reforms the most convincing sanction that of experience. What now lies before us is to complete and systematize these reforms in a final way in accordance with the data of biology and sociology. It is this that I intend to do in this book. Cesar Lombroso, Turin, 1906 Translator's Note While the present work is based upon Professor Lombroso's French version, the German translation of Dr. Corilla and Dr. Jensch has been found a valuable commentary upon certain passages and has been followed in the omission of some few notes and other details interesting to Italians only. The French work was published in Paris in 1899, and appears to have been embodied by the author in his Le Homo Delinquente, as the third volume in its latest Italian edition. The German translation was published in 1902. Henry P. Horton, Columbia, Missouri, November 1910 End of Preface Section 1 of Crime, Its Causes and Remedies by Cesar Lombroso. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Crime, Its Causes and Remedies. Part 1 Etiology of Crime. Chapter 1 Meteorological and Climatic Influences, Months, High Temperatures. Subchapter 1. Meteorological and Climatic Influences Every crime has its origin in a multiplicity of causes, often interwined and confused, 
each of which we must, in obedience to the necessities of thought and speech, investigate singly. This multiplicity is generally the rule with human phenomena, to which one can almost never assign a single cause unrelated to others. Everyone knows that cholera, typhus, and tuberculosis have specific causes, but no one would venture to maintain that meteorological, hygienic, and psychic factors have nothing to do with them. Indeed, the best observers often remain undecided as to the truly specific cause of any given phenomenon. Subchapter 2. Extreme Temperature Among the determining causes of all biological activity are reckoned meteorological phenomena, and among these is heat. Thus the leaves of Drosera rotundifolia, after having been immersed in water at 110 degrees Fahrenheit, become infected and more sensitive to the action of nitrogenous substances. But at 130 degrees Fahrenheit, they no longer show any infection, and the tentacles are temporarily paralyzed, not regaining their mobility until immersed in cold water. Physiology and statistics show that most human functions are subject to the influence of heat. It is to be expected, then, that excessive heat will have its effect upon the human mind. History records no example of a tropical people that has not fallen into subjection. Great heat leads to overproduction, which in turn becomes a cause, first, of an unequal distribution of wealth, and then as a consequence of great inequality in the distribution of political and social power. In the country subject to great heat, the mass of the people count for nothing, they have neither voice nor influence in the government, and, though revolutions may often occur, these are but palace revolutions, neither uprisings of the people who attach no importance to them. Buckle, among other reasons, finds an explanation in the fact that the dwellers in hot countries need less food, clothing and fuel, and do not possess the power of resistance which dwellers in colder countries acquire in their contest with nature. On this account, tropical peoples are more inclined to inertia, to the use of narcotics, to the passive meditation of the yogi, and to the extravagant ascetism of self-torture of the fakir. The inertia brought on by the heat and the constant feeling of weakness that follows it, renders the constitution more liable to convulsions, and favours a tendency to vague dreaming, to exaggerated imagination, and in consequence to fanaticism, at once religious and despotic. From this condition of things flows naturally excessive licentiousness, alternating with excessive ascetism, as the most brutal absolutism alternates with the most unrestrained anarchy. In cold countries, the power of resisting hardship is greater, owing to the expenditure of energy necessary in preparing food, clothing and fuel. But just for the reason, a visionary and unstable character is less frequent, an excessive cold making the imagination active, the mind less irritable and less inconstant. The contest with the cold consumes energy that would otherwise have been available for the social and personal activity of the individual. From this fact, and from the depressing effect which the cold exercises directly upon the nervous system, proceed the placidity and mildness of the inhabitants of the polar regions. Dr. Rink depicts certain Eskimo tribes as so pacific and placid that they have not even a word for quarrel, their strongest reaction to an affront being merely silence. Larry notices that on the retreat from Moscow, the snows of Russia made weaklings living cowards of soldiers whom, up to that time, neither danger, wounds, nor hunger have been able to shake. Bov relates that among the Chukchi at 40 degrees below zero, there are no quarrels, acts of violence, or crimes. Prayer, the bold polar traveller, notes how at the same temperature his will became paralysed, his senses dulled, and his speech embarrassed. This explains why not only despotic Russia, but also liberal Scandinavian countries have rarely experienced revolutions. Subchapter 3. Influence of Modern Temperature The influence which is most apt to reduce a disposition towards rebellion and crime is that of a relatively moderate degree of heat. This is confirmed by a study of the psychology of the peoples of southern Europe, which shows us that they tend to be unstable and to subordinate the interests of the community and state to the individual. This is doubtless because heat excites the nervous centres, as alcohol does, without, however, arriving at the point of producing apathy, and further because the climate, without removing human needs entirely, reduces them by increasing the productivity of the soil, at the same time diminishing the necessity for food, clothing, and alcoholic drinks. In the dialect of Parma, the son is called the father of ragamuffins. Daudet, who has written an entire novel, 
nor my rule less done to depict the great influence of the climate of southern europe upon conduct says the southerner does not love strong drinks he is intoxicated by nature sun and wind distill in him a terrible natural alcohol to whose influence every one born under this sky is subject some have only the mild fever which sets their speech and gesture free redoubles their audacity makes everything seem rosy-hued and drives them on to boasting others live in a blind delirium and what southerner has not felt the sudden giving way the exhaustion of his whole being that follows an outburst of rage or enthusiasm neri to fossio napoli a copoli da occhio remarks that inconstancy is a characteristic of the southern peoples one at first considers them naive until suddenly one perceives that they are finished rascals they are at the same time industrious and lazy sober and intemperate in short their character at least among the lower classes has such different aspects and changes so rapidly that it is impossible to fix it the climate favours the loss of modesty the people are prolific the thought of the future of their children does not terrify them the lazarone steals when he has a chance but never when there is any risk to be incurred a boaster he promises ten things and performs one if he falls into a quarrel he shouts and gesticulates to arouse fear though he is afraid himself he tries to avoid actual fighting but becomes wild if it comes to actual blows jealous he slashes his wife's face if he dubs her independent he can endure neither hospitals nor asylums when he has work he does it well he feels a strong affection for his family contents himself with little has not become intoxicated crafty mendacious and timid his existence is a series of petty frauds deceits and acts of beggary to get a few cents in arms he is capable of kissing your shoes without feeling himself humiliated thereby his science is superstition meeting a hunchback or a blind man conveys a quite definite already his ideas move in the same circle of god devil witches evil eye holy trinity honour knife theft ornaments and comora the masses fear this last but respect it for they feel that this despotic power protects them against the other despots it is the only authority from which they can hope for anything that resembles justice Subchapter four crime and seasons the influence of hate upon certain crimes is then quite comprehensible it is brought out in Gurry's statistics that the crime of rape occurs in england and france oftenest in the hot months and curcio has observed the same thing in italy tables displayed on the page titled rapes committed in england france and italy additional columns sections that statistics up between the months of the year in england according to Gurry, and in italy according to curcio the maximum number of murders falls in the hottest months these occurred a table is displayed on the page with three columns listing the months between july june august may february march december and january and additional two columns of england and italy poisoning also according to Guri, occurs oftenest in may the same phenomenon is reserved in the case of rebellions in studying as i have in my political crime the 836 uprisings that took place in the whole world in the period between 1791 and 1880 one finds that in asia and africa the greatest number falls in july in europe and america the greater prevalence of rebellions in the hot months could not be more clearly marked in europe the maximum proved to be in july and in south america in january which are respectively the two hottest months the minimum falls in europe in december and january and in south america in may and june which again correspond in temperature if now we pass from the whole of europe to the particular countries we still find the greatest number of uprisings in the hot months july leads in italy spain portugal and france august in germany turkey england and with march in greece march leads in ireland sweden norway and denmark january in switzerland september in belgium and the netherlands april in russia and poland and may in bosnia herzegovina servia and bulgaria from this the influence of the hot month would seem to be greatest in the countries of the south subchapter five seasons bringing together by seasons the data of uprisings in europe during a hundred years we get the following a table is displayed on the page with spring summer autumn and winter compared between the nations of spain italy portugal turkey and europe greece france Belgium and the Netherlands, Switzerland, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Serbia and Bulgaria, Ireland, England, Scotland, Germany, Austria-Hungary, 
Sweden, Norway, and Denmark, Poland, Russia, and Europe. From this it appeared that summer holds the first place in the case of five nations, among all those of the south. In the case of four, including the most northerly, it is spring that leads. In one case, Austro-Hungary, it is autumn, and in one other, Switzerland, it is winter. We find further that five times, and principally in the hottest countries, the winter has more revolutions than the autumn. Eight times it has fewer, and three times an equal number. If we consider America, especially South America, remembering that January there corresponds to our July, and February to our August, we shall find tables displayed on the page with spring, summer, autumn, and winter, split between America and Europe. We see, then, that in both hemispheres, summer takes the first place, while spring always surpasses both autumn and winter, doubtless, as with crimes, because of the first heat, but also because of the diminution of the food supply. Autumn and winter, on the contrary, differ little in the number of revolutions, winter giving in America seven more than autumn, and in Europe two fewer. With regard to crimes, also, spring and summer stand plainly in the first rank. Gary gives the following figures for the occurrence of crimes against persons. A table is displayed on the page, in three columns, listed as in England and in France. He is compared with statistics for winter, spring, summer and autumn. Benoiston de Chateau points out that duels in the army are more frequent in the summer. I have proved that the same influence manifests itself in the case of men of genius. Subchapter 6. Hot Years Ferry and his crime in his relation to temperature has proved from a study of the French criminal statistics from 1825 to 1878 that one can deduce an almost complete parallelism between heat and criminality, not only for the different months, but also for years of different degrees of heat. The influence of the temperature on crime from 1825 to 1848 appears to be very pronounced and constant, and is often even greater than that experienced by agricultural production. Since 1848, notwithstanding the most serious agricultural and political disturbances, the coincidence between temperature and criminality becomes from time to time plainly apparent, especially in the case of homicide and murder. This coincidence is to be noted especially in the years 1826, 1829, 1831, 32, 1833, 1837, 1842 to 43, 1844 to 45, 1846, 1858, 1865, 1867 to 68. The connection comes out much more plainly, however, in the statistics of rape and offences against chastity, which follow an even greater degree of annual variations in temperature. This may be seen from the following table. A table displayed on the page of three columns, with the year between 1830 to 1874, the temperature, and the cases of homicide and rape listed in number. As regards crime against property, there is a marked increase in the winter, theft and forgery being most abundant in January, while the other seasons differ little from one another. Here the influence of the weather is entirely different. Needs increase, and the means of satisfying them diminishes. Subchapter 7. Criminal Calendars Lacazane, Chosenod, and Mori, in confirmation of this contention, have constructed, with the aid of the statistics of each individual crime, real criminal calendars upon the model of the botanist calendars of Flora. Among the crimes against persons, infanticide holds the first place in the months of January, February, March and April. 647, 750, 783, 662, which corresponds to the greater number of births taking place in the spring. This number falls off somewhat in May, and considerably in June July, to increase again November and December, through the influence of the carnival. In the months named, we find illegitimate births occurring with great frequency. 1,100, 1,131, 1,095, 1,134, as well as abortions. Homicides and assaults reach their maximum in July, 1716. Parasites, on the contrary, are more numerous in January and October. June is a month which appears a great influence on the temperature on the number of rapes practiced upon children. May, July, and August coming after it. 2,671, 2,175, 2,459, 2,238. The minimum falls in December, 993, followed by the other colder months. 
while the monthly average is 1,684. Rapes upon adults do not follow the same course. The maximum is in June, 1,078. The minimum in November, 534. They increase in December and January, 584. Apparently as a result of the carnival, they remain stationary in February, 616, and increase in March and May, 904, while the monthly average is 693. Assaults are distributed regularly because they are least influenced by the climate. They increase in February, 931, decrease during the following months, 840, 467, to rise again in May, 983, June, 958, going down July, 919, rising once more in August, 997, and September, 993, to undergo a new decrease in November and December, 886. In the case of crimes against property, the variations are not so pronounced, though they are more numerous by 3,000 cases in December and January, 16,879 and 16,396, and the cold season generally than in April, 13,491, and in the hot season. The monthly average is 14,630. Plainly, it is not here a question of the direct effect of the cold, but rather an increase of needs in winter and diminution of the means of satisfying them, so the motives for theft are more abundant. From the investigations of Maury, it is possible to arrive at the following conclusions with regard to the individual months. In March, infanticide holds the first place, accounting for 1,193 crimes out of 10,000. Then comes in order rape, 1,115 cases, substitution of children and concealment of birth, 1,019, Kidnapping, 1,054, and threatening letters, 997. In May, vagrancy comes first, 1,257, then rapes and offences against chastity, 1,150. Then it comes poisoning, 1,144, and finally rape of minors, 1,106. This last crime, under the influence of the heat, rises abruptly to the fourth place in May having been only 35th in March and 10th in April, and reaches the second place in June with 1,303 cases. In June, the first place is held by the inagulous crime of rape upon adults, 1,313. The fourth place also belongs to a sexual offence, abortion, 1,080, while parasite occupies the third place, 1,151. In July, rape of minors rises to the first place, 1,330, and the other most numerous crimes are of a similar kind. Kidnapping, 1,118, and offences against chastity, 1,093. The third place comes bodily injuries to blood relatives, with 1,100 cases. In August, sexual crimes recede to the third place, being the first to crop burning. This, however, is caused not so much by the temperature as by the opportunity. For the harvest time, it is easiest for the workman to revenge himself upon the landlord. However, as Moray rightly observes, the heat is not without its responsibility for the appearance of this passionate tendency. The crimes may be responsible for the fact that perjury becomes rarer than subordination of minors. In September, brutal passions become less violent. Sexual assaults upon children move to the 15th place, and those upon adults to the 25th, while theft and breach of trust take the 4th place. Embezzlement and bribery have the first place in September and October. From those months, rents fall due and accounts are settled. The numerous substitutions and concealments of newborn children correspond to the greater number of births. From October to January, murder, parasite and highway robbery are more frequent, since the nights are long and the fields deserted. In November, business resumes its full activity, and as a consequence, falsification of accounts and bribery increase. In January, the passing of counterfeit money and the robbing of churches takes the first place, apparently on account of the dark days. In February, infanticide and the concealment of birth break out again, corresponding to the increased birth rate. Sexual crimes having fallen in October to the 28th place and rapes upon adults to the 29th rise in November to the 24th and 26th places respectively. There can be no doubt of the influence of heat upon crimes of passion. I prove this in another way, first by consulting the registers of five great Italian prisons, where the punishments inflicted were for rioting, fighting, and violence against persons, 
and secondly from the observations made by Virgilio in the penal institution at Aversa during a period of five years. The following figures show that acts of violence are much more numerous in the hot months. The table is displayed on the page, citing all months of the year. One obtains similar figures in insane asylums by keeping in count of the acute attacks of the insane. The table is displayed on the page, we have three columns, the maximum and the minimum, the list of months, and the years. Subchapter 8. Excessive heat. Excessive heat, on the contrary, especially when coupled with humidity, exercises a slighter influence. Core observed with regard to the crimes of the Creoles in Guadalupe that when the maximum temperature is reached, July 5th, 85 degrees, there is a minimum of crime, especially against persons while in March, with a temperature of 62 degrees, there is a maximum number of criminals. We have here, then, an aversion like that which too great heat produces in the case of revolutions, and this because moist heat, when excessive, acts as a depressant, while moderate cold, on the contrary, acts as a stimulant. There were crimes against property in the hot season, 51, in the cold season, 53, crimes against persons in the hot season, 23, in the cold season, 48. Core observes also that the month of June furnishes the largest number of crimes against persons, and January the smallest. Subchapter 9. Other Meteorological Influences Superintendents of prisons have generally observed that the inmates are more excited when storms are approaching and during the first quarter of the moon. I myself is not sufficient data to prove this, but as the insane, who have numerous points of contact with criminals, very sensitive to the influence of temperature, and respond quickly to the variations of the barometer and of the moon. It is therefore very probable that the same is true of criminals. One fact, however, has proved to me that organic influences are at work at the same time as meteorological. For several years I have noted day by day the criminals received into the jails of Turin, and have always found that upon corresponding days in different years, there have entered a remarkable number of individuals, 10 to 15, with the same bodily peculiarity, persons who had a hernia, or were asymmetric, blonde or brunette, though often coming from different provinces. Entirely different groups were to be found within the days of the same week, when therefore there was no significant change in the influence of the temperature. In recent years, economic and political influences have come to the front and have reduced meteorological causes to the second rate. Thus, in France, the effect of the mean annual temperature upon revolts evident in the past has decreased in the last few years, while Northern Europe, Russia, Denmark, on the other hand, although under the same climatic conditions, has had several uprisings. But nevertheless, the effect of the weather cannot be doubted. Subchapter 10. Crimes and Rebellions in Hot Countries In all this, the preponderance influence of temperature is plainly evident, even if it is not exclusive, and this may be seen still better from the geographical distribution of crimes and political rebellions. In the southern parts of Italy and France, there occur many more crimes against persons than in the central and northern portions. We shall return to this fact again in speaking of brigandage and of the Comora. Guerrier has shown that crimes against persons are twice as numerous in southern France, 4.9, as in central and northern France, 2.7 and 2.9. Vice versa, Crimes against property more frequent in the north, 4.9, than in the central and southern regions, 2.3. In Italy, there occur, my table is displayed on the page, titled, For Each 100,000 Inhabitants. The table displays three columns for indictments for crime, homicides, highway robberies with homicide, and aggravated theft. These are divided up between northern Italy, central Italy, southern Italy, and insular Italy. Liguria, simply because of its warmer climate shows a greater number of crimes against persons than the rest of North Italy. In the period from 1875 to 84, the maximum number of crimes was furnished by Latium and the next highest number by the Ions. The minimum occurred in the North, with 512 crimes to the 100,000 inhabitants in Piedmont and 689 in Lombardy, while Latium showed 1,537, Sardinia 1,293 and Calabria 1,287. We find the greatest number of homicides exclusively in the south and upon the islands. In Russia, infanticide and stealing from churches are most numerous in the southeast, while homicide and especially parasite occurs with a frequency that increases as one goes from the northeast to the southwest. 
Anarchin. Holzendorf estimates that murder is 15 times as frequent in the southern states in North America as in the northern states. So in the north of England, there is one homicide to 66,000 inhabitants, and in the south, one homicide from 4,000 to 6,000 inhabitants. In Texas, according to Redfield, in 15 years, there were 7,000 homicides to 818,000 inhabitants. Even the school children were frequently provided with dangerous weapons. In studying the distribution of simple and aggravated homicides in Europe, we find the highest figures in Italy and the other southern countries, and the lowest in the more northerly regions, England, Denmark, Germany. The same can be said of political uprisings in all Europe. We can see, in fact, that the number of crimes increases as we go from north to south, and in the same measure as the heat increases. We find the maximum in Greece, which with a population of 10 millions, shows 95 revolutions, and the minimum in Russia, for which on the basis of the same population, the number would be only 0.8. We note that the smallest number is to be found in the northern countries, England and Scotland, Germany, Poland, Sweden, Norway and Denmark, and the largest in the southern countries, Portugal, Spain, Turkey and Europe, and southern and central Italy, intermediate numbers in the regions lying between. Grouping the figures in this way, we find, in Northern Europe, about 12 revolts to 10 million inhabitants. In Central, 25 revolts to 10 million inhabitants. In Southern Europe, about 56 revolts to 10 million inhabitants. Considering Italy separately, we find, in Northern Italy, 27 revolts to 10 million inhabitants. In Central Italy, 32 revolts to 10 million inhabitants. In Southern Italy, 33 revolts to 10 million inhabitants including 17 in Corsica, Sardinia, and Sicily. Arranging these crimes by degrees of latitude and figuring their ratio to the population, we arrive at the following table. A table is displayed on the page, with three main columns, the degrees of latitude, and Spain and Italy to 100,000 inhabitants. These are further divided up between the number of crimes committed, and faults against officers of the law, and crimes against persons, resistance to officers, and homicides. From this table, the influence of the climate is plainly to be seen. It is modified only by the influence of the capital, 1 and 2, and other great cities, 3 and 4. Aggravated theft occurs in Spain in the north, Santander, Leon, in the south, and in the centre with nearly equal frequency, as often in Cadiz, as in Badojas, Caqueras, and Salamanca, because these crimes depend less upon climate than upon opportunity. For the same reason, infanticide and parasite are more numerous in the central provinces where the capital is, and in the north, the same is true in France and Italy and in Europe generally. In Italy we see from the investigations of Ferry that in all southern Italy and the islands, with the exception of Sardinia, the influence of the heat is dominant in the number of simple homicides, and with the other exception of Forli, in the case of aggravated homicides also. So likewise, murders increase in southern Italy and the islands, with the exception of the regions colonised by the Greeks at the provinces of Apuli, Catania, Messina, etc. Assaults also vary according to the same law, except in the case of Sardinia, where they are less numerous than would be expected, and of Liguria, where they are more so. Parasites follow a similar course. They are very numerous in southern and insular Italy, with the exception of the Greek portion but very numerous also in the heart of Piedmont. Poisonings abound equally in the islands and in the heart of Calabria, but here the climate is plainly not responsible. Infanticide is likewise very frequent in Calabria and Sardinia, but it rages also in Abruzzo and Piedmont, showing itself to a certain extent independent of the climate. Highway robbery accompanied by homicide is, for the same reasons, very abundant in Upper Piedmont, in Massa and Port Moris as upon the extreme boundaries of Italy and in the islands. Aggravated theft, common Sardinia and Calabria, and at Rome shows another maximum of Venice, Ferrara, Rovigo, Padua and Bologna, and is accordingly almost independent of the climate. The same climatic principle holds in France, where murders and homicides are most prevalent in the south, with some exceptions that may be explained by racial influence. Parasite and infanticide, on the contrary, are most numerous in scattered districts in north, centre and south alike, not from any climatic influence, but essentially because occasional causes are at work in these places. End of section 1
Chapter 2 of Crime, Its Causes and Remedies by Caesar Lombroso. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 2 Influence of Mountain Formation upon Crime, Geology, Soils Producing Goiter, Malaria, etc. Subchapter 11 Geology my earlier investigation showed me that geological conditions have very little influence upon political crime, and that accordingly, in France, uprisings are equally frequent upon the different formations, aside from a slight divergence in the case of the Jurassic and Cretaceous. The same remark applies to crime against persons in France, where, for a period of 54 years, we find the following distribution of these offences in departments predominantly. Jurassic and Cretaceous, 21%. Granite, 19%. Clay, 22%. Alluvial, 21%. The same proportions with almost no differences hold for crimes against property. Subchapter 12. Orography. Upon investigating the relation of the general conformation of the country to frequency of crimes against persons, we find that during 54 years, the minimum, 20%, occurred in the level country. The main, 33%, in departments that were hilly, while the maximum 35% occurred in mountainous departments. This is without doubt due to the fact that the mountains offer more opportunity for ambuscades and also breed a more active race. I have no doubt that there is an actual connection between criminality and a greater activity, for I found the same distribution to hold true in France, Virginia, and for revolutionary tendencies, being both more frequent in the mountainous departments and less so in the plains. Rape, while almost equally common in the mountains, 35%, and among the hills, 32%, is much more common in the level country, 70%, certainly because of the greater and denser population resulting from the large cities. The same may be said about crimes against property, and for the same cause. For these crimes, reverse the order of frequency given for crimes against persons, and while reaching 50% in the plains, show 47% in the hilly departments, only 43% in the mountains. In Italy, this orographic connection is less clear. We find the maximum of crimes against property, 201 to 100,000 inhabitants, in the valley of the Po, on the one hand, and in the mountain and coast districts of Calabria and Leghorn on the other. In Tonquin, piracy is favoured by the system of irrigation, which facilitates the operations of bandits on the sea coast. Subchapter 13. Malaria. Of the districts of Italy that are most visited by malaria, where between 5 and 8 to the thousand of the population die of it, Crosetto, Ferrara, Venice, Cremo, Vercelli, Novara, Lanciano, Vest, San Severo, Catanzaro, Lis, Foggia, Terrahina, and Sardinia. Five out of the thirteen, Crosetto, Ferrara, Sardinia, Lis, and Terrahina, show the maximum number of crimes against property. On the other hand, there seems to be no connection between the occurrence of malaria and of homicide. In southern Sardinia, where malaria is most frequent, there are fewer crimes of this character, and also fewer sexual crimes than in the northern part. The same is true of France, where those departments that are most scoured by malaria, Morbihan, Lens, Loire-et-Cher, Ain, show the smallest number of homicides and rapes. Subchapter 14. Goitrous Districts The great districts of Italy in which Goiter and Cretanism are indigenous, and in which the soil has great influence on the health and intelligence of the inhabitants, like Sondrio, Osta, Novara, Cuno, and Pavia, show no corresponding degree of criminality. All have less than the average number of homicides, of thefts, and with the exception of Sondrio, of sexual offences also. The same remark can be applied to the goitrous districts of France, of which the majority have only from 1.0 to 5.7 homicides to a million inhabitants. Only in the departments of Bessès and Hortsalps, and Pyrenees, Orientales is a number of homicides greater, 9.76 to the million. For theft also, the goitrous districts show very low figures, with the exception of the departments of Dobbs, Vosges, and Ardennes. It is worthy of note, however, that in almost all goitrous districts, there is to be reserved in the performance of crime a great degree of cruelty mingled with lasciviousness. Subchapter 15. Influence of the Mortality Rate of the 23 French departments that show a minimum mortality rate, 7, 
30%, have more than the average number of murders. These are Lot et Garon, Ains, Main, Quach Dior, Ewer, Hort Sion, and Orb, giving an average of 13.9%. Fating departments with an intermediate mortality rate, 6, 33%, show a higher number of assassination than the average. They are Indred Loire, Orb, Bases, Pyrenees, Heralds, Boobs, Sainetois, and Vosges. The 18 departments have 15.4% of murders, that is to say, about as many as the first group. Of 25 departments having a maximum mortality rate, 7, 20% exceed the average number of murders. They are Basses Alps, Hoyt Loire, Cien, Saint in Fier, Bouches du Rhone, Corsica, and Var, which give an average of 28%. If, however, the last two departments be omitted as showing a abnormally high degree of criminality, the figure is only 20%, much nearer the other two. With regards to thefts, of 24 departments with a maximum mortality, 14 exceed 90%, and the same is true of 17 of the 18 departments with an intermediate mortality rate. Of 25 departments having a minimum mortality, 8 pass, 90%. To sum up, then, it may be said that there exists no relation between the mortality rate and the frequency of theft, while the frequency of murder increases as the mortality rises. In Italy, this may be especially well seen in Sardinia, Sicily, and Basilicata. Revolts, likewise, are more common in districts where the mortality is greatest. Of 27 departments in France with a minimum mortality, 15 manifested Republican tendencies under the Empire, but of 27 departments with the highest mortality, 20 were Republican. End of Chapter 2 Chapter 3 of Crime as Causes and Remedies by Cesar Lombroso This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey Chapter 3. Influence of Race. Virtuous Savages. Criminal Centres. Semitic Race. Greeks in Italy and in France. Cephalic Index. Colour of Hair. Jews. Gypsies. Subchapter 16. Influence of Race. We have already seen, and it will become clearer as we proceed, that the notion of crime existing in the mind of the savage is so vague that we often let it doubt its existence in the primitive man altogether. However, many tribes seem to have a relative morality of their own, which they apply in their own fashion, and immediately we see crime arise among them. Among the Uries in America, the respect for property is so great that a threat is sufficient for a boundary line. The Kordiaks and the Mabayas punish homicide committed within the tribe, although they do not regard it as a crime when committed against outsiders. It is plain that without some such law, the tribe could not hold together, but would soon disintegrate. There are, however, tribes to whom even this relative morality is repugnant. So in Karamanza, in Africa, alongside of the honest and peaceful Bagnas, who practice rice culture, we find the Balants, who live by hunting and robbery alone. These put to death any who steal in their own village, but nevertheless steal from other tribes themselves. The one who steals best is most esteemed among them as even paid to teach their children to steal, as well as chosen to lead their marauding expeditions. Not unlike these are the Beni Hassan of Morocco, whose chief business is theft. These are disciplined, live under their own chiefs, with rights recognised by the government, which makes use of their services in the recovery of stolen goods. They are divided into oat thieves, horse thieves, village thieves and highwaymen. There are among them mounted robbers, who flee so quickly that pursuit is fertile, they often slip into houses, naked, and covered with oil, or hide themselves under leaves in order not to frighten the horses. They begin to steal at the age of eight. In India there exists the tribe of the Zakakal, who live by theft. When a boy is born to them, they dedicate him to his future profession by passing him through a hole broken into a house wall, and saying to him three times, Be a thief. The Kurubars, on the other hand, are noted for their honesty. They never lie. I would rather starve than steal. They are therefore said to keep watch over the harvest. Spencer also notes certain peoples as inclined to honesty, such as the Todas, the Enos, and the Boros. These are in general peoples among whom war is held in slight esteem, and who are much engaged in trade. 
As a rule, they do not contend among themselves, believe their affairs to be regulated by the chiefs, and restore half of what is offered to them in their bartering if it appears to them to be too much. They do not apply the lax talonis, are not guilty of cruelty, honour women, and nevertheless, strange to say, are not religious. Among the Arabs, Bedouins, there are honest and industrious tribes, but there are also many others who would lead a parasitic life. These are noted for their spirit of adventure, their reckless courage, the need for continual change, their idleness, and their tendency toward theft. In Central Africa, Stanley found some tribes distinguished for honesty, and others, like the Ziyas, showed a tendency towards robbery and homicide. Among the Kafirs and Hottentots, there are individuals who are especially savage and incapable of working, and what about living by the labour of others? These are called fingers by the Kafirs, and Songkwas by the Hottentots. Mayhew. In our civilised world, do note the proof of the influence on race upon crime is both easier and more certain. We know that a large number of the thieves of London are of Irish parentage and are natives of Lancashire. In Russia, according to Anochin, Bessarabia and Kherson furnish all the thieves of the capital. And the number of convictions in proportion to the number of indictments in their case is unusually great. Criminality is transmitted among them from family to family. In Germany, the districts in which there are colonies of gypsies are recognised as those where the women are most inclined to steal. Subchapter 17. Criminal Centres In every part of Italy, almost in every province, there is here some village renowned for having furnished an unbroken series of special delinquents. Thus in Liguria, Lirius is proverbial for swindlers. Campofredo and Masson for homicides. Pozzolo for highway robberies. In the province of Lucca, Caparroni is noted for his assassinations, and Cari in Piedmont for its field thefts. In southern Italy, Soro, Melfi, and St. Fel have always had their banners since 1860, and the same is true of Partinico and Monreal in Sicily. This predominance of crime in certain countries is certainly due to race, as history clearly shows in the case of some of them. Thus, Pergola, near Pistoja, was settled by gypsies, Masson by Portuguese outlaws, and Caborfetto by Corsican pirates. Even today, the dialect of the latter part is half Corsican, half Ligurian. But the most famous of all is the village of Atena in the province of Rome, which Singel describes thus, situated on the summit of a hill in the middle of a green and smiling plain, under a mild sky, this village where misery is unknown ought to be one of the happiest and most honest. But the reverse is the case. As inhabitants have an evil celebrity throughout all the surrounding country as thieves, brigands, and assassins. This reputation is not a recent acquisition. In the Italian chronicles, one often meets the name of Atina, and its history can be summed up as one long series of crimes. The seriousness of the evil may be seen from the following statistical table. A table is displayed on the page, and it will numbers of crimes to 100,000 inhabitants, with three columns. With crimes listed as Homicides, murders, robberies, followed by homicide, assaults, highway robberies, thefts, simple and aggravated, and divide again between Italy in 1875 to 88 and Artina in 1852 to 88. Artina then is marked by a number of assaults, homicides, and murders six times as great as that of the average of Italy, and by a number of highway robberies thirty times as great. Yet these figures give only a very imperfect idea of the boldness and ferocity of the criminals of Artina. To have this property appreciated, it would be necessary to describe all the crimes, to tell how they commit murders there in broad daylight in public place, how they strangle the witnesses who dare to tell the truth to the judges. The case, according to Skeel, lies in the character of the inhabitants and the influence of earlier governments, which elsewhere gave rise to Brigandage and the Camorra. Further, in the inability of the authorities to punish the guilty, because the witnesses are bribed or intimidated to keeping silent, but above all, in the influence of hereditary. In fact, in an investigation of the proceedings instituted against the inhabitants of Artina since 1852, Sigil came across the same names repeatedly. Father, son, and nephew followed one another, intervals as if driven by a fatal necessity. The name Montefortino, belonging to an ancient family of Artina, was already celebrated for crime as early as 1555. Paul IV in 1557 was obliged to condemn to death all the inhabitants of this town, and authorised anyone to kill them and destroy their castle, that it might no longer furnish a nest and refuge for base thieves. 
It is to be noted that in Sicily, brigandage is almost exclusively confined to that famous valley of the Conca di Oro, where the robber tribes of Berbers and Semites had their first and most lasting places of refuge, and where the anatomical type, the customs, the political and moral ideals still retain the Arabian imprint, as the descriptions of Tomasi Crudels are sufficient to prove. Moreover here, as among the Arabs, cattle stealing is the chief crime. With these facts we can easily be persuaded that the blood of this people at once conquers and robbers. Hospitable and cruel, intelligent and superstitious, and constant, restless, and impatient of restraint, must have its influence in Sicily in implementing the sudden and implacable revolts and perpetuating brigandage. This latter, it is to be noted, is often mixed with politics, as it is in the case of the parent Arabian stock, and excites neither the horror nor the aversion displayed by peoples less intelligent, indeed, by rich Unarian blood, such as those of Catania and Messina in the same island of Sicily. A very different sort of community is that of the La Derello in the province of Volterra, where for sixty years no homicide or theft or even misdemeanor has been committed. That race is a factor in the greater criminality of the places mentioned. I am the more persuaded, though having observed, in the case of most of the inhabitants, a taller stature than in the neighbouring regions. In France, also, a race of criminals has been discovered by Fauvel in a row of villages along the border of the forest of Tyrac, a continuation of the forest of Ardennes. In every place where this race predominates, there are continually violent brawls, to which the authorities must often have to shut their eyes. The stranger who ventures among these people expose himself to the insults of the women as of the men. Even among the well-to-do, the same brutality often shows itself through a certain political varnish. This half-barbarous condition is aggravated by a frequent alcoholism, and the people, scorning over cultural pursuits, betake themselves to work in the forests or in the ironworks. Their real preference, however, is smuggling. They are a little below the average height, but have powerful muscles with broad, strong jaws, straight nose, pronounced eyebrows, and thick, dark hair. This last characteristic separates them at once from the blonde-haired race who inhabit the villages near them, with whom they associate only rarely. Subchapter 18. Europe. In his Homicide, Ferry shows clearly the influence of race upon the distribution of crime in Europe, Latin and Teuton occupying the opposite extreme of the scale, both for homicide in general and also for aggravated homicide and infanticide. The same is true with regard to suicide and insanity, is said that here the order is reversed, and the Teuton shows a maximum in each case, and the Latin the minimum. Subchapter 19. Austria. Very often, however, it is not possible to arrive at an exact estimate of the influence of race from the figures furnished by criminal statistics, for we encounter a whole complexus of causes which prevents us from drawing a definite conclusion. For example, women show the minimum degree of criminality in Spain, Lombardy, Denmark, Slavonia, and Goritz, and the maximum in Austria, Silesia, and the Baltic provinces of Russia. But here the cultural influence is more in evidence than the racial. For with women as educated like the men, as in Silesia and the Baltic provinces, or where they take part with the men in the struggle for existence, they approach men more nearly in the degree of criminality. The same thing may be said of the greater criminality to be observed in the Austrian Empire, chiefly among the use, especially in Salzburg and Austria proper, as compared with the Slavs and Italians of Goritz, Corinthia, and the Tyrol. Subchapter 20 Italy. The following table presents a summary of simple homicides, including assaults followed by death, and aggravated homicides, including high robbery with homicide, for which indictments were brought in the different provinces of Italy in the years 1880-83, inclusive. A table is displayed on the page with two columns, province of Italy with a population in 1891, and the number of indictments for homicide to the million inhabitants split it between simple and aggravated. It is apparent, then, that these crimes are most frequent in the provinces where the population is predominantly Semitic. Sicily, Sardinia, Calabria were purely Latin. Latium and Brussel, as compared with those where the population is Teutonic, Ligurian, Celtic, Lombardy, Liguria, Piedmont, or Slavic, Venetia. Now, beside the original inhabitants, the Ligurians in the north the Arians and Etruscans in the centre, the Oscans in the south, and the Siculi 
of the Gurian origin in Sicily. The principal social elements of the Italian population are the Teutons, Celts and Slavs in the north, and the Phoenicians, Arabs, Albanians and Greeks in the south and on the islands. It is then to the African and Oriental elements, the Greek expected, that Italy owes a frequency of homicide to Calabria, Sicily and Sardinia, where the occurrence of a similar number, as in Lombardy, is due to the large Teutonic element in the population. The effect of race is clear to be seen in certain localities, whose inhabitants differ ethnically from the surrounding population, and where the relative frequency or infrequency of crime coincides with a racial difference. Thus we have a striking contrast in Tuscany, where Siena shows 39 homicides to the million, Florence 43 and Pisa 60, while Massa Carrara shows 83, Rosetto 102, Luca 119, Arezzo 134, and Leghorn 140. Now it is true that in Massa Carrara, the quarries, and in Grosseto the marshes, produce special living conditions, but the ethnic influence is incontestable with the province of Lucca, which is differentiated from the rest of Tuscany by the greatest stature and dilocephaly of its inhabitants, the latter characteristic being found in Massa Carrara also, and the greater tendency to immigration. One may refer also to the effect of Ligurian blood, calling to mind how often the ancient Ligurians revolted against the Roman rule. But in Leghorn, the racial influence is especially evident, and the origin of this is well known. Leghorn in the 16th century was merely a marshy village, having 749 inhabitants in 1551. Its first settlers were the Liburni, an Illyrian people, inventors of the Liburian galley, and notorious pirates. To these were added Saracens, Jews, and Marseillais and later adventurers and pirates invited by the Medici. Leghorn, from which 1879 to 1883 showed the greatest proportion of indictments of crime, furnished likewise comparison with the whole of Tuscany, including Arezzo, the highest numbers of aggravated homicide, rebellion, and aggravated theft. The state of affairs cannot be accounted for by the greater density of the population, for the density of Milan is the same, 919 to the square mile, and that in Naples is much greater, 3,976. Neither is it due to a greater preponderance of the urban population, for the urban residents and neighbors constitute 94% of the total population of the municipality, in Milan 92%, and in Leghorn only 80%. One nevertheless, insurrections and aggravated thefts are much more frequent there. Another very significant contrast is reserved in the southern part of the peninsula. Here the summary of simple homicides shows certain localities in the provinces of Campobasso, Avellino, Cosenza, and Catanzaro, with a relatively high criminality, and localities in the provinces of Benevento, Salerno, Bari, and Lucca, where the frequency of homicide is small in comparison with the neighboring provinces of Aquila, Caserto, Potenza, Reggio, and especially Naples. In the last, the social environment will naturally be expected to be provocative of crime. Now it is difficult not to deduce a casual connection between the presence of Albanian colonies and the great number of crimes of violence in the provinces of Cosenza, Catanzaro, and Campobasso. On the other hand, the less frequent occurrence of simple homicide in Reggio, Naples, and especially in Apulia, Marianlis, depends in great part upon the Greek element of the population. To understand the presence and extent of this element, it is only necessary to recall the ancient Magna Graecia, the latter Greek colonies which arrived during and after the Byzantine supremacy, and the early migrations of the Opagon Messapians. Even today, says Nicolusi, the physiognomy of the greater part of the natives of these provinces recalls this type, through which shines specific sweetness of character. To the effect of the Greek element must be added the ethnic influence of the Norman occupation. As regards the marked infrequency of simple homicide in Salerno and in Benevento, it is impossible not to recall the Lombard element, which was dominant in the Duchy of Benevento and Salerno so long and to such an extent that it has been able to resist the assimilating power of the native Italians and to preserve to this day the tall stature and blonde hair noticeable in the midst of the type indigenous to the peninsula, ferry. The quite indifferent influence of the Albanian, Greek and Lombard elements upon the criminality in these contrasted localities is confirmed by the distribution of aggravated homicide and highway robbery with homicide. Salerno and Reggio, indeed, 
form exceptions having relatively high figures, but Naples, thanks to its Greek blood, shows, notwithstanding the density and poverty of its population, a small number of homicides matching the figures for Barry and Lise. Sicily, also, offers a striking example of the influence of race upon homicide. The eastern provinces, Messina, Catania, and Syracuse, show a number of homicides much smaller than the provinces of Caltanissetta, Gagenti, Trapani, and Palamo. Now, Sicily differs greatly in the character of its population from the neighbouring part of the peninsula, partially because of the numerous northern peoples, Vandals, Normans, French, which have conquered and ruled the island. But on the eastern coast it is the Greek element that is predominant, and it is impossible not to refer to this fact the smaller number of homicides occurring there, nor, on the other hand, to see in the large admixture of Saracen and Albanian blood the reason for great frequency of homicides in the south and north. Recluse writes, At the time of the siege of Palermo by the Normans, 1071 AD, there were five languages spoken in Sicily, Arabic, Hebrew, Greek, Latin, and the popular Sicilian. Arabic remained the dominant language even under the Normans. Later the French, the Germans, the Spaniards, and the Aragonese contributed to make of the Sicilians a people different from their Italian neighbours in dress, manners, customs, and national feeling. The differences existing within the Sicilian population itself are very great, since now one race, now another, gets the upper hand in the mixture. Thus the people of the Etna provinces, who are without doubt of Hellenic origin, being in fact the purest of the Greeks, since they have not been mixed with the Slavs, have an excellent reputation for deportment and amiability. The inhabitants of Palermo, on the contrary, among whom the Arab element is greater than anywhere else, have in general serious faces and dissolute manners. The criminality of Sardinia is equally characteristic, whether one compares it with that of the continent, and even with that of Sicily, or considers the almost constant contrast between the north, province of Sassari, and the south, province of Cagliari. Ethnically, Sardinia is differentiated from Sicily because the Phoenician domination, begun in remote antiquity and renewed in Carthaginian times, was both more extensive and of longer duration in Sardinia than in Sicily, so that even today the Sardinian skull may possibly serve to illustrate the ancient Phoenician dilosophatic type. The Saracen elements in Sardinia are less significant, though there are two Saracen colonies, Barbaracini in the province of Sassari and Moridi, near Iglesias, in the province of Cagliari. This racial difference certainly contributes to reduce the high average of crimes against persons in Sicily, notwithstanding the relatively small number in the eastern provinces, and on the other hand, the higher average of crimes against property in Sardinia. For example, in comparing Sardinia with Sicily, one sees a striking contrast in the number of simple homicides, which comes out still more strongly in the number of assaults. In the case of aggravated homicides, indeed, the figures for Sicily are lower on account of the small number in the eastern provinces. But the total of all crimes against persons, including homicide, simple and aggravated, and high robbery accompanied by homicide, is much greater than in Sardinia. In crimes against property, on the contrary, Sardinia, on account of the preponderance of Semitic blood, goes far beyond Sicily, especially in aggravated thefts and in forgeries whereas in violent crimes against property, such as highway robbery, extortion, and blackmail, Sicily again takes the lead somewhat. In Sardinia, moreover, a contrast is to be observed between the two provinces of Sassari and Cagliari, in the very type of the inhabitants, and in their social and economic life. The north has agriculture and manufacturing more developed, while the south has mines near Cagliari, Iglesias, etc., now it is well known that the province of Cagliari is more decidedly Phoenician, whereas in the province of Sassari the Spanish element dominates, and this fact doubtless cooperates with the economic conditions to cause a greater frequency of forgery and aggravated theft in the province of Cagliari, and of homicide and highway robbery with homicide in the province of Sassari. Another example of the influence of race is found in the criminality of Corsica, which notoriously gives the maximum number of homicides infanticide and poisoning accepted for the whole of France, but shows a very small number of thefts. By comparing the number of persons sentenced for homicide in Corsica from 1880 to 1883 with those sentenced in those parts of Italy that give the highest figures, the following data are obtained. The tables displayed on the page, 
titled Person Sentence in 1880 to 1883. A main column titled Yearly Average to 100,000 Inhabitants is split between Corsica, Sardinia, Sicily, and Calabria, and Molise, Combo Data is compared with simple homicides and assaults resulting in death, murders and high robberies with homicide. This means that although Corsica belongs to France politically, it is Italian both in race and in the character of its crimes. The clues remarks, of the two islands, Sardinia and Corsica, once united, it is Corsica notwithstanding its political connection with France, that is, by geographical position and by its historical traditions, most Italian. Thus, the marked difference between the criminality of Corsica and that of Sardinia are to be explained in great measure by racial causes, and this explanation is confirmed by the great resemblance existing between the criminality of Corsica and that of Sicily. The fact is that, in Sicily, the Saracen element came to dominate all the others, and this same stock, more fierce than Covetaus, exercises a great influence in Corsica. We know that the ancient inhabitants, Ligurians and Iberians, or some think Sicilians, were followed by the Phoenicians and the Romans, but especially up to the 11th century by the Saracens, and after these by the Italians and the French. It is then to the Saracen blood that Corsica, Sicily, and part Calabria owe their intense homicidal criminality together with a low degree of criminality as regards property. Subchapter 21. Races in France A glance at the distribution of crimes in France shows that it is to the Ligurian and Gallic races that we owe the maximum of crimes of blood. This is proved in detail by the summary of the various crimes in the departments that furnish figures above the average. From such a summary we discover that a tendency towards murder increases as we pass from the departments having a cymbric population one out of the 18, or 5.5%, showing a number of murders above the average, to the Gallic departments, with 8 out of 32, or 25% above the average, then to the Iberian, with 3 out of 8, or 37.5%, and Belgian, 6 out of 15, or 40%, and finally to the Ligurian departments, all of which, 100%, show more than the average number of murders. The series for rape is slightly different. First, Iberian departments, 2 out of 8, 25%. Next, Cimbric, 6 out of 18, 33%. Belgian, 6 out of 15, 40%. Gallic, 13 out of 32, 41%. And finally, as before, the Ligurian, 6 out of 9, 67%. In crimes against property, on the other hand, we see the Belgians, the most industrial of the races, lead with 67% of their departments above the average followed closely by the Ligurians and Iberians, with 60% and 61% respectively, while the Cimbric and Gallic elements show only 30% and 39%. As I have shown in my crime politique, the dominant influence of the Ligurian and Gallic race is determined by their greater activity. The Ligurian peoples of France furnished the maximum of insurgents, all the departments are 100% being above the average, and the maximum number of men of genius 60% of the departments being above the average. The Gallic departments come next, with 82% for insurgents and 90% for men of genius. The Belgians, 62% and 33%, while the Cimbric departments showed only 38% for insurgents, with scarcely 5% for men of genius, and the Iberians furnished the minimum, with 14% and 5% for insurgents and men of genius, respectively. Subchapter 22. Delucocephaly and Brachycephaly. I have attempted to discover the relationship between criminality on the one hand and the cephalic index and the colour of the hair on the other, being convinced that more reliable indications of the influence of race might be obtained in this way. In studying crime in Italy in relation to the cephalic index, I have seen from the plates of Livy that in 21 provinces having a preponderance for dead lococephaly, index from 77 to 80 inclusive. The average of homicides and assaults is 31%, while the general average in Italy is 17%. In all the delococephalic provinces, with the exception of Lucca and Lys, that is to say, in 19 out of 21, the proportion of homicides is above the average. The provinces where mesocephaly, index 81 to 82, dominates four below the delocephalic provinces in homicide, giving an average of 25%. But where brachycephaly, index 83 to 88, 
is most abundant the figure is eight per cent average much below that for the country as a whole it must be known however that the dilocephalic provinces are in the south with the exception of Luka, which is also an exception to the parallelism of dilocephaly in crime that the brachycephalic provinces with the exception of abruzzo are all in upper italy and that the ultrabrachycephalic are to be found in the mountainous regions which all have a smaller number of crimes of blood as for the mesocephalic population is we met in southern italy or in the warm parts of upper italy like lake horn and genoa so it must be conceded that the influence of climate enters here with that of race in the case of theft the difference is much smaller though observable it is far less marked than in the case of homicide as may be seen from the fact that the dolocephalic provinces have 460 thefts to the million inhabitants the mesocephalic 400 and the brachycephalic 360 in france the crimes against persons gives an average of 18 to the 100,000 in the brachycephalic departments and of 36 in the dilocephalic including corsica Collingon. but without corsica it gives an average of only 24 the average of the whole country ranging from 24 to 33 to the 100,000 if we follow the figures given by ferry we find an even smaller difference and according to him the crimes of blood among the dilocephalic part of the population without Corsica amount to 13 of the 100,000 and to 19 in the brachycephalic departments from this it is evident how much greater influence climate has upon the crimes of blood than his race for in italy where the dilocephalic part of the population is collected in the south its preponderance in crime is enormous but in france where it is distributed everywhere in the south in the north Bastille Calais, Lourdes, Aines, and the centre, Hort, Vienne, Chalent. It furnishes no precise data, and sometimes even gives smaller figures than the Brasovella population. In the case of crimes against property, however, the difference in France is remarkable. The long heads show 44 crimes to the 100,000, and the round heads only 23. In general, there is everywhere a preponderance of crime in the districts dominated by Tolosophilly, in France, the long heads have furnished the greatest number of revolutionists and geniuses, and it is among the Dolocephalic Gauls and Ligurians that the princes and peoples have been found who offered the most resistance to conquest. This is apparently in complete opposition to the teaching of criminal anthropology, according to which criminals are nearly always ultra brassophilic but it is in reality of great value and is enabling us to show the better that the exaggerated brassophilia of criminals is a plain mark of degeneracy. Subchapter 23, Light and Dark Hair In investigating the relation of the colour of the hair to criminality in France, I have found that in the departments where dark hair predominates, the figures for murder reach 12.6% or 9.2% without coarse colour, while the light hair departments give only 6.3%. It is to be noted, however, that dark hair is especially abundant in hot districts, Vendée, Herault, Far, Gers, Lands, Corsica, Borchester Ron, Basses Opez, Gironde, etc. The influence of climate is perhaps therefore not to be excluded. Similarly, blonde hair, except in Vaucluse, is more frequent in the departments with a northern climate. Basticlase, Nord, Ardennes, Manche, Yeret Lore, which has been shown a small number of crimes of blood. In Italy, the proportion of bloods in the whole of southern Italy is below the average of the kingdom, except in Benevento, where it reaches the average, in Apulia, Naples, Campania, Trapani, and eastern Sicily, where it is only a little below the average. Now in all southern Italy, crimes of blood are below the average, and the province of Benevento, they give a figure which, although rather high, 27.1%, is nevertheless below that to the neighbouring provinces. The same is true of Apulia, eastern Sicily, Syracuse and Catania, which all show a low degree of criminality. Syracuse, 15, Catania, 28, Lise, 10. In these provinces, the blonde colour of the hair is directly connected with the Lombard, Benevento, and Greek races, Sicily, and it is for this reason they are less criminal. I have found no connection with race, however, in the blonde oasis of Perugia, nor in the brunette oasis of Forli in central Italy. The blonde population inhabiting the neighbourhood of the Alps is in direct connection with that of the mountains themselves, and shows, as does the latter, 
only a slight criminality. But the cause here is merely orographic. On the other hand, the brunette oasis of Leghorn and Luca coincides with a criminality greater, even in crimes of blood, than that of the neighbouring parts of Tuscany. And as here the colour of the hair is accompanied by a special dolosophily without being explicable by any orographic cause, it seems to me that we have a new proof of the influence of race upon crimes of blood. In the case of crimes against property, there is no evident correspondence. For example, the province of Treviso, where the inhabitants are very blonde, gives a maximum of criminality, and Ferrara, where the population is very dark, is nearly equal to it. Subchapter 24. Jews. The influence of race upon criminality becomes plainly evident when we study the Jews and the Gypsies, though very differently manifested in the two races. The statistics of many countries show a low degree of criminality for the Jews than for their Gentile fellow citizens. This is the more remarkable, since, because of their usual occupations, there should be fairness be compared. Not with the population in general, but with the merchants and petty tradespeople, who have, as we shall see, a high record of criminality. In Bavaria, one Jew is sentenced for every 315 of them in the population, and one Catholic for every 265. In Baden, Jewish criminality was 63.3% of the Christian criminality. In Lombardy, under the rule of Austria, there was during the space of seven years one Jew convicted for every 2,568 inhabitants. In Italy in 1855, there were only seven Jews in prison, five men and two women, a proportion much smaller than that prevailing among the Catholic population. Recent investigations made by survey show that in 1869, out of a Jewish population of 17,800, there were only eight sentenced. In Prussia, Horstner has observed a slight difference in the discredit of the Jews. There being one Jew inducted for each 2,600, while the Christians show one in 2,800. This is in part confirmed by Kolb, according to whom the following were recorded. In Prussia in 1859, one Jew indicted for each 2,793. One Catholic indicted for each 2,645. One Protestant indicted for each 2,821. From 1862 to 1865, however, one Jew indicted for each 2,800. One Protestant indicted for each 3,800. In Bavaria, one Jew indicted for each 315, one Catholic indicted for each 265. In France from 1850 to 1860 on the average, the Jews indicted were 0.0776% of the adults. Catholics indicted were 0.0584% of the adults. Jews indicted were 0.0111% of the total population. Catholics indicted were 0.0122% of the total population. In 1854, there were 166 Jewish criminals. In 1855, 118. In 1856, 163. In 1858, 142. In 1860, 123. In 1861, 118. A slight decrease in the latter years. In Austria, however, the number of Jews convicted was 3.74%. In 1872, and 4.13%. In 1873, figures higher by some fractions than those for the rest of the population. The fact of a special type of Jewish criminality is more certain than a greater or less degree of criminality. Among the Jews, as among the Gypsies, the hereditary form of crime predominates, and in France they reckon whole generations of rogues and thieves among the Serfbeers, Solomons, Levies, Blums, and Cleans. Those convicted of murder are rare, and where they are found, they are captains of bands organized with rare skill, like those of Graft, Kerfbeer, Mayer, and De Chumps. These master rogues had regular travelling agents, kept ledgers, and showed such a degree of cleverness, patience, and tenacity as made it possible for him to evade for many years the attempt to bring them to justice. Most of the Jewish criminals in France have their own special kinds of rascality, like the trick with a ring when they pretend to have found an object of value, or the morning call, which gives them an opportunity to rob the chambers of sleepers, who have forgotten to lock their doors. The Russian Jews are principally usurers, counterfeiters, and smugglers, carrying this last pursuit to the extent of smuggling women, exporting them to Turkey. 
Smuggling is organised among them in semi-governmental fashion. Old towns on the border, like Berderef, are peopled almost entirely by Jewish smugglers. Often the government has the town surrounded by a cordon of soldiers, and upon making a search finds immense stores of smuggled goods. The smuggling is carried so far as even to be an obstacle to commercial treaties with Prussia. In Prussia there were formerly great numbers of Jews convicted for forgery and for defamination, but more frequently for bankruptcy and for receiving stolen goods, crime which frequently eludes the clutches of the law. To the prevalence of this last crime among them is due to the great number of Jewish words incorporated into the thieves slain in Germany and England. Since the thief looks upon the receiver of stolen goods as a master and guide, and in consequence easily adopts his language, every great enterprise of the famous band of Mainz was planned by a cochiner, or Jewish receiver of stolen goods. There was a time in France when nearly all the leaders of the great bands had Jewesses for concubines. Many causes formerly impelled the Jews to these crimes, as also to the unlawful gains of usury, greed for gold, discouragement, desperation, exclusion from office, and from all public assistance, and the natural reaction against the persecutions of the stronger races, for which they had no other means of defence. They were often merely shuttlecocks between the armed brigands and the feudal lords, and were forced to be accomplices in order not to become victims. One need not be astonished, therefore, if their criminality appears great, and it is fair to note that from time to time, when the Jews have been permitted to enter political life, their tendency to special crime has diminished. We have forced upon us here and here the difficulty of coming to universally valid conclusions upon the basis of statistics alone. Even though the criminality of the Jews can be proved to be less than that of other races, a very different situation appears when we turn to the question of insanity in which they have an unfortunate leadership. Here, however, it is not so much a matter of race as of intellectual work. For among the Semitic races in general, Arabs, Bedouins, insanity is very rare. Subchapter 25. Gypsies. With the gypsies, the case is quite different. They are the living example of a whole race of criminals, and have all the passions and all the vices of criminals. They have a horror, says Grillman, of anything that requires the slightest application. They will endure hunger and misery rather than submit to any continuous labour whatever. They work just enough to keep from dying of hunger. They are perjurers and even among themselves ungrateful, and once cruel and cowardly, for which facts come the Transylvanian proverbs that fifty gypsies can be put to flight with a wet clout. Enlisted in the Australian army, they cut a sorry figure. They are revengeful to excess. One of them, to revenge himself upon his master, who had beaten him, dragged him to a cave, and sewed him up in his skin, and fed him upon the most loathsome food till he died. With the intention of plundering Lograno, they poisoned the sources of the drave, and when they believed the inhabitants dead invade the district in a body, and were only frustrated through the discovery of the plot by one of the citizens. Gypsies have been known in a fit of rage, to throw their own children at the head of their opponent like a stone from a sling. They are vain like all delinquents, but they have no fear of shame. Everything they own they spend for drink and ornaments. They may be seen barefooted, but with bright coloured or lace bedecked clothing, without stockings, but with yellow shoes. They have the improvidence of the savage, and that of the criminal as well. The story is told that once, when a party of them had repulsed a body of troops from a trench, they called out, Flee, flee, for if we had any left, we would kill you all. The enemy, thus informed how the matter stood, turned back and massacred them. Without morals, they are nevertheless superstitious, borrow. They would believe themselves to be damned or dishonoured if they were to eat eels or squirrels, although they devour half-putrefied carrion. They are given to orgies, love and noise, and make a great outcry in the markets. They murder in cold blood in order to rob and were formerly suspected of cannibalism. The women are very clever at stealing and teach it to their children. They poison cattle with certain powders in order to get the credit of curing them, or perhaps to get their flesh at a low price. In Turkey they also practice prostitution. They all excel in some form of rascality, such as passing counterfeit money or selling sick horses for sound. As the name Jew with us is synonymous with the sir, so in Spain, Gitano is synonymous with a rascally cattle trader. 
In whatever condition the gypsy finds himself, he always maintains his passivity, does not seem to concern himself with the future, but lives from day to day, despising all forethought. Authority, laws, rules, principles, precepts, duties, these are notions and things insupportable to this strange race. To obey or to command is equally odious to them. It is a burden and a bore. They have no more conception of property than they have a duty. I have is as foreign to them as I ought. Result, consequence, foresight, the connection between past and present are all unknown to them. Kuloki believes that they have special routes, used also by refugees, thieves and smugglers, which are indicate by special marks. The Zinken of the Germans. Of these are most frequently used are the Paterel, formerly a trident, but now made in the shape of a Latin cross. These signs marked along the course of the highways, or drawn with charcoal on the walls of the house, or cut in the bark of the trees, become a conventional means of saying to later brands, this is the gypsy route. In the first patero, the direction is indicated by letter lines, in the second by the longer arm of the cross. Stopping places are marked by the mysterious swastika, which is without doubt derived from the ancient East Indian symbol, possibly the original of our cross. When they wish to leave the place where they are, wrote Pecon de Ruby in the 16th century, they set out in the opposite direction from that which they are to travel. After going half a league, retrace their steps. Like criminals and the priors from whom they are descended, they have a popular criminal literature which glorifies crime, as in the following dialogue between father and son. Father. Hola, Basil. If you are to become great by the cross of your father, you must steal. Son. And afterward, father, if I am discovered, father, then you must take to your heels joy of your sire. Son. To the devil with your cross, father. You do not teach me well. It is to be noted that this race, so low morally and so incapable of cultural and intellectual development, a race that can never carry on any industry and which in poetry has not got beyond the poorest lyrics, has created in Hungary a marvellous musical art, a new proof of genius that, mixed with atavism, is to be found in the criminal. End of section 3《Section 4 of Crime, Its Causes and Remedies by Caesar Lombroso. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information on the volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 4 Civilization, Barbarism, Aggregations of Population, The Press, New Kinds of Crime. Subchapter 26 Civilization and Barbarism Among the numerous social problems, there is one especially whose certain and complete solution concerns us greatly. It is that the influence of civilization upon crime and insanity. If we judge by statistics alone, we shall conclude that the problem is already solved. For in every country of Europe, except England, we find that crime and insanity are each year increasing out of proportion to the growth of the population. A footnote is displayed on the page. In France from 1826 to 1837, there was one person indicted to each 100 of the population. In 1868, the indictments had reached 1 to 55. Dufau, Traité de Statistique, 1840, Bloch, L. Europe Politique, 1870. From 1825 to 1838, the indictments, excluding political crimes and fiscal misdemeanors, rose from 57,000 to 470 to 80,920. In 1838, the indictments increased from 237 to the 100,000 to 375, in 1847 to 480, and from 1854 to 55 to 1866, they sank to 389, to increase again to 517 in 1874 and to 552 in 1889. There was then an increase of about 133% in 50 years. Surely, France criminal. Page 10. Other tables displayed on the page, displaying data for years, the conviction rate, the number of inhabitants and indictments in Austria and England and Wales. From 1805 to 1841, the population increased 49%, the crime six times more than the population. In some countries, Monmouthshire, for example, the population increased about 128%, crime 720%. Aberdeen Discordal. 1876. In Italy, there were, from 
from 1850 to 1859, 16,173 indictments for serious crimes and 7,535 convictions. From 1860 to 1869, 23,854 indictments and 10,701 convictions. From 1863 to 1869, crimes increased one-tenth, the population about one-twentieth. Curcio Opsio. But Messer D'Aglia rightly observes in this connection how easy it is to make a mistake in attempting to solve, on the basis of statistics alone, complex problems into which many factors enter at the same time. The continual increase of crime and sanity can, in fact, be explained by changes in the civil and penal laws, by a great tendency to bring accusations, by the easy access to asylums for the insane, and by the greater activity of the police. One thing appears certain. Civilization and barbarism alike possess crimes peculiar to them. Barbarism, by deadening the moral sensibilities, diminishes the horror of homicide, which is frequently admired as a heroic act. By making revenge a duty and confusing might with right, it increases crimes of blood and encourages associations of malefactors, just as among the insane develops religious mania, demonomania, and imitative insanity. On the other hand, family ties are stronger, while sexual excitement and insane ambition are less frequent, and consequently, parricide, infanticide, and theft are less frequent. The types of civilization which man has hitherto produced, according to Guglielmo Ferraro, are two. The type characterized by violence, and that characterized by fraud. They are distinguished by the form which the struggle for existence takes. In the primitive civilization, the struggle is carried on purely by force, and wealth and power achieved by arms, at the expense either of foreigners or of weaker fellow citizens. Commercial competition between two peoples is carried on through armies and fleets, that is to say, by the violent expulsion of competitors from covert markets. Judicial contests are decided by the duel. In a civilization characterized by fraud, on the other hand, the struggle for existence is carried on by cunning and deceit, and the wager of battle is replaced by legal chisanery. Political power is obtained no longer at the point of the sword, but by money. Money is extracted from the pockets of others by tricks and mysterious maneuvers, such as the operations of the stock exchange. The commercial warfare is carried on through the perfection of the means of production, but still more through the perfection of the art of deceit. The skill acquired in giving the purchaser the impression that he is getting a good bargain. To the first type there belong Corsica, part of Sardinia, Montenegro, the Italian cities of the Middle Ages, and in general nearly all primitive civilizations. To the second type, on the other hand, belong all the modern civilized nations, that is to say, those among whom the capitalistic regime has reached its complete development. The distinction between the two types is not, however, so absolute in reality as it is in theory, for characteristics belonging to the two different types are often found mixed together in the same society. Now, since pathology, in the social field as in the physical, follows in a pathway of physiology, we discover these same two means of contest in the criminal world. As a matter of fact, there are two forms of criminality manifesting themselves in our day, side by side. Atavistic criminality, which is a return on the part of certain individuals of morbid constitution to the violent means of the struggle for existence now suppressed by civilization, such as homicide, robbery and rape, an evolutive criminality, which is no less perverted in intent but more civilized in the means employed. For in place of violence, he uses trickery and deceit. In the first class of criminals fall only a few individuals, fatally predisposed to crime. In the second, any one may come who has not a character strong enough to resist the evil influences of his environment. Segel rightly observes that the same division occurs in the two forms of collective criminality, which are to be found, the one in the upper and the other, in the lower ranks of society. On the one side are the rich, well-to-do, who in politics and business sell their votes and influence, and by the aid of intrigue, deceit and speculation steal money from the public. On the other hand, there are poor and ignorant, who, in anarchist plots and demonstrations, and insurrections attempt to revolt against the situation to which they are forced and the wickedness of those in high places. The first of these two forms is especially modern and evolved. The second is atavistic, brutal, violent. The former is a thing in the brain, and proceeds by a cunning device, like imposture, misappropriation or forgery. The latter is a thing in the muscles, and works by violent means, like insurrection, bomb-throwing or assassination. 
Italy, in the last few years, offered only too frequently the sad spectacle of the simultaneous breaking out of both forms of criminality. On the one hand, we have had in Sicily brigandage and famine riots, to which a payers or interested lie has given another name and ascribed other causes. At the same time, we have seen at Rome, in connection with the bank scandals, the gross immorality of the wealthy classes. I have given in my Homme Criminel examples of crimes of blood committed in the Middle Ages by special associations. But it may be asked, why, even ancient times, these criminal associations existed everywhere? Have they persisted in certain countries only disappearing from the others? The answer is easy if we consider the partially civilised condition of the peoples, and especially the condition of the governments which maintain and foster this barbarism, the first and continuous source of these perverted associations. The more governments are organised as parties, says D'Ezeglio, very truly, the more will parties organise themselves into governments. When the royal post office violated the privacy of letters, and bargaining with thieves allowed them full liberty for all their excesses in brothels and prisons, the very necessities of the situation contributed to protect the communist, for he was the one person who could carry a letter safely, protect one from assassination, ransom a stolen object at a fair price, or even pronounce, in minor matters, judgments doubtless as just as, and certainly quicker and less costly than those offered by the regular tribunals. The Camorra was a kind of natural adaptation to the unhappy circumstances of a people rendered barbarous by bad government. Brigandage, in its turn, has often been a kind of wild justice against the prisoners. In the period of serfdom in Russia, the Mojiks, indifferent to life and embittered by constant suffering for which no one cared, were all ready to avenge themselves by homicide, as is proved to us by a song made public by Dixon. There is no great Russian family, says well known author of the work on European prisons, which does not include in its history the violent death of one of its members. The immobilization of capital and avarice drove the rich men of southern Italy to a serene and unbelievable plundering of the poor peasants. In Fondi, writes Jodis, many became brigands on account of the extortions of the mayor, Amante, Coppa, Messini, and Tortora are driven to brigandage by the way their inhabitants were abused with impunity. The peasants of southern Italy, says Govon, in the investigating committee, see in the brigand the avenger of the injustice with which society overwhelms them. The dissensions between rich and poor over the division of certain lands, which formerly belonged to ancient barons, but of which the title was now in doubt, which had been promised to all, especially to the poor farmers, the hatred would divide it, the few representatives of the lesser nobility in the communes of southern Italy, and the acts of vengeance, practice against the clients of one or another. These were the principal cases of brigandage. Of 124 communes in Basilicata, there were only 44 without a brigand, and these were the only ones where the administration was in the hands of honest mayors. Of the two communes, Bomba and Montezoli, near Chieti, the first where the poor were well treated, had no brigands, while the second where they were abused had a great number of brigands. In the smaller states of southern Italy, observes Villari very truly, the Middle Ages still exist in the midst of modern civilization, only in place of the ancient baron, where today the plebeian creditor. We have in Sicily, writes Franchetti, a class of peasants who are almost slaves of the soil, a second class consisting of persons who consider themselves superior to the law, and a third, and this the most numerous, who regard the law as useless and exalted to the dignity of a principal, the customer securing justice for themselves by their own efforts. And where the majesty of the law is misunderstood and despised, its representatives cannot be respected. The public official in Sicily is flattered and fawned upon, so long as the originators of the abusers and tyrannies there hope to have him for an accomplice, or at least as a silent spectator of their misdeeds. But as soon as a man is discovered who is faithful to his duty, he is detested, hunted, assailed, and posed by every possible means. After the abolition of feudalism, continues Fanchetti in another place, the external form of the social relationships had to change. Even the real nature of those relationships did not. The absolute power of the great had ceased to be a legal institution, together with the jurisdiction and police power of the nobility. The instrument which must now be employed to cover up abuses was the officer of the state or city. But bribery did not always suffice to secure his connivance. It was necessary to employ special artifice. 
Some device must be used to require retaining control over those whose economic condition did not directly reduce them to practical slavery. Brute force had to give place, in part, to trickery and cunning. But for all that, violence was not done away with, at least in a large part of the island. Now the had come to break up the ancient traditions, and the instruments for carrying them into effect had not ceased to exist. The former officers of the feudal barons, though trust to one side, were still there, to say nothing of the men who had already committed some crime, or were ready to do so, and who could not fail to be numerous in a country where the opportunity for crime and the powerlessness of the law were traditional. But now the officers, like the criminals, by their trade on their own account, and whoever wanted their aid had to treat with them both. The word malandrino in Sicily loses its significance as a term of infamy, and comes to be used among the people as a laudatory designation. Proudly borne by many honourable persons, I am a brigand, malandrino, means for them that the speaker claims to be a brave man, afraid of nothing, especially not afraid of justice, which they confuse with the government, or rather with the police. This false conception of morals, this lack of perception of the distance between honesty and double dealing, explains how it is that the brigand finds accomplices among the peasants and even among the proprietors with whom he lives, and who regard crime as a new means of speculation. This state of things, according to the reports of the prefects, is the worst plague in Sicily, for while the real brigands who roam the country are few in number, at certain times they become legion, reinforced by their peasant auxiliaries. Further, great proprietors themselves make use of the brigands for the purpose of exacting ransoms and nulling wills and establish their tyranny over their fellow citizens. From this comes their repugnance to laying information, which seemed to them more immoral than murder itself so that a dying man may conceal the name of his murderer to the last. It is not homicide that arouses their aversion by the law. Accordingly, in a few cases in which accusation is brought, the crime still goes generally without punishment. Thus, in the province of Naples, of 150 brigands taken with arms in their hands, 107 were acquitted by the jury, and only 7 convicted. The situation is the same in the Romagna, as Alfred Comandini has shown us, and according to Board and Bournet, in Corsica also. The cause of all our ills, writes Comandini, is the abuse of wine, the widespread custom of carrying arms, and the political associations that have come down as a tradition from the despotic times when all classes took part in them, even at the peril of their lives. Their aspirations were honourable, but very often they favoured the escape of a prisoner. Because if arrested, he might betray them. These associations have no longer any political or educative aim, not even that of mutual assistance. They afford oftenest only an occasion for drinking together, generally at the expense of the richer members, and this usually degenerates into fighting and brawling, in which from their traditional duty of aiding one another, large numbers are frequently involved. But even more significant than the situation in the Romagna is the example which Corsica gives of an unconscious criminality, derived from social historical conditions, as well as from the purely historical influences already pointed out. The frequency of murders committed out of revenge, writes Bournet, is known to all the world, but is not so well known how trivial the causes often are. That a dog belonging to a Tafani was killed by a Orsino caused the death of 11 members of the two families. In 1886 there were 135 attacks upon persons, or 1 to 200 inhabitants, that is to say, four times more than the department of the scene. Of these 135 attacks, 52 were made a result of quarrels and brawls. No witness can be made to testify. In Palermo, there were 60 persons present at a crime, all of whom swore that they had seen nothing. Board of following reports of the constabulary estimates the number of banners at from 500 to 600. It all comes back to this, he says, that the peasants in remote villages who are enemies to the chief of the clan are persuaded that there is no justice. The Corsicans are very proud, scorn physical labour, and till the soil only unwillingly. They are better endowed intellectually than morally, and have a way of their own, of regarding good fortune and conscious. Their organisation is very similar to the Roman patrician system. Fifteen or twenty families rule all the rest, some having control of only a hundred votes, others having thousands of electors to express their will. For two hundred years, fifty families have been devoted to a single one. Independent life is impossible, 
for he who stands alone comes to nothing. The members of a family risk their lives with sublime self-abnegation for the sake of one of their number. Two consciousness struggle for supremacy on the island. The modern conscience, inspired by the principles of right and equity, and the ancient Corsican conscience, which cannot rise itself above the interests of the family association. The latter generally prevails, and the effects of it were seen in the proceedings of the jury which valued the land condemned for the railways. The jury presided over by Casabianca, the chief of the most powerful party in the island, made itself notorious by its partiality. Benedetti, an enemy of the party, received 2,000 francs for a vineyard of 17 heirs, while a certain Vigidi, a follower of Casabianca's, received 13,000 francs for a vineyard of 19 heirs, and so on. In Corsica, even the victims thought these injustices natural, and would have practiced them themselves if they had had the power. The justices of the peace are all-powerful, but very partial and devoted to the interest of the party that has elected them. In making up the voting list, they do so as they like, striking off the names of those who might injure them, and adding the names of those who may be useful, and this in spite of the courts of appeals and cassation. Serious crimes not infrequently result. The artifices employed at elections are numerous and right, and often have a tragic ending. At Palneca, the mayor, Bartoli, three times postponed the voting, waiting for a favourable moment. The fourth time, September 28, 1884, he and his partisans fortified themselves early in the morning in the town hall, and when their adversaries arrived, they could not enter. These exasperated, attempted to storm the place, but were repulsed with firearms. All day shots were exchanged from one house to the other, with deaths and wounds resulting. Bartoli's opponents told the prefect that they would rather die than endure such slavery. In 1885, in all France, there were 42,523 misdemeanors in rural districts. Horse alone had 13,405 of them, nearly a third. The progress of civilization, by endlessly multiplying needs and desires, and by encouraging sensuality through the accumulation of wealth, brings a flood of alcoholics and general paralytics into the insane asylums. The crowds of prisons, which offenders against property and against decency. Statistics show us, in fact, the most crimes of this character committed in the great cities among the cultivated classes are on the increase. Zigel shows us for his part that modern collective criminality has the same characteristics. A table is displayed on the page, displaying statistical data relating to crimes in Prussia and compared to France. There's a summary at the bottom, where the ratio of burglaries and highway robberies in Corsica to those in France was 0 0.38 to 1, of rapes 0 0.5 to 1, of parasites and bankruptcies 0 to 1, of extortions 3.0 to 1, Rapes of young girls, 23 to 1. Homicides, 32 to 1. Confronted by those two forms of collective criminality, it is natural to ask ourselves, why does the criminality of the rich take the form of cunning, or that of the poor is based upon violence? The answer is easy. The upper classes represent what is really modern, while the lower still belong in thought and feeling to a relatively distant past. It is then logical and natural that the former should show the result of modern development in their collective criminality, and that the latter should remain, on the contrary, still violent, not to say absolutely atavistic. Bacot has said, In order to be persuaded that fineness of feeling diminishes in proportion as one descends the social scale, it is not necessary to visit savage peoples, it is enough to talk with the English poor, or even one's own servants. In the second place, if the criminality of the rich is a pathological phenomenon indicative of the defectiveness of the ancient social organization that has come down to us, that of the lower class, on the contrary, may appear to be the premature announcement of a new era about to arise. It is for this reason that the former bears all the marks of senile cunning, while the latter has the reckless audacity of youthful strength. Finally, the rich constitute the majority, if not in number, at least in power and in the strength of their position. The poor, on the other hand, represent the minority. Now, it is characteristic of all minorities to be bolder and more violent than the majority. They have to conquer, while the majority only have to keep what they have gained. More energy is called out by the chance to attain something, or reach a little goal, than by the need of guarding a present possession. Victory softens and innovates, while the desire to conquer increases the courage a hundredfold. 
It is in fact with a minority as it is with a single individual who is attacked by a number of persons. Such a one shows a degree of strength which he would not at all manifest if odds were not at hand to aid him. Necessity increases the defensive power of those who stand alone and feel their weakness. The instinct of self-preservation, aroused by danger, gives to the organism the courage of despair. In the field of crime, this natural law cannot fail to show itself among the lower classes, who have to contend against great odds and make up for their natural weakness by the boldness and violence of the means they employ. However painful it may be to admit that civilization has succeeded only in changing the kind of crimes, and perhaps increasing their number, the fact itself is easy to understand when one sees how much more advantageous the progress of education has been for attack than would offence. Subchapter 27. Congestion of Population To the reasons which we have just enumerated must be added others of a different order. On account of railways and government and commercial concentration, civilization tends continually to mark the great centres of population still larger and to overpopulate the principal cities, and, as is well known, it is in these that are found crowded together the greatest number of habitual criminals. This unfortunate concentration of crime is to be explained by the greater profits or the greater security which the larger cities offer to criminals. By this, perhaps, it is not the only reason, for even the city's vigilance is more relaxed, prosecution is more active and systematic, and temptations and inducements to crime are more numerous. So are the opportunities for honest labour. I believe that there is another influence of work which is more powerful still. The very congestion of population by itself gives an irresistible impulse toward crime and immorality. The rears writes Bertillon, a kind of violent and morbid tendency that moves us to reproduce the feelings and movements which we see around us. Many causes contribute to this. Youth, femininity, and above all, as Sarsi says, the mutual contact of sensitive persons, which gives added strength to the natural impressions that each one has by himself. The air is filled with a dominant opinion, and transmits it like a contagion. It has been observed that even the crowd together of horses develops the tendency to sodomy. All these causes, together with the parallelism that always exists between the development of the sexual organs and of the brain, and also with better nutrition, partly explains for us the great increase of crimes of sensuality, a characteristic of modern criminality harmonising with a constant increase of prostitution so marked in the large cities. It is for this reason that women are more criminal in the more civilised countries. They are almost always drawn to crime by a false pride about their poverty, by desire for luxury, and by masculine occupations and education, which give them the means and opportunity to commit crimes of the same character as the men, such as forgeries, crimes against the laws of the press, and swindling. Civilization increases the number of certain crimes, just as it increases certain forms of insanity. Paralysis alcoholism, because it increases the use of stimulants, which, while almost unknown to savages, have become a veritable necessity to the civilized world. Thus we see today, in England and America, that in addition to the abuse of alcohol and tobacco, there is creeping in that of opium, and even of ether, and that in France, the consumption of brandy grew from eight litres in 1840 to 30 in 1870. Subchapter 28 the press. Civilization, by favoring the creation and dissemination of newspapers, which are always a chronicle of vices and crimes, and often are nothing else, has furnished a new cause of crime by inducing criminals to emulation and imitation. It is sad to think that the crimes of Trotman brought the circulation of the Petit Journal up to 500,000, and that the Figaro to 210,000. It was doubtless for this reason that the crime was imitated almost immediately in Belgium and Italy. Note the following strange crime. During the absence of the proprietor, R, his strong box was forced. His assistant was immediately arrested, and his exact sum taken was found upon him. Indeed, the assistant admitted of his own accord that he had taken the money, but without evil intent. He had, in fact, without necessity of breaking to the safe, much larger sums under his control, and this with the consent of his employer, who had great confidence in him. He had committed the crime, he said, only in order to try a trick that he had read a day before, before in the newspaper. His employer, knowing him to be a constant reader of the papers, 
declared that he accepted his explanation, and as soon as the assistant had been acquitted, reinstated him in his position. In Paris in 1873, one Grimaud decided to commit a crime in order to get himself talked of, like certain great criminals of his exploits he read in the newspapers. With this aim he committed arson, but notwithstanding his confession, his good was not believed. He maltreated his wife with the result that she died, and that owed himself the cause of her death. He came out of this affair also with the verdict of not guilty. Then it was that the case of the widow Grass fell under his eye, and in order to imitate it, he threw nitric acid into a friend's face, thereby killing him, and then went about telling everyone of his crime. Next day he first hastened to read the account of the murder in the petit journal, and immediately afterwards went to give himself up as a prisoner. It was perfectly obvious that reading criminal tales and various other reports in the paper suggested to him the idea of his crimes. The same may be said of those novels, which deal almost exclusively with the acts of criminals, like those at present fashionable in France. Thus in 1866, two young men, Brulier and Serreau, strangled a tradeswoman. When arrested, they declared that the crime had been suggested to them by reading a novel by Delmonds. Some, says the place very truly, have received from nature an organism inclined to evil but their inclination is turned into action only by hearing or seeing the misdeeds of others. Some years ago a package of ten stolen bonds was found done up in a paper upon which the thief had written those gloomy lines taken from a novel by Barasque, conscious of the word invented to frighten fools and to make them submissive in their misery. Thrones and millions are only to be gained by violence and fraud. In the great cities, many are incited to crime in the places where cheap lodgings may be obtained for the night. Many, says Mayhew, are brought to the lodging house through being thrown out of work, and from the lodging house are drawn to theft. The political laws and the new forms of the popular government imposed by modern civilization, and in part also by our pretended liberty, favour in every way the formation of societies and the pretext of social amusements, administrative enterprises, or mutual aid. The example of Pamrolo, Leghorn, Ravenna, Bologna, history of Luciani, and Peg, and that of Crispi and Nicotera, show us how short the distance is from such generous enterprises to the most immoral violence and even a crime. In North America, some societies have gone so far as to commit crime with impunity, and in two of the most flourishing cities, New York and San Francisco, even officially they have almost succeeded in legitimizing their frauds. The political revolutions which are more frequent with these forms of government cause an increase of certain crimes either because they bring together crowds of people or because they excite violent passions. Spain is a prison, says an illustrious Spaniard, where it is possible to commit any crime, whether with impunity, provided one cries in favour of this or that, or gives to his crime a political appearance. The number of criminals acquitted there rose in five years to 4,065, four times what they were in France. It is not astonishing, then, in Spain, crimes are proportionally more numerous than elsewhere. Wars, like revolutions, increase the number of crimes because of the increased mass and contact of men, as was proved in Italy in 1866, Curcio, and in North America during and after the Civil War. Sexual crimes, which before the revolution of 1848 in France were from 100 to 200, increased first to 280 and then to 505 and with them illegitimate births increased also. After all this, it is easy to comprehend, without the necessity of citing figures, how much crimes increased, when the criminals are heard together in prisons, where, according to the avowal of the criminals themselves, the greatest wickedness is a title to glory, and virtue is a badge of shame. Civilization, by multiplying great penitentiaries, gives, by that same means, a great extension to crime. This is more true, since the blamable solicitude has introduced charitable and philanthropic institutions, reform schools, etc., which suffice to undermine the character of respectable individuals, but not to soften the heart of a hardened culprit. We shall see how, after the introduction of the ticket of leave, there was noted in 1861-62 in England a great increase of delinquents, who had already occurred in 1843 after the inauguration of the transportation system. The houses of correction, which seem inspired by a truly humanitarian feeling of charity, 
through the single factor they are bringing together the mass of depraved individuals exercise an influence quite other than salutary and always always directly opposite to that for which they were instituted it is worth noting here that the illustrious oliver Croner attributed the greatest number of swedish recidivists to the vices of the penitentiary system and to the custom of submitting young offenders to the same discipline as the adults Subchapter 29. New Crimes Civilization introduces every day new crimes, less atrocious perhaps than the old ones, but nonetheless injurious. Thus in London, the thief substitutes cunning for violence. In place of burglary, he practices purloining by means of special apparatus. In place of porch climbing, he uses swindling and blackmail by the aid of the press. Homicide with the aim of getting the benefit of life insurance is an example of a new form of crime committed by some physicians, and favoured too often by new advances in scientific knowledge. Thus the knowledge that the symptoms of arsenic poisoning are similar to those of cholera suggests to two doctors during the cholera epidemic in Magdeburg and Monaco, the idea of first insuring and then poisoning many of their patients. In Vienna a new crime has been invented which consists of appropriating goods that have been ordered for an imaginary society. The anarchists have brought into fashion the use of dynamite against persons and buildings. Recently there have been introduced in Chicago the electric bludgeon, and also a small torpedo, which being slipped into the intended victim's pocket explodes and blows into pieces. Civilization, by relaxing the bonds of the family, not only increases the number of foundling asylums, which are the nurseries of criminals, but also multiplies the desertions of adults, rapes, and infanticides. Notwithstanding these unhappy consequences, we must not allow ourselves to be led into an indiscriminate condemnation on the fruitful progress of civilization, since even in the matter of crime, the change has not been altogether prejudicial. For if for the time civilization has been the cause of the increase of crime, it has certainly mitigated its character. On the other hand, where progress has reached its height, it has already found means of treating the diseases it has produced with its asylums for the criminal insane, its system of separate confinement in the penitentiaries, its industrial institutions, its saving banks, and especially its societies for the protection of children, which prevent crime almost from the cradle. See Part 3. End of Section 4. Section 5 of Crime, Its Causes and Remedies by Cesar Lombroso. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 5. Density of Population, Immigration and Emigration, Birth Rate. Subchapter 30. Density of Population. The influence of civilization in reverence to crime may be seen better by examining one by one its different factors, and in the first place, that of density. For history teaches us that crime appears only when a certain density of population has been reached. Prostitution, assaults, theft, as Reckless, Wostermark, and Kraptovkin have rather remarked, show themselves but rarely in primitive society, as among the Vendars, who assemble only at their rainy seasons, and uncertain Australian Aborigines who met only for the yam harvest. It is for the same reason that when animals are not associated together or domesticated, the equivalent of crime rarely appears among them, because their brutal instincts lack the means of manifesting themselves. When circumstances change, and the formation of tribes and clans gives opportunity for it, which is hitherto lain dormant, breaks out with violence. Even among the less compact barbarous societies, crime is relatively rare. If, and if more ferocious, well, in a more civilized society, crime multiplies and the five or six forms of crime prevalent among barbarians have become, with us, legion. A single glance at the thefts, homicides, and political upheavals of Europe in reference to density of population shows us that, with the exception of some contradictions, the result of the effect of temperature, which increases homicides and insurrections in the south and thefts in the north, theft increases with density, while homicide diminishes. We see, in fact, in the following table, that of seven countries having a low density, only two, Spain and Hungary, have very high figures for homicide. And of eight countries having a maximum density, Italy alone shows a great number of homicides. The verse is true with regard to thefts. With regard to revolts, we can come to no immediate conclusion. For we see in countries of equal density, 
Poland, Austria, Switzerland, the greatest difference in the number of revolutions, while revolutions are lacking in other countries with great differences in density, like England, Russia, and Hungary. In the Middle Ages, Corsica, with a very sparse population, had a great number of revolutions, 45 and 4 centuries, according to Ferrari. A table is displayed on the page, Crimes and Density in European Countries, with six columns, Population of the Square Mile, Countries, Homicides to a Million Inhabitants, Thefts to 100,000 Inhabitants, Insurrections to 10 Million Inhabitants. The influence of density of population appears more clearly in our country, especially when one examines various crimes in detail with reference to the different degrees of density. In Italy, for example, we find, there is a table displayed on the page, number of crimes to 100,000 inhabitants, population to the square kilometre, homicides, thefts, resistance to police, rapes, and swindling. We see, therefore, that homicide decreases as the density increases, especially in the great cities, so that Milan, Naples, Le Cornichinois, where the most different races and climates, Greek, Celtic, Ligurian, give a like degree in the number of homicides, and on the contrary, we see the number regularly increase where the density is least. This is say, in the hotter parts of the country, and in the islands where society is more barbarous and criminal bands more common. Theft, rape and resistance to the officers of the law also diminish with the increase of density. To rise again rapidly, however, with the excessive density of the great cities, Padua, Naples, Milan, Venice. Swindling follows an irregular course, but nearly always in the direction opposite to the density, a fact which arises from the strong participation of the islands, especially Sardinia, in this crime, and also from the strong bias in favour of all racial customs in the provinces of Forli and Bologna, where swindling is widespread. The latter place is proverbial for swindling, and Dante in his Inferno makes Vendicchio say, I am not the only Bolognese weeping here, this whole place is full of them. So also in the recent French statistics we find the following. Tables displayed on the page. Spain. Population of the square kilometre and the number of crimes to 100,000 inhabitants. Divide between thefts, homicides and rapes. We see that theft becomes more and more frequent as the density increases. Homicides and rapes, on the contrary, show the highest proportion with the minimum or the maximum of the density. This contradiction is explained by the fact that where the population is most compact occur the great industrial scene in Federer, 92, and political Paris, 18, centres, and ports immigration, Rochers to Ron, 45, where the opportunities for conflict are more frequent, and where there is a minimum of density, Corsica, 200, Lazare, 41, or Alps, 24. There is a maximum of barbarism, and we have seen that assaults and assassination are there often regarded more as necessities than of crimes. The same thing is true of political insurrections, as I have proved in my crime politique. A study of the revolutionary and of the ultra-concerted populations of the French departments shows that the former are always more numerous in the districts where the density is greater. In studying the relationships of the density of population and the monarchical reaction in France, we find that in the departments with the denser population, popular opinion is more inclined towards republican ideas. On the other hand, by the Alps, Lands, Indre, Cher and Lazier, which have no more than 40 inhabitants to the square kilometre in the elections of 1877, 81, 83, gives a high percentage of votes to the monarchical party. The same is true in Verdi, Nord, Horts, Pyrenees, Gers, Lot and Leverion, which have not over 60 to the square kilometre, and a similar phenomenon has been noticed in the case of the plebiscites, Jacobi, when on the contrary the population reaches a higher degree of density, as in the departments of the Rhone, the Loire, saint Etoise, and saint Inferior, we see the revolutionary spirit take on a great development, as Jacobi has already remarked, opposite, the greatest revolutionary tendency is found in the departments with the compact population, followed by those with a moderate density. While in the departments with a minimum density, the concerns prevail. It is easy to understand that where the urban population is densest, political agitation is also more frequent. This is to be noticed especially in Paris, whereas Follette Le Duc writes, The whole civilized world empties its scum, making a cosmopolitan city where a mob without country, principles or traditions presumptuously directs the elections and takes advantage of the misfortunes of the country to overturn the government and put itself in power. Thus it was that after the Commune, 
Out of 36,809 individuals arrested, there were 1,725 foreigners and 25,648 provincials. It is the failing of countries too thickly populated, concludes Maxim Lecamp, that in them the provincial life can be developed only imperfectly. Great capitals are dangerous for the political peace. They are like a suction pump. They draw everything in and let nothing out. France has too big a head, and like a hydrocephalous patient is subject to real outbursts of maniacal fury. Such an outburst was a commune. On the whole, the influence of race and climate blots out that density, but the influence of this latter is still to be detected, both in the number of thefts, which it increases, and of homicides, which it diminishes. Subchapter 31 Immigration and Emigration It is an undeniable fact that there exists a striking contrast between Italy and France, a complete contradiction which, as we shall see, applies to wealth as well as to crime. In Italy, homicides decrease regularly with the increase in density of the population, while in France they increase extraordinarily when the maximum density is reached, though Paris, to be sure, in this regard, falls below saint Etoise, which surrounds it. The contradiction is, however, explicable. The situation in Italy is due to the increasing influence of civilization exercised by the great centres, which diminishes the traditional propensity to regard the taking of life in revenge as a duty or even as a right. And further, it is due to the degree of what Ferry calls criminal saturation, caused by the excessive number of crimes of blood, so great as to be incapable of further increase. The contrast offered by France, however, is due to the special condition there produced by a new element, namely immigration, which is lacking in Italy. This increases the density of the population, it is true, but in a manner particularly fraught with consequences, since it introduces into the country more than one million foreigners at an age and under conditions which render them especially prone to crime, and further concentrates the processes at certain points only. In fact, the maximum of homicides, 45, is given by Bouches de Rouen, at a bomb which is one of the great centres of immigration, having 50,000 Italian residents. If, however, we take Jolly's graphic presentation of criminality by the native country of the criminal, thus eliminating the factor of immigration, we find that Bouches de Rouen goes down from the maximum degree 86 to 62. It rolled from 81 to 63, helpless matter times from 83 to 45, without speaking of the department of the scene, where out of 40,000 persons arrested, only 13,000 were born in the departments. For if Paris imports a great many rogues, she exports a great many also. Herod itself would have been a good record, but one city, set, spoils everything. Of ten persons indicted, it furnishes nearly seven. It supplies by itself half the cases tried at the court in Montpellier, a fact due especially due to the great number of recidivists who throng here and sleep in the open, and to the foreigners. In 1899, there were 21 foreigners indicted to 118 residents. That is to say, while the proportion of natives was 2 to 1,000, that of foreigners was 19 to 1,000. The same thing is true in Marseilles, of the labourers working at the port. It is these foreigners, writes Jolly, who furnish the strongest contingent to the thefts, assassinations, anarchistic riots, assaults, etc. A table is displayed on the page. In 1881, there were 17 rapes to 1 million French, 60 rapes to 1 million foreigners. In 1872, there were 18 rapes to 1 million French, 46 rapes to foreigners. It is known already that the immigrants showed a high degree of criminality. From the recent statistics of the United States, it is seen that the states which receive the greatest number of immigrants, especially Irish and Italians, give the highest number of crimes. Thus, California, 0.3 criminals to 1,000 population, 33% immigrants. Nevada, 0.31 criminals to 1,000 population, 41% immigrants. Wyoming, 0.35 criminals to 1,000 population, 28% immigrants. Montana, 0.19 criminals to 1,000 population, 29% immigrants. Arizona, 0.16 criminals to 1,000 population, 39% immigrants. New York, 0.27 criminals to 1,000 population, 23% immigrants. On the other hand, New Mexico, 0.03 criminals to 1,000 population, 6.7% immigrants. Pennsylvania, 0.11 criminals to 1,000 population, 13% immigrants. 
This runs counter to the notion of the effect of density of population upon crime. Montana with 0.3 inhabitants to the square mile, Wyoming with 0.2, Nevada with 0.6, and Arizona with 0.4 have, notwithstanding their low density, an enormous contingent of crimes on account of immigration, while New York with 151 inhabitants to the square mile and Pennsylvania with 95 inhabitants to the square mile, where the density is very great, have a much lower criminality. The District of Columbia also, which contains 2,960 inhabitants to the square mile, shows relatively low figures. Of 49,000 individuals arrested in New York, 32,000 were immigrants. Of 38,000 prisoners in North America, 20,000 were children of foreigners. In France, it has already been observed that in 1886, of 100,000 settled residents, it became before the courts. Of 100,000 who changed residence, 29 came before the courts. Of 100,000 foreigners, 41 came before the courts. At present in France, immigration has trebled from 1851 to 1886. It increased from 380,381 to 1,126,123. Jolie has rightly remarked that when the tide moving men to emigrate is weak, it draws a stronger and more intelligent. But when it becomes too violent, it sweeps along good and bad alike. In fact, the greater part of the criminality of the immigrants is furnished by the border provinces, where emigration is easy. Thus, in 1886, there were four convictions to 100,000 Swiss, 18 among the same number of Spaniards, 23 Italians, and almost no English or Russians. In Paris, in the same way, in proportion to their numbers, the Belgian and Swiss colonies furnished three times as many of the persons arrested as did the English or Americans. The Italian colony, which is hardly four times as large as the Austrian, furnished 15 times as many arrests. On the other hand, the less stable the immigration is, the more crimes it furnishes. The Belgians, who become naturalized Frenchmen, commit fewer crimes than the Spaniards, who are nearly always merely temporary residents. The situation is similar with reference to migrations within the country, especially migrations of a wandering sort, like that of peddlers. For example, in a study made at St. Gordens, from which many of the French peddlers start out, about 7,000 in a population of 36,000, it was found they furnished a very high proportion of crimes, both of fraud and violence. From 41 and 1831-69, these had increased to 200 and 290 in 1881, and the abandoned children, adulteries and divorces were also very numerous. Sarth is one of the best of the departments of France in point of criminality, but if we take account of crimes committed by natives who have emigrated, it rises 34 degrees in the criminal scale. For analogous reasons, the department of Cruise rises from the 3rd to the 18th place, owing to its 45,000 immigrants caused by the instability of labour. Many come to the great cities, honest, but with false ideas of the new situation that has enticed them, and are in consequence easily led astray, and little by little become criminals. The young girl, having yielded to seduction, becomes a prostitute. The workman, lacking work, falls into idleness, and surrounded by companions who incite into evil, and tempted by the allurement of a thousand pleasures that he sees others enjoying, becomes a thief. There are repentant workmen who hope to make themselves forget and to redeem themselves by work, but they soon relapse, either through again running into temptation or through inability to cover up the past. Finally, there are evildoers who come to the city only to commit crime. In the small towns, as Jolly very well says, it is necessary to seek opportunity for crime. In Paris, the opportunity comes to you and draws you. High livers are themselves a cause of crime, especially crimes against public decency. In Paris, such crimes may be committed with such clever shifts that they no longer appear to be criminal. The full-blooded Parisian mingled in the excesses of the commune, only in a very moderate degree, writes Maxime de Camp. The sum of the provinces fermented in Paris, the ruined men, the empty-headed, the envious, rushed to the city, puffed up with a sense of their own importance, and because they had become excited in the village wine shops, believed themselves capable of ruling the world. Paris must realise their dreams or perish, but Paris does not even know their names, and, to expiate this grave offence, it must fall. The emigrant in general, as I've already pointed out in the second edition of my Home the Criminal, is that human product of society which has a greatest tendency towards associated crime. 
for immigrants are the most necessitous part of society. The least closely watched have no feeling of shame, escape justice most easily, and make a great use of thieves' slaying. These are almost always nomads. Immigrants from a Brussels form the greatest continent in the Mancini band. Jodis, the small immigration of the Garfagnini to the quarries of Carrara, produces crime even after the return of the workmen, for they come back drunkards, cynics, and members of secret societies. In centuries past, these same migrations were already a cause of crime. The band of Ford Spini, for example, was originally composed entirely of tinkers, candle sellers, barvesters, and peddlers, who are already too much noted for sporadic crime. Even immigrants who were migrating because of religious fanaticism then sought to be fathers from crime, nevertheless contribute notably to the number of cases of associated crime. The word Marulil seems to be derived from a custom of crying in chorus, Viva Maria, prevalent among the pilgrims of Metro and Assisi, a custom which did not prevent them, however, from committing rapes and robberies, believing these expiated by their pilgrimage. Pilgrimage was, for them, a convenient means of committing crime, and a still more convenient means of doing penance for it. It was like the famous lance which first wounded, but immediately afterwards healed the wounds. I have found a proof of this in a decree of the King of France, dated September 1732, recalling other decrees of 1671 and 1686, which pilgrimages were prohibited as a frequent cause of grave crimes. This is doubtless the reason why places endowed with celebrated shrines have generally the worst reputations, as de Azeglio remarks in his recollections. The influence of immigration explains clearly why, in the relation of homicides to density, easily differs from France. In the latter country, in the ten years, 1880 to 1890, there was a yearly average of only 11,163 immigrants, while in Italy the number in 1892 reached 246,751, with a yearly average about 124,000. Subchapter 32. Birth Rate and Immigration these investigations of emigration solve in great part another problem which seems to present a complete contradiction in Italy and France. Granting the influence of density of population upon certain crimes, it would appear that these crimes ought to follow the variations of the birth rate, and that, for example, theft, which increases with a greater density, ought also to increase with a higher birth rate. In France, however, we see rape and assassination increase with a maximum density, but an inverse ratio to the birth rate. Cor and Jolly after him, opposite, have observed in France the maximum criminality in the departments having the lowest birth rate. A table is displayed on the page with birth rate, crimes against persons, thefts, and rapes. The fact is that in France the lower birth rate stands in direct relation with the immigration of foreigners. This is the more easily explained. As Morel observes, since where there is a lower birth rate, there is also a smaller number of men. Now, according to Jolly's observation with regard to Assets and Marcelles, the deficiency of the population resulting from the falling off of the birth rate is made up by foreign immigrants, Genoese and Calabrians especially, who bring about an enormous increase in the number of crimes. Another contradiction is furnished by the very prolific class of workmen, in contrast with the miserly and consequently sterile peasant class. Thus, in districts where there are great numbers of workmen, as in Seine, Inferior, Nord, and Pastacales, one sees in comparison with the departments of Cher and Indre a great number of crimes, notwithstanding the higher figure for births. But on the whole, the antagonism between birth rate and crime predominates. Thus Paris, a part of Champagne and Normandy, and all the Mediterranean departments except Guard, show a sharp decline in the birth rate and a no less sharp increase in the number of crimes. In Tarn et Garonne, a very poor department without resources or means of communication, there is to be noted an increase in the population and a smaller number of crimes, while rich and fertile departments become stripped of their native population, and have more crimes and a larger foreign contingent. Truly, Brittany, on the other hand, Cher, Seine, Drôme, Vienne, and Vendée, have more legitimate births, fewer crimes, and more early marriages. All this has less connection with the birth rate than with the immigration that makes up the deficit in the native population. 
and also, as we shall see, with the avarice that lies at the root of the whole matter. But the influence of immigration is demonstrated to us by the inversion of the rule regarding birth rate and crime in Italy, where there is no immigration, but on the other hand, an immigration accounting on the average to 193 to 100,000 inhabitants yearly. We find in the statistics of Coblen that the increase in the number of immigrants to New South Wales, 1884-86, was accompanied by an increase in the number of crimes. But on the other hand, the increase in the number of immigrants leaving, 1883-88, also corresponded with the increase in the number of crimes, 1884-88. If we take advantage of Bosco's new investigations to study the influence of immigration upon homicides in the United States in 1889, we find these facts. Among those held for homicide, 95 to the million were born in the United States, while 138 to the million were foreigners, distributed as follows. Denmark, Sweden, Norway... 5.8 to the 100,000. England, 10.4 to the 100,000. Ireland, 17.5 to 100,000. Germany, 9.7 to the 100,000. Austria, 12.2 to the 100,000. France, 27.4 to the 100,000. Italy, 58.1 to the 100,000. That is to say, there were twice as many in proportion to the population, except in the case of the French and Italians, as in the native country. This confirms the observation that here, as in France, immigration produces a disadvantageous selection, even land for the fact that the age of the immigrants corresponds to that which in Europe gives the largest number of homicides. In Italy, it is nearly twice the case that the maximum number of births occur in the districts which are most notorious for their criminality, as well as for their poverty. Thus, from 1876 to 1888, the annual average was 40 births to the 1,000 inhabitants in southern and insular Italy, and only 36 throughout the rest of the country. In the same way in Sicily, out of four provinces most given to homicide, Gurgenti, Trapani, Caltanissetta, and Palermo, three have the maximum birth rate. However, another factor comes into play here, the lack of self-restraint to the excessive heat, which cause all Malthusian precautions to be forgotten in the act of procreation. However, the excess of births in southern Italy is neutralized by the high mortality rate and by emigration. For this reason, notwithstanding the greater birth rate, the average family in 1881 was 4.1 in Sicily and 4.5 in Basilicata, as against 5.17 in Venice and 4.92 in Tuscany. Bearing next the countries of Europe having the maximum birth rate, 1876-90 England, 34.0 Germany, 31.1 Italy, 37.3 Hungary, 44.0 And those having the minimum birth rate, France, 24.6 Ireland, 24.9 Switzerland, 29.4 We find a coincidence with homicides, only in the case of Italy and Hungary, which are in complete contrast with England and Germany, these having a high birth rate and few homicides. Among the nations with a minimum birth rate, Ireland alone has a low figure for homicide, and even England and Germany, a greater number of thefts corresponds to the greater birth rate. This is not true of Hungary and Switzerland. It follows then that on the whole there is here no parallelism. Subchapter 33. City and Country. The influence of density is further shown by the effect in France of residence in the city or in the country. It is especially to M. M. Fayette, Cosquet, and Lacazagne that we owe the most diligent investigations of this subject. It is shown by their studies that from 1843 to 1856 the persons indicted in the country were more numerous, while since 1863 those in the city have been in the majority. The table is displayed on the page with a list of cities, homicides to 100,000, and births to 100,000. The emigration from the country to the cities is such that the rural immigrants constitute a fifth part of the urban population that is the better and more intelligent to emigrate, thus lowering the level of the country and in return bringing back to it the vices and customs of the city. To sum up, the indictments for crimes against property have diminished in the country about two-thirds and the city's one-half. Thus there were, 
In 1843, 73% of the country, 64% in the city. In 1878, 27% in the country, 36% in the city. Indictments for crimes against the person were more numerous in the rural population from 1823 to 1878, but the number decreased after 1859, much more than in the cities. For crimes against the person in France, the following statistics are given. In 1850, 1,819 in the country, 830 in the city. In 1851, 1,894 in the country, 836 in the city. In 1870, 1,180 in the country, 732 in the city. In 1871, 1,239 in the country, 603 in the city. As regards homicide, Sokwet demonstrates that, at an early period, 1846 to 50, the persons indicted in the country were three times as numerous as those in the cities, in the proportion of 20 to 7.6, while at a more recent period, 1876 to 80, they were only twice as numerous, 63 to 31. From this it appears that criminality in the country diminished, and in the city increased nearly a third. Those indicted for murder were... 1846 to 50, 72% rural, 65% urban. 1876 to 80, 26% rural, 31% urban. That is to say, there was a diminution in the latter part in both city and country, but much greater in the country. In indecent assaults upon adults, the rural districts exceed the urban, dulls because of the lack of houses of prostitution. Thus, there were in the same periods... 1846 to 50, 74% rural, 24% urban. 1876 to 80, 67% rural, 27% urban. With a decrease in the country and a slight increase in the city, the number of indictments for indecent assaults upon children declined in the country from 59% in 1846 to 50 to 53% in 1876 to 80, while in the cities during the same time. It rose from 39% to 45%. Sokwet, favoured by idleness, the abuse of alcohol and drinks, and especially by the satiety produced by over-refinement. That in abortions the city leads is unmistakable. There are twice, and laterally, even three times as many as in the country, while in infanticide the country leads. This is doubtless due to the greater ease of securing accomplices for an abortion in the city and the slighter fear of being discovered. There is a table displayed on the page, displaying data for indictments for abortion in France, and compared to the millions of inhabitants in 1851-55 and 1876-80. The curve for crimes against property shows that economic crises are more deeply felt in the country than in the city. Revolutions and the vintage have a different effect upon the number of indictments in the city and in the country. In this country, indictments increase in the years of the abundant vintages. Revolutions, on the other hand, make themselves but slightly felt in the country, and only in the years following political crises, when the city they are felt at once and keenly. Like saying, the urban and the rural districts have each their own specific type of criminality. The crimes of the country are more barbarous, having their origin in revenge, avarice, and brutal sensuality. In the city, the criminality is characterized by laziness, a more refined sensuality, and by forgery. This phenomenon of the increase of crimes against public decency in the cities and the relative decrease of crimes of blood is greatly accentuated when we study the very large urban centres. In France, for example, the Department of the Seine has already reached a figure for homicide, 19.9, lower than that of the departments which surround it. Seine and Toys giving 24.3 and Toys giving 25.8. The figures for infanticide are relatively even lower while for rape upon children the figures are enormous. The number of thefts is also very high, 244. In Italy, in the crimes against common honesty, the chief cities, Turin, Venice, Bologna and Rome, have the predominance over the neighbouring districts. The same is true with regard to crimes against public decency. Turin, Genoa, Venice, Bologna, Naples, Rome and Palermo. In homicides, Rome alone holds the first place, for causes of which we shall speak later, followed by Turin. In all the other principal cities, homicides are decreasing. Vienna has 10.6 homicides to the million inhabitants, while Austria as a whole has 25. 
but Vienna has 116 thefts to 113 for the country at large. In Berlin, the crimes against property, theft, fraud and vagrancy really decreased from 1818 to 1878, notwithstanding the great change of population, while, on the other hand, crimes against persons increased except during the War of 1870. The number of homicides, however, is smaller than in the provinces, being 11.6 to the million inhabitants. Within Breslau is 18.2, in Magdeburg 12, and in Constance 16. In thefts, on the other hand, Berlin goes beyond all the provinces except one. In England, the phenomenon is still plainer. Though at present to the 100,000 in London, 15 suspected persons at liberty, with 50 in the other English cities, and 60 in the country districts. Just so there are in London, three to four suspected houses to the 100,000 population, 3.9 in the country, and 18 in the other cities. End of section 5《Section 6 of Crime, Its Causes and Remedies by Cesar Lombroso. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings from the public domain. For more information or volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 6 Subsistence, Famine, Price of Bread. Subchapter 24 Subsistence. One of the factors which complicate the effects of climate and density often at the point of their becoming inextricable, is that of the difficulty or ease of obtaining subsistence. Following Odingen's comparisons of the numbers of crimes in Prussia with the price of the necessary foods, we see that the food problem plays a part equal to, or even greater than, that of civilization. For with cheap food, crimes against property, except arson, decrease, while those against persons, especially rape, increase. A table is displayed on the page with a year compared with rapes, cases of arson, crimes against property, crimes against persons, price of grain, potatoes, etc. In Prussia in 1862, when the price of potatoes, etc. was very high, crimes against property were in the proportion of 44.38 to 15.8 for those against persons. When the price of provisions fell, the former went down to 41, while the latter rose to 18. The famine of 1847 increased the crimes against persons 24%. We have still plainer proof in the statistics for Prussia from 1854 to 1878 as given by Stark. A table is displayed on the page, displaying the years in which the price of wheat per 50 kilograms was. The data is arranged in several columns. We have crimes in general, thefts, forest thefts, forgeries, bankruptcies, crimes against public order, arson, assaults, homicides and fantasies compared to inhabitants, divided between more than 12 marks, less than 10 marks, between 10 and 12 marks. We see here that, while the price of wheat partially influences crimes in general, it has a direct effect only upon forest thefts, of which the maximum corresponds to the maximum price of provisions. On the other hand, it is clear that the maximum price of wheat, corresponding to a maximum of well-being, coincides with breaking out of assaults, homicides in cases of arson. This may be explained by the fact that when the price of bread is low, the abuse of alcohol is made possible. The median price of grain corresponds with the greatest frequency of forgeries, bankruptcies and crimes against public order. In France, in Croix's graphic tables, figure 1, we see that from 1843 to 1883, the line for the frequency of misdemeanors, nearly all against property, as well as that for suicides, rises continually and keeps nearly parallel with the line for the price of bread as far as 1865. At this point, however, while the line for misdemeanors continues to rise, that for the price of bread goes down, proving that other factors enter in here, reducing the costs of subsistence to the place of second importance. The line for crime proper shows no parallelism with the price of bread. Rossi comes to the same conclusions in a study of the criminality of Rome, Cagliari, etc., with respect to heat, and the price of grain for the period from 1875 to 1883. The number of crimes against property, excluding aggravated theft and high robbery, is affected at the same time by the winter temperature and the price of food. A graph is displayed on the page with misdemeanors, crimes, suicides, and the price of bread compared to the years of 1843 to 1883. In Rome, in fact, during these nine years, the highest number of crimes, 70,738, 
was reached in 1830, when a very high price of wheat and a rigorous winter coincided, while in 1877, when the price of wheat was high, but the winter partially mild, the number of crimes reached only 61,498. In 1881, when the price of wheat decreased noticeably and the mean winter temperature increased, there was also a noticeable decrease in the crimes against property. From 70,730, the number went down to 59,815, a diminution which continued through the years 1882 to 1883, while at the same time the price of grain and the rigour of the coal decreased also. The action of the temperature upon assaults and other crimes against persons from 1875 to 1883 amount to nothing, while for each increase in the price of food, there was a corresponding decrease in the number of these crimes and vice versa. But of all studies of the influence of work in the different kinds of crimes in Italy, the most conclusive is that of the hours of labour necessary to obtain the equivalent of a kilogram of wheat or bread. In this way the price of food is corrected for variations in wages. We see here in figures 2 and 3, First, that all crimes against property, except where contradictory factors come too powerfully into play, run with great fidelity parallel to the curve of the hours of work necessary to procure the equivalent of a kilogram of bread or grain. This increased from 137 to 153 during the period 1875 to 77, while the increase of the hours of work and decreased from 184 to 111 in the period 1879 to 88 with a decrease in the number of hours. Commercial crimes, forgeries, etc. were not affected. Second, crimes against morality increased as the necessary hours of labour diminish. Thus, from 1881 to 1888, a period in which the hours of work fell from 122 to 92, these crimes increased from 3.11 to 5.25. In England, Scotland and Ireland, the statistics for 50 years, which Fornasari Diverse has examined for me, shows an analogous relation between crime and the variations in the price of grain. This is to say, crimes against property without violence increased generally with the price of grain, as in 1846-47, while crimes of violence are almost wholly unaffected by food prices. A graph diagram is displayed on the page, displaying hours of work necessary to earn one cent of wheat, aggravated thefts, simple thefts, and forgery and swindling compared to the years of 1875 to 1889 in Italy. In 1842 to 45 and 1862 to 63, they fell with a fall of the price of grain, but rose in 1881 to 1886, notwithstanding the cheapness of bread. Fraudulent crimes against property, forgery, counterfeiting, etc., are likewise crimes against persons were not influenced by prices. For New South Wales, similar conclusions may be drawn from the investigations of Coughlin, Figure 4. The effect of the price of provisions upon murder is uncertain or negligible, the latter being also true of assaults. The influence upon theft is very great, as is also the inverse effect upon crimes against good morals, which increase with the falling off in the price of food. Famine lessens sexual vigour, and abundance excites it, and while the need of food drives men to theft, the abundance of at least the sexual crimes. The same observations hold good for the scarcity of work and reduction of wages. It has been remarked that women and domestic servants are more apt than others to be drawn to crime by the scarcity of food, doubtless because they feel it more. Especially is this the case with domestic servants, who because of intermittent periods of good living lose the power of resistance to provision. But admitting the action of scarcity of food upon the increase of thefts and of abundance upon the increase of homicides, assaults and debauchery, it is easy to understand its slight influence upon the variation of criminality in general. If one group of crimes increases with a given state of the market, another group decreases upon the same conditions, and vice versa. Even when the price of food moves in a constant direction, it does not modify essentially the proportion of certain crimes. For example, in Italy, the effect of the rise in price of food upon aggravated thefts is very marked. Yet the greatest difference is between 184 and 105. That is to say, a variation of 79 to the 100,000. Likewise, when the sexual crimes increase on account of the low price of food, the greatest difference is 2.14 to the 100,000. A fact easy to understand one thinks of the greater influence of hereditary climate and race.
At times there arises a strange contradiction in the effect of high prices on homicide. Ordinarily, when bread is dear, money is lacking to buy alcoholic drinks, and homicide and highway robberies diminish. But it happens sometimes in order to produce drink. Men will commit these crimes in greater number, as in New South Wales. Morbihan and Vendee, according to Jolly, are the most moral departments, and wages there have increased little, while the necessities of life have doubled in price. But there is less abuse of alcoholic drinks there. Figure 3 is displayed on the page, titled Italy. Through the years between 1875 to 1889, bread between number of hours of work necessary to earn one quart of grain, one quart of bread, and cases before theft, aggravated and simple, and imposture to imprisonment. It is also continued on this next page with the courts to 100,000 inhabitants, homicide, aggravated and simple, assault, sexual offences, and resistance to the government. One thing is certain, however, and that is that, while famines are rare and steadily decrease in number, thefts are constant and always increasing. From all this, it is easy to understand why the power which lack of food and real poverty play in crime is smaller than generally believed. In the statistics of Gurdy, the thefts of provisions form hardly 1% of the total number of thefts, and even with those hunger, has less to do than gluttony. Of 43 cases of objects stolen in London, sausages, fowls, and game stood 13th, sugar, meat, and wine 30th, and bread the last of all. Jolly remarks that in the French statistics from 1860 to 1890, while thefts of money and banknotes were most numerous, 396 to 100,000, thefts of meal, oats, domestic animals, etc., were only 55 to 100,000. Mayard writes, It is seldom that hunger leads to theft. Young men steal knives and cigars, and when provisions are stolen, the grown men take liquors, and women bonbons and chocolate. The same may be said of prostitution. If hunger and destitution, says Locatelli are sufficient to drive a young girl to prostitution, it will be necessary to confer Montin prizes upon the merits of virtuous daughters of the people who, notwithstanding the greatest privations and seductions of every kind, never sell themselves but remain pure and chaste. Figure 4 is displayed on the page, a graph displaying New South Wales statistics comparing the price of wheat per bushel, thefts, and swindling to the years of 1881 to 1891. It is not impossible that with time we may arrive at such a point as to be able to show how certain kinds of food favour certain crimes. We know that a vegetarian diet renders those who make use of it mild and traceable, or animal food makes men cruel and violent. This is doubtless why the Lombard peasant patiently bears the evil treatment of his masters, while the Romagnol, addicted to a pork diet, revenges himself with violence. Subchapter 35 Insurrections the influence of hunger in insurrections also has been much exaggerated, as I have shown in my crime politique in Faraglia's Valley Walk, Storia di Prezi in Napoli, which gives us the price of food year by year for nearly nine centuries. We find 46 great famines in the year 1182, 1192, 1257, 1269, 1342, 1496 to 97. 1505, 1508, 1534, 1551, 1558, 1562 to 63, 1565, 1580, 1790 to 91, 1802, 1810, 1815 to 16, 1820 to 21. Now, these 46 years of famine coincide with insurrections only six times, namely in 1508, 1580, 1587, 1595, 16 to 21, 22, 1820 to 21. In the celebrated insurrection of Massanello, 1647, Many other causes were associated with the economic situation, such as the madness of Massanello, the hot season, and the cruelty of the Spaniards. For even in 1646 there was a famine, in 1647 there was an abundance, if not of grain, at least of fruits, meat, lard, and cheese. 
Moreover, there was no insurrection during the terrible famine of 1182, which lasted five years, and which men could scarcely find weeds for food. Neither was there any revolt during the famine of 49697, when so terrible an epidemic resulted that the people of the cities had to flee to the country, nor during that of 1565, when its stress was so great that rotten cabbage leaves sold for the price that would normally have been purchased fresh and good ones. Nor was there any insurrection in 1570, when the poor left the provinces and strained towards the navels and crowds, famished, emaciated, sick, hoping to save their lives by flight and filling the streets with their misery. Finally, there was no insurrection during the famine of 1586. It is well to recall here that if there were revolts in France in 1827, 1832, 1847, running parallel with economic crises and dearths, there was also a very high summer temperature, and that during those of 1834, 1864 and 1865, we find nothing clearly indicating either an economic or a meteorological cause. In Strasbourg between the periods 1451 to 1500 and 1601 to 25, the average price of beef rose 134% and that of pork 92%. For well, many years, the wages of the workmen sank 10%, and yet there was no insurrection. In 1670, during the extreme famine in Madrid, the workmen organized themselves into bands and plundered the houses of the rich, killing the propertyers, and on a day pass as someone was not killed for the sake of bread, and yet there was no real insurrection. In India, it has been possible to follow the consequence of terrible famine step by step, that of 1865 to 66 caused the loss of 25% of the population of Orissa and a 35% of the population of Puri, and there was no insurrection there in those years. The most noted famines of the last hundred years, at least in Nanhor, one of the provinces which had suffered most through lack of rain and density of population, took place in the following years, 1796-70, to 1790-1794, 1790-92, 1802-1806-07, 1812-1804, 1824-1825, 1829-1830, In the famine of 1769-70, a third of the population died. In 1877-78, it is estimated that, in addition to the normal number of deaths, more than 5 million out of a population of 197 million died by famine. Yet these famines give rise to no insurrection. The Great Indian Mutiny of 1857-58 was due in great part to aversion to the innovations, railroads, telegraphs, etc., introduced by civilization, to the conspiracies of the dethroned princes, and according to Hunter, to the belief among the sepoys that their cutters were to be greased with pork fat. Here, then, prolonged hunger was less powerful than superstition. The other Indian rebellions which are known to us had no relation to the scarcity of provisions, neither the insurrection of Bohila in 1751 and that of the Six in the Punjab of 1710, nor that of Sepoys in 1764, neither the little semi-dynastic insurrections among the Sins in 1843 nor the Six in 1848. It is worthy to note that the provinces of Orissa, which is that most tried by famines, has the smallest number of insurrections. All this is to be explained by the fact, already shown by studies of the effect of tropical and polar climates, that when men's vitality is lowered, they have not enough energy to resist. Thus the excesses of human misfortunes is rather less likely to produce revolutions and great prosperity. This is entirely in accord with what has been observed in criminal statistics, namely, that famine and great cold diminish in general all crimes against persons, especially rapes and homicides. End of section 6《Section 7 of Crime, Its Causes and Remedies by Caesar Lombroso. This is the LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information on a volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 7 Alcoholism. Subchapter 36 Alcoholism and Food Supply. As we have seen in the preceding chapter, the effect of food supply cannot be separated from that of alcohol. Indeed, this latter is so powerful a factor in criminal etiology that absorbs the other almost completely. Subchapter 37 Pernicious Effect of Alcohol It is a well-known fact that alcohol, so far from rendering extreme temperatures more tolerable, increases the danger from great heat and cold alike. So that in the polar regions, and in India, soldiers and sailors, 
thinking to acquire greater resistance to fatigue by the use of alcoholic beverages simply aggravate their condition. It is doubtless for this reason that in the Russian campaign the northerners suffered more than the more temperate latents. It has been proved in cholera epidemics and that drunkards and even simple drinkers are afflicted in greater numbers than abstemious persons. Abortions are also more frequent among women who drink, and for this reason families of drinkers show a fecundity from two to four times less than that of temperate and sober couples. This fatal liquor can, then, stimulate carnal passion to the point of violence and crime without thereby increasing the birth rate. Alcohol is one of the principal causes of the rejection of recruits in the Swedish army for weakness or lack of development. These rejections rose from 32% in 1867 and fell to 28% in 1868 after the promulgation of the liquor laws. In the French departments where, on account of the scarcity of wine, there is more use of spirits, as in Finisterre, the exemption of conscripts from 72 rises to 155. Lunier. Alcohol influences the stature. The tall Wojaks, after having used brandy excess, diminished in stature until they fell below the middle height. And we have seen that the beautiful women of the Valley of Vieux lose their beauty and stature after having taken to the use of brandy. There is no cause for surprise, then, at the diminution of the average duration of life caused by the use of alcoholic drinks. Brandy should be called not eau de vie, but eau de la mort. Nissen's calculations show that the mortality among drinkers is at least 3.25 times greater than that of abstainers. Subchapter 38. Pauperism. All this repairs us to understand that one of the most evident and serious effects of alcoholism is pauperism. The progeny of the alcoholic are blind, paralytic, impotent. Even if they begin life with wealth, they must necessarily become poor. If they are poor, they are incapable of working. It is true that with the increase in wages, the number of drunkards grows disproportionately, and in consequence the number of misdemeanors also. When the wages of the miners in Lancashire increased from 4 shillings to 79, mortality caused by drunkenness rose from 495 to 1,304 and 2,605, and crimes from 1,335 to 3,878 and 4,402. But it is still worse when wages go down. Then alcohol is drunk to supply the place of clothing or food. That cold and hunger may be more easily borne, and alcohol in its turn makes the drinker constantly weaker and poorer, and keeps him always closely imprisoned in its fatal domain. It may be said, then, that alcoholism is a product both of superfluity and of poverty. This was seen in aix le chapelle where between 1850 and 1860, waiters increased a fourth, and alcoholism increased also, but it increased still more when after the crisis in America, 80 factories closed and wages were cut down a third. The number of poor families rose from 1,865 to 2,255, and the wine shops from 183 to 305. The prostitutes increased from 37 to 101, while the marriages decreased from 785 to 630. At the same time, causes of theft and arson were multiplied. In the famine of 1860-61, to it was noted in London that not one of the 7,900 members of the Temperance Society had applied for aid. Hirsch has observed that of each 100 pounds received in arms, 30 pounds are spent for drink. And Bertrand and Lee have remarked that the most miserable municipalities are those where the use of alcohol has increased inordinately and the wine shops are multiplied. A striking proof of the deleterious effect of alcohol is given by Upper Silesia. The misery was there so great that persons were dying of hunger, and at the same time alcoholism raged so frightfully that bridal couples were before the altar, and parents came intoxicated to the baptism of their newborn children. A preacher of Silesia wrote, Where in Tebra's reigns, misery and crime follow the body like its shadow. It has already been noted that drunkenness is one of the chief causes of separation and divorce in Germany, and furthermore, it is known that the children of divorced parents and second marriages furnish a strong contingent to crime and prostitution. Subchapter 39. Alcoholism and Crime Statistics From all this, it is easy to see the connection between alcoholism and crime from a social as well as a pathological point of view. 
The first proof of this is to be found in the statistics which show a continual increase in crimes in civilized countries. This increase can be justified by the growth of the population only to the extent of from 13% to 15%, but it is also too easily explained by the abuse of alcoholic drinks, and consumption of which increases at just the rate at which the crime increases. A further clear proof is to be found in Ferry's study of criminality in France, which brings to relief the parallelism of crime with the consumption of wine and spirits, at least in the years of exceptionally good vintages, 1850, 58, 65, 69, 75, and the exceptionally poor ones, 1851, 53, 54, 66, 67, 73. 1870, the year of the war, is an exception, as in that year military statistics crowd out judicial ones. In 1876, forms another exception, and one which I cannot explain, not having the statistics of the successive years before me, while in 1860 to 61, the village seems to have postponed its effect upon crime by one year. The parallelism is a strange and more noteworthy because several authors pretend to attribute a fatal influence to spirits only and not to wine, so that, as we shall see, it is proposed to encourage the distribution of wine in the countries most inclined to crime. Now, from these statistics, the relation of the consumption of alcohol to homicides and assaults is not so evident as that of wine except in the years 1855 to 1868, and 1873 to 1876. And this is easy to understand, for brawls are more easily started in the wine shops than in the establishments of the brandy cellars, where the stay is too short for an opportunity to be given for quarrels. Another proof of the relationship of drink and crime is to be found in the absurd fact that the days of month when crimes are most frequent are just those when alcoholic drinks are most abused. So, Schoenter reports that in Germany, out of 2,178 crimes, 58% took place Saturday night, 3% Sunday, and 1% Monday. And upon these same days, sexual crimes, rebellion, and arson took the lead with a ratio of 82%. In Italy, in 1870, the only year which a record of this kind was kept, the same fact was noted. Ferry discovered the surprising fact that in France, in the period from 1827 to 1869, while the crimes against persons in general fell off rapidly from August to December, the serious bodily assaults, on the contrary, showed a marked increase in November when the new wine comes in. It is to be noted that it is a question of the infliction of grave injuries such as come before the assizes, and not for the mere wine shop brawls such as are tried before the minor courts. Dixon has found a single place in America that has been exempt from crime for some years, notwithstanding its large population of working men. This is St. John's Burby, Vermont. But here there is absolute prohibition of the sale of fermented beverages, beer, wine, etc., which are furnished, like poisons, by the druggists upon the written demand of the customer, with the consent of the mayor, who writes the name of the person concerned in a public register. In Belgium, it is to be estimated alcoholism causes 25% to 27% of the crime. In New York, of 49,423 persons arranged, 30,509 were habitual drunkards. In 1890, in the whole United States, out of every 100 prisoners, 20 were drunkards, 60 were moderate drinkers, and 20 were abstainers. A table is displayed on the previous page. Crimes were committed on holidays. There would be only one holiday on the average to five working days. Data is displayed with the list of offences in as is and ordinary tribunals. Accordingly, all the crimes of violence and against persons take the lead on holidays as compared with fortunes and premeditated crimes. In Holland, four-fifths of the crimes are attributed to the abuse of alcohol, seven-eighths of the brawls, three-fourths of the attacks upon persons, and one-fourth of the attacks upon property. Three-fourths of the crimes in Sweden are attributed to alcoholism. This applies especially to assassination and other crimes of blood, but thefts and frauds are largely due to an alcohol hereditary. In England, 10,000 out of 29,752 convicted by the SEs, and 50,000 out of 90,903 convicted by the magistrates have been drawn to crime by frequently public houses. In France, Gouleman estimates the criminals resulting from the abuse of alcohol at 50%, and bear places those in Germany at 41%. The greatest proportion of drunkards is to be found in those 
departments where, on account of the small production of wine, a larger quantity of spirituous liquor is consumed. Of the criminals observed by Marrow, 73% abused alcoholic drinks, and of these only 10% were normal. In my Centuria di Criminali, Rossi found that drunkenness ran up as high as 81%, of which 23% was begun in infancy. There was a difference of only 10% in the frequency of alcohols among youths and among adults. Of 100 criminals below 20 years, 64% were already addicted to drink, from which we may see that this vice is very precocious. Subchapter 40. Physiological Effects All substances which have the power of exciting the brain in a normal manner drive one more easily to crime and suicide, as well as to insanity, with which last the other two are often inextricably confused. This tendency has been observed among the Medjidubs and the Aesonas, who, not having any narcotics, bring on intoxication by a prolonged osculatory movement of the head, and are dangerous people, says Bergruger, fierce and inclined to theft. Opium smokers also are often seized with homicidal fury, and out of the action of hashish, Maru felt himself impelled to steal. The effects of wine are still more pernicious and were still spirits, which may be called wine with its harmful principle concentrated. But most harmful of all are such liquors as absinthe and verma, which, in addition to alcohol, contain drugs that poison the nervous centres. Newman in 1876 showed how alcohol alters the haemoglobin, diminishes by one-fourth the capacity of the blood corpuscles to take up oxygen, and produces congestion in the membrane of the cortex in the brain. From this there results dilation of the blood vessels, paralysis of the muscular fibres of the walls of the vessels, oedema, and finally fatty degeneration of the irritated nerve cells. Krabelin showed that from 30 to 45 grams of absolute ethyl alcohol more or less checked and paralysed all the mental functions. This stupor, which resembled physical fatigue in its effect, increased with a dose of alcohol absorbed, lasting for small quantities 40 or 50 minutes, and for larger quantities 1 or 2 hours. In the smaller doses, the paralysis of the mental functions is preceded by a period of activity or acceleration which lasts 20 to 30 minutes at most. But this observer has further demonstrated that the effect of alcohol is not the same for all psychological functions, that while one may have a transitory acceleration of motor innovation, the intellectual functions such as appreciation, conception, association are checked and almost arrested even by the smallest doses of alcohol. The same may be said with regard to sensation. It follows that the initial period of excitation produced by small quantities of alcohol is only a kind of fireworks due to several factors coming together, especially to the increase of external associations of ideas, associations of words, sensations, etc., to the detriment of internal associations, those more logical and profound. Under the influence of alcohol, the overexcited motor centres give the drunkard an illusory power, impelling him to the most brutal acts. The association of ideas is disturbed, and the drinker repeats without cessation the same barren platitudes, the same coarse jests. This likewise is to be explained by the initial acceleration of the psychomotor activities by which painful mental inhibitions are intercepted. Alcohol, after it has once driven its unhappy victim into this evil path, holds him fast there, since, after a drunkard is once made, the noblest sentiments become paralysed and the soundest brain diseased. This is a new experimental proof of the truth of the statement that crime is the effect of a morbid condition of the organism. Thus, with alcoholics, the sclerosis which affects the brain, spinal cord and ganglia, as well as the liver and kidneys, shows its effects in one set of cases, in dementia, uremia or jaundice, according to the part affected, and in others by crime. But unhappily crime is a commonest and most frequent consequence, a truth of which there is superabundant evidence. I met recently in prison a very remarkable thief, who was a or do, boasted of being a thief, and did not know how to talk in anything but thieves slang, and yet neither his education nor the shape of his head gave any indication of what impelled him to crime. I soon learned the cause, however, when he told me that both his father and he were drunkards. You see, he said, since I was a boy, I had a passion for brandy, and now I drink from forty to eighty small glasses of it, and the brandy drunkenness passes away after I have drunk two or three bottles of wine. 
Habitual drinkers are not only immoral, and beget children who are defective, delinquent, or precocious debauchees, as we shall show by their history of the Duke family, but intoxication itself is a direct cause of crime. Gaul tells of a brigand named Betri, who felt himself impelled to homicide when he drank, and he mentions a woman in the Berlin who, when intoxicated, was seated with sanctuary desires. Alcohol, then, is the cause of crime. First, because many commit crimes in order to obtain drink. Further, because men sometimes seek in drink the courage necessary to commit crime, or an excuse for their misdeeds. Again, because it is by the aid of drink that young men are drawn into crime, and because the drink shop is a place for the meeting of accomplices, where they not only plan their crimes, but also squander their gains. It has been estimated that in London, in 1880, there were 4,938 public houses, which were the results of criminals and prostitutes exclusively. Finally, alcohol is a direct relation to crime, or rather to the prison, since after his first imprisonment, the liberated criminal, having lost his reputation and all connection with his family, seeks compensation and oblivion in drink. This is why we often find alcoholism among recidivists, and it also explains the fact observed by Mayhew that in the afternoon nearly all the thieves of London are intoxicated and generally die of drink between the ages of 30 and 40. The same thing is found among the transported convicts of Numia, who drink not only from settled habit, but also to forget dishonour, separation of family and country, and the cruelties of the wardens and their companions, and perhaps also to drown remorse. Wine becomes among them a regular medium of exchange. A shirt is worth one litre, a coat or pair of trousers too. There is nothing, even to the kiss of a woman, they may not be bought with wine. Subject 41. Specific Criminality It will be useful here to observe what criminals are especially influenced by alcohol. From Bayer statistics of the penitentiaries and jails of Germany, shown on the opposite page, it appears that alcoholism occurred oftenest in the case of those charged with assaults, sexual offences and insurrections. Next came assassination and homicide, and the last rank those in prison for arson and theft, that is to say, crimes against property. These, however, are more numerous than the others with habitual drunkards. The minimum occurs in the case of forgery and swindling, and the reason, as several swindlers have said to me, it takes a clear head to carry out a shrewd scheme. According to Barambat, of 3,000 convicted persons investigated by him, 78% were drunkards, vagrants, and mendicants lead with a figure of 79%, murderers and incendiaries showed 50% and 57% respectively, and thieves, swindlers, 71%. In general, 88% of the crimes against persons were committed by alcoholics, and 70% of the crimes against property. Mara also found that among drunkards, highway robberies held the first place, 82% percent been addicted to drink. Of brawlers, 77% were the same. Thieves seventy eight percent, then swindlers with sixty six percent, murderers with sixty two percent, and ravishers with sixty one percent. A table is displayed on the page, listing in penitentiaries, alcoholic criminals in general, occasional and habitual, and the total of assaults, robbery, murder, simple homicide, sexual crimes, theft, attempted homicide, arson, premeditated homicide, and perjury. And the second part in the common jails, with sexual offences, resistance to officers, assaults, arson, theft fraud, forgery, etc. Vitolt found that of 40 alcoholic criminals, 15 were homicides, 8 thieves, 5 swindlers, 6 sexual criminals, 4 brawlers, 2 vagrants. We may say in general that the serious offences, especially the infliction of bodily injuries and crimes against property, simple theft and robbery, are those in which the influence of alcoholism makes itself more decidedly felt, but this action is less evident in the latter class of cases than in the former. In studying the influence of alcohol upon the criminality of Great Britain and Ireland, there are to be found, according to Fornasari divers, some strange differences. 1. With the increased consumption of alcohol, crimes against property without violence frequently decrease, though irregularly, and with the falling off of the use of alcohol, crimes increase. There are, however, some exceptions. Thus, in 1875-76, they increased with the increased consumption, but in 1877-78, increased also, notwithstanding a diminution in the use of alcohol. 2. Upon violent crimes against property, the consumption of alcohol is no certain influence. 3. 
Fraudulent crimes against property mostly decreased with the greater consumption of alcohol. From 1870 to 1875, and from 1863 to 1865, as the consumption rose, these crimes descended from 276 to 260, and from 519 to 238. From 1848 to 1855, however, the two increased together. Consequently, independent of the consumption of alcohol, there was now an increase in a diminution of these crimes. Thus, while the use of alcohol went on diminishing from 1875 to 1884, fraudulent theft sometimes increased, sometimes decreased. 4. Forgery and counterfeiting also decreased up to 1884 with a lowering of the price of wine, but after that increased, notwithstanding the lower price. 5. Crimes against persons seem to follow the fluctuations of the consumption of alcohol beverages, increasing gradually with the rise in the price of alcohol, as in the period 1848 to 1857. They do not, however, decrease with the lowering of the price in the period 1873 to 1889. 6. The other crimes have no very clear relation with the consumption of alcohol, but misdemeanors and violations of police regulations decrease with the diminution in consumption. Finally, it may be remarked that though a very important factor in England where it makes itself felt with most intensity, alcoholism enters as its cause into no more than 77% of the cases. In New South Wales, there is no correspondence to be found between alcoholics and crime except in the case of theft and arson. Subchapter 42. Antagonism between alcoholism and crime in civilised countries. It is a remarkable fact that in civilised countries, where alcohol is most abused, as in New South Wales and England, its influence becomes weaker and weaker. And Bosco shows that in the United States, only 20% of the homicides are addicted to drunkenness, while 70% of the contrary are sober, opposite. This fact has already been explained by Collegiani and Zerboglio. It is not according to them that alcohol is any less terrible effect upon individuals, but that the abuse of it occurs where civilization is already very far advanced and protects the individual from great crimes by increasing inhibitory power and a greater psychic activity. This is why England, Belgium, Norway and Germany, which are the countries where the maximum quality of alcohol is consumed, but civilization is most advanced, furnish a smaller contingent of homicides than Spain and Italy, where less is consumed. Here is a recent table of alcoholism in Europe. The table is displayed on the page, listing Austria, Spain, Germany, Italy, United Kingdom, Belgium and France, with consumption of pure alcohol per capita in gallons and homicides to 100,000 inhabitants. This explains, as Collegiani very truly remarks, why in France the serious crimes caused by alcoholism which were from 7% to 11% in the period from 1826 to 1840, descended 5% and 3% in the period from 1861 to 1880. Alcoholism continues and even increases, but at the same time the inhibitory power given by civilization also increases. It's for this reason that crimes diminish, notwithstanding the influence of alcohol. We must add that in the North, the effect of the cold plays a large part, and although, on the one hand, induces men to drink, on the other hand, it lessens their impulsiveness and hence their tendency to homicide. Subject of 43. Political Disturbances Alcohol is a powerful factor in insurrections. This fact does not escape the attention of leaders of rebellions, who have often taken advantage of it to attain their ends. Thus in Argentina, Don Juan Manuel, himself an alcoholic, found a powerful aid to his political schemes in the explosions of popular rage produced by drink. For the same reason, alcohol was a political weapon in the hands of Quidorga, Franco, Artigas, and the wild followers, of whom several, like Blackito and Ogadu, became themselves the victims of delirium tremens. Ramos Maja. The abuse of spirituous liquors in Buenos Aires in 1834 is unbelievable. In that year, there was consumed, besides hundreds of hogsheads of brandy, 3,836 Frasqueres, 263 hogsheads, and 2,182 demijohns of gin, 2,246 hogsheads of wine, 346 barrels of beer, as well as cognac and port. During the French Revolution, it was alcohol that inflamed the bloody instincts of the crowd and the representatives of the revolutionary government. Among the latter, we may recall Monastier, who being intoxicated, had La Salle guillotined, and the next day did not remember the order he had given. 
The envoys from Mundi in three months emptied 1,974 bottles of wine, tame, and including their numbered Vacheron, who violated and then shot down women who resisted his alcohol-inflamed desires. It has been asserted that during the coup d'etat of the 2nd of December, enormous quantities of wine were distributed to the troops. Certainly, alcoholism was no stranger to the disturbances of 1846, among the chiefs of which, according to Chenu, there were two drunkards, Cossadier and Grand Mesnil. It is also certain that alcoholism played a great part in the commune, thanks to the great quantity of wine and spirits to be found in the besieged city. Despite notes in this connection that Dissomnia recruited the greatest number of the soldiers in the commune, who were withdrawn by the hope of gratifying their unfortunate appetite by pay and pillage, and whom alcoholism made indifferent to danger and wounds. The communist general Cluseret himself in his memoirs does not attempt to conceal the fact. Never, he says, have the wine sellers made so much money as at that period. He himself often had to have heads of battalions arrested for intoxication, not only between night and morning, but also between morning and night. When things began to look black for the besieged insurgents, when the Versailles troops were threatening Fort D.C. at close range, what did the defenders do? The taverns and wine shops of the village were crowded with customers, stupefied by drink. And as near as on the very eve of the capitulation, the National Guard followed its laudable custom, smoked, slept, ate and drank. Subchapter 44. Alcoholism and Evolution In the Man of Genius, I have shown that a number of men of genius, and certain of their parents, were alcoholics. Beethoven, Byron, Avicenna, Alexander, Murger. But one may say that this is rather an effect and complication of genius than a cause, for these great and powerful brains need ever some new stimulant. Parallel to this is the fact that the more civilized peoples mostly fall prey to alcoholism, as a necessary consequence of their greater cortical excitability. Subject of 44. Tobacco. According to Venturi, criminals show a greater number of uses of snuff, not only the normal persons, but also than the insane. Criminals, 45.8% insane, 25.88% normal persons, 14.32%. And among the criminals themselves, those guilty of crimes of blood show a higher percentage, 48%, than of thieves and forgers, 43%. Criminals and lunatics form this habit very early, which is not the case with the normal man. But while the habit grows upon the insane in the asylums, with criminals, it is not similarly increased by detention in prison. The prostitutes of Arona and Capua nearly all take snuff, and those who do not smoke. Marambat asserts that the passion of a minor for tobacco leads to idleness, drunkenness, and finally crime. Of 603 delinquent children from 8 to 15 years of age, 51% had the habit of using tobacco before their detention. Of 103 young men between 16 and 20, the proportion of tobacco uses was 84%. Of 850 mature men, 78% had contracted this habit before the age of 20. Of these, 516 or 57% had been in prison for the first time before the age of 20, while those who had never made use of tobacco, the proportion of those in prison so young was only 17%. Of vagrants, beggars, thieves, swindlers, etc., 89% of tobacco users. Among convicts who were drunkards, 74% used tobacco, among the others, only 43%. The number of recidivists among those who smoke is 79%, and only 55% among those who do not. Temperate prisoners show 18% of recidivists among those who do not smoke, and 82% among those who do. It is clearly to be seen, then, that there is a casual connection between tobacco and crime, like that which exists in the case of alcohol. But, as in the case of alcohol, is a curious fact that the countries where the consumption of tobacco is greatest have a lower criminality. This contradiction is frequently met in our researches, but it soon disappears because the abuse of these stimulating substances, as in the case of alcohol, takes place especially among civilized people who learn to control themselves. Subchapter 46. Hashish. Stanley found in Africa a kind of brigands called the Ruga Ruga, who were the only natives who used hashish to excess. According to a tradition of Uganda, crime appeared among the sons of Kinto after they had taken up beer drinking. Subchapter 47. 
Morphine. To the foregoing intoxicants, many more may be added. The Malay running a is impelled to his homosexual mania by the intoxication of opium. The Chinese opium eater is at once apathetic, impulsive, and inclined to suicide and murder. Many female swindlers have both the morphine habit and a tendency to hysteria, and those addicted to the use of morphine generally have a moral sense largely obliterated, and are in consequence the more inclined towards swindling and silence towards homicide and sexual offences. The slave to morphine loses little by little the power of resisting impulsive tendencies, to such an extent that it equals or surpasses the smoke of hashish, with whom criminal tendencies are common. A Chinaman, in order to get money for opium smoking, staked even his own fingers, which he cut off joint by joint as he lost. Dr. Lamson, a morphine user, poisoned his brother-in-law with morphine without comprehending the gravity of the act. When slaves to morphine are undergoing a forced abstinence, they show rage, melancholy, and a tendency to suicide and homicide, but especially towards theft for the purpose of procuring the desired drug. Grim Bale. Maradondi Montagiel reports the case of an advocate who, being refused morphine on board ship, broke into the ship's stores to procure it. A woman suffered so from being deprived of morphine that she ended by prostituting herself in order to obtain it. Another addicted to the use of morphine murdered her granddaughter and maintained that the drug drove her to acts of violence. An hysterical woman, 28 years old, had it afford by getting goods to the value of 120 francs under a false name, but with a strange improvidence. He returned to the store a few days after and returned part of the goods, saying that she was not satisfied with them. She had sold the rest to buy morphine for she owed the druggist 1,600 francs, and when he refused her further credit, she committed her offence. Subchapter 48. Spoiled Maze Indian corn that has become spoiled must be regarded as a cause of crime. Experimental observations have shown that hens of good-natured dogs fed upon spoiled maize become fierce after a time. I have already in my Etudes Cliniques sur la Pelagie, 1872, and in my Trait sur la Pelagre, Turin, 1890, told stories of criminals where the original factor was Pelagria, that is to say, the use of spoiled Indian corn. Thus the man afflicted with Pelagria out of avarice starved his children and killed one of them for having stolen a few potatoes out of his field to appease his hunger. A woman threw her newborn child into a well, almost publicly. Another stole to satisfy her insatiable appetite and said, I shall be capable of eating a man. All three had acquired moral insanity to an advanced age through being poisoned by maize. End of section 7。section 8 of Crime, Its Causes and Remedies by Caesar Lombroso。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 8. Influence of Education Upon Crime. Subchapter 49. Illiteracy and Crime. The absolute parallelism between education and crime, which many maintained several years ago, is today rightly regarded as an error. Barrow found that of 500 criminals and 500 honest men in Turin, there were illiterate, 12% criminal, 6% honest. Knowing how to read and write, 75% criminal. 67% honest. Educated, 12% criminal, 27% honest. With, it is true, a large proportion of criminals among the illiterates, but also among those who could read and write. Morano proved in 1878, in Palermo, that of 53 crimes committed in the school, 34 came from the pupils and 19 from the teachers, who certainly did not lack for education. Curcio found one confident Italy to 284 of the illiterate population, and 1 to 292 of the educated, figures which, with a slight increase in illiterates among the criminals, would balance one another. These very slight differences become, in certain categories of crime, still less marked. Three-sevenths of the convicts had received elementary instruction, and one-half of those guilty of sexual offences, one-half of the minor offences, and ten twenty-fifths of the criminals against persons and property had received some instruction. Curcio, obsit, 
and while criminals in general give an average of from 50% to 75% of illiterates, criminals who are still minors average only 42% and some provinces still lower. In Lombardy, for example, only 5% of the juvenile offenders are illiterate, and in Piedmont, 17%. As early as 1872, it had been estimated that to 453 illiterates, there were 51 who could read, 368 who could read and write, 401 who could read, write and count, and 5 who had received a higher education. According to Jolly, the Department of Heralds, which in 1866 gave the minimum of illiterates 1% among the conscripts, at that time had the lowest place in the scale of criminality, whereas now that it has a great number of schools is mounted to the highest, and a similar statement may be made of Dubes in Ron, Obstead. On the other hand, Dubes Severes, Fridney and Lot, with 12, Vienne with 14, Indra with 17, Gustenord with 24, and Morbihan with 35 illiterates furnished the minimum degree of criminality, id. Levasseur calculates that of 100 persons inducted in France, there were. The table displayed on the page, with columns displaying the years between 1830 and 1878, and knowing how to read or write, and having high education. Thus, in less than 30 years, criminals with more or less education doubled in number. Togerfield shows that in Connecticut, Criminality has increased with the increase in instruction. In the United States, the maximum figures for criminality is 0 0.35, 0 0.3, and 0 0.37 to the 1,000. We're noted in Wyoming, California, and Nevada, which gave the minimum number of illiterates, 3.4, 7.7, and 8%. And the minimum figures of criminality were found in New Mexico, 0 0.03, South Carolina, 0 0.06, Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, and Louisiana which had the highest number of illiterates. Nebraska, Iowa, Maine, and Dakota were exceptional, having a small number of criminals and illiterates, both as a result of other causes which we shall see presently. In England, the countries of Surrey, Kent, Gloucester, and Middlesex, where there is a higher degree of education, gave the maximum degree of criminality, while the minimum was shown by the more illiterate districts, North Wales, Essex, and Cornwall. In Russia, where education is much less common, Otingen, 3rd ed, page 587, calculates that 25% of the convicts know how to read and write, and even 29% of the men, while the population at large only a percent can read and write. Examine, says Loverage, the records of the courts, and will see that the most unreformable criminals are all educated. Let's four cases, page 207. But Cochrane gives us a still better proof in his Wealth of New South Wales, Sydney, 1895. There, the percentage of illiteracy among the general population in 1880 was 12. The illiterate prisoners were 5.5% of the illiterate population. And the more or less educated prisoners, 6.2% of the educated population. A table is displayed on the page, listing crimes against persons, against property with violence, against property without violence, rioting, drunkenness, and counterfeiting, compared with persons arrested, illiterate, and knowing how to read, and read and write. In 1891, the general percentage of illiteracy was 7%. The illiterates imprisoned 4.1%, and the educated persons imprisoned 4.7%. That is to say, absolutely as well as relatively, that persons who had received instruction had committed more crimes than the illiterate. A table is displayed on the page, listing Gloucester, Middlesex, North Wales, and Cornwall, compared to convicts to 10,000 inhabitants, and percentage of illiterates. From 1891 to 1891, pupils in schools increased from 197,412 to 252,940, and the persons arrested from 39,758 to 44,851. For each 10 new schools opened, there were five more arrests, and this was true in all the different branches of crime. Subchapter 50 Diffusion of Education its advantages. However, an impartial examination of the figures for these last years brings the comforting assurance that education is not so fatal as it appears at first to be. It favours crime only up to a certain point, after which its influence is the other way. Where education is widely diffused, the list of educated criminals increases, but the list of illiterate criminals increases still more, which shows that the criminality of the class with a moderate amount of education is decreasing. Thus, in New York, 
while the whole population showed 6.08% of illiteracy, and the immigrants who furnished the greatest proportion of criminals lay 1.83%. The criminal class showed an illiteracy of 31%. Of the homicides recently convicted in the United States, 33% were completely illiterate, 64% could read and write, and 3% had a higher education, while the illiteracy of the population at large was only 10%. In Austria, while the young and moral population of Salzburg and the Tyrol have no illiterates, the criminal population show an illiteracy from 16% to 20%, Mesodaglia. In the recent statistics of Joy, opposite, we find that in France, to the 100,000 inhabitants, six departments had 7 to 10 illiterates to 9 indictments, 13 departments had 10 to 20 illiterates to 9 indictments, three departments had 20 to 50 illiterates to 9 indictments, 11 departments had 50 to 61 illiterates to 9 indictments. Here crime increased with a moderate education and decreased with a higher education. In France also the following percentages of illiteracy were found. The table is displayed on the page with a column listing the years of 1827 or 1877 and compared among soldiers and among criminals. The illiterates in each of the two categories diminish each year. Then, but much more slowly among the criminals, and we may add that the criminal under 21 years of age decreased from 1828 to 1863 by 4,152 individuals. The facts appear still more clearly if we study the number of pupils in Europe following Levasseur and the proportion of pupils in the public and private schools to the population following Bodio, together with the statistics of homicides and thefts given by Ferry and those of revolutions given in my crime politique. We shall find the following data. A table displayed on the page listing Prussia, Switzerland, England, Netherlands, Sweden, Austria, France, Belgium, Spain, Italy, and Russia, comparing data to pupils to 100 inhabitants, homicides 1880 to 82 to 100,000, thefts to 100,000, revolutions to 10 million. From this we see that the number of homicides decreases with the increase in the number of pupils, except in the case of Russia with only 14 homicides, notwithstanding the minimum number in the schools, 2.4, and of Switzerland, which has high figures for both pupils and homicides. Thefts follow the opposite course. They rise in England, Belgium, and Prussia, with a greater number of pupils in the schools, and fall in Spain with a smaller number. Revolutionary tendencies give contradictory results. This relation is maintained to a certain point everywhere if we study the nations severally. In Italy, the parallelism between homicide, rape, and ignorance is complete. The minimum, mean, and maximum of ignorance corresponding to those of the two crimes mentioned, as seen in the following table. A table is displayed on the page. Number of crimes to the 100,000 inhabitants with illiteracy. The data compares homicides, rapes, frauds, and thefts to percentage illiterate. We have seen in France and England that crimes of blood are becoming more and more rare in the large cities, where they are nearly always committed by peasants and mountaineers, while crimes against property, on the other hand, are on the increase. A similar situation prevails in Italy with regard to recidivists, just because they are more educated. In Belgium, great crimes had decreased each year since 1832, falling from 1 to 83,573 of the population, which was a figure for the year mentioned, down to 1 for each 90,220 in 1855. In Switzerland, great crimes had decreased 40% since 1852. In France, the more serious crimes, those passed upon by the Azizis, had fallen from 40 to 100,000, which was a figure in 1825 to 11 to the 100,000 in 1881. While the offences which came before the magistrates rose from 48,000 to 205,000. There is, it is true, an augmentation of crime amounting to 133%. But crimes of blood have diminished, while social crimes have been on the increase. From 1826 to 1880, thefts increased 238%, frauds 323%, breach of trust 630%, and social crimes 700%. Vagrancy is four times greater, and offences against officials five times. Bankruptcies have risen from 2,000 to 8,000, and while the number of merchants has increased, of course, this increase has not been in the same proportion. These differences express the influence of education, but this influence has been more remarkable as well as more favourable in England, where from 1868 to 1892, the number of prisoners fell from 87,000 to 
50,000. And the number of adult criminals from 31,295 to 29,825. Yet the population increased in the same time 12%. And now it is calculated that there are about 21 illiterates out of every 100 indicted. This diminution occurs especially in London, where schools are more numerous and widely diffused. Subchapter 51. Special Criminality of the Illiterate and of the Educated. All this explains a phenomenon which appears at first completely self-contradictory, namely, that education now increases crime and now decreases it. When education is not yet diffused in a country and has not yet reached its full development, it at first increases all crime except homicide. But when it is widely disseminated, it diminishes all the violent crimes except, as we shall see, the less serious crimes, the political crimes, or the commercial or sexual crimes, because these increase naturally with the increase of human intercourse, business, and cerebral activity. But education has an indisputable influence upon crime in changing its character and making it less savage. Fayette and Lacazin showed that in France, 1. Among illiterates, the crimes which lead are infanticide, abortion, theft, formation of criminal bands, robbery and arson. 2. Among those who can read and write imperfectly, extortion, threatening letters, blackmail, robbery, injury to property, and assaults predominate. 3. Among those who have received a moderate education, bribery, forgery, and threatening letters prevail. 4. Among the well-educated, the predominant crimes are forgeries of commercial papers, official crimes, forgery, abstraction of public documents, and political crimes, opposite. The minimum of forgeries and the maximum of fantasides are found among the illiterate. With the convicts of a higher education, the prevailing crime is forgery of public documents breach of trust and swindling. Infanticides and violent crimes are lacking. Accordingly, there is a type of crime for the illiterate, namely the savage type, and one for the educated, the milder but more cunning type. In the same way, according to the most recent studies of Soquet, we see that in France, the illiterate criminals gradually diminished in the period 1876-80, in comparison with the period 1831-35. Homicides and murders have decreased among them by half, infanticides and abortions by a third, and sexual crimes nearly a half. The violent crimes of educated criminals are, on the whole, diminishing, while their other crimes are nearly at a standstill. As to political crimes, these increase constantly among the educated. History teaches us that it has been the highly civilized states, Athens, Genoa, Florence, which furnish the maximum number of revolutions, and is certainly not among the illiterate that the Nihilists and Anarchists get their recruits, but among the more highly educated. Of this I have given abundant proof in my crime politique. In Austria, the crimes which prevail among the illiterate are robberies, abductions, infanticides, abortions, murders, bigamy, homicides, malicious injury to property, and assaults. In Italy, following the remarkable study of Amati, we find a table displayed on the page with four columns. List as crimes, 1881-83, with political crimes, frauds, homicides, thefts, rapes, and rebellions, compared to illiterate percentages, able to remain white in percentages, and more highly educated percentages. Among 500 individuals who had a higher education, there were in 1881-83 the following number of the crimes specified, the second figure giving the number to the 1,000. Forgeries, 76 to 152. Homicides, 44, 88. Thefts, 40, 80. Forwards, 57, 114. Extortions, 38, 76. Highway robberies, 22, 44. Sexual crimes, 34 to 68. Bankruptcies, 33, 66. Perjuries, 2, 4. Assaults, 13, 26. Parasites, 2, 4. Political crimes, 14, 28. Crimes against religion, 1 to 2. Destruction of property, 4-8. Arson, 9-18. Instigation of crime, 6-12. Abortions, 1-2. That is to say, the figures are higher for forgery, fraud, sexual crime, bankruptcy, theft, extortion, homicide, and lower for assault, highway robbery, parasite, and arson. Accordingly, while the illiterate lead in homicide and theft, 
the fully and partially educated, together show a high figure for political crimes and an absolute majority of the rapes and frauds. But it should be observed here that the above statistics belong to a period when thought was completely free in Italy, and when, therefore, though comparatively few political uprisings did not draw into their ranks the better part of the population, hence the relatively large number of illiterates. Now, however, those condemned for political crimes belong to the more highly educated strata of the nation. The same thing is true of Russia, where the greatest number of political offenders is furnished by the educated class. Thus, from 1827 to 1846, the nobles exiled to Siberia for political causes were 120 times as numerous as the peasants. Of 100 women condemned for political crimes in Russia, 75 were well educated, 12 could read and write, and 7 were illiterate. It cannot be said, then, that education always acts as a preventive of crime, nor, on the other hand, that it always impels toward crime. When it is really diffused among all classes, it has a beneficial effect, diminishing the number of crimes among the moderately educated and making the character of them milder. Subchapter 52. Education in the Prisons However, if education is valuable for the population in general, it nevertheless ought not to be extended to the inmates of prisons, unless it is accompanied by a special training designed to correct the passions and instincts rather than to develop the intellect. Elementary education is positively harmful as applied to the ordinary criminal. It places in his hands an additional weapon for carrying on his crimes and makes a recidivist of him. The introduction of schools into the prisons, at once bringing bad men into contact with each other and developing their intelligence and power, explains, to my mind, the great number of educated recidivists. For statistics show us that of crimes against property made easier by education, recidivists committed over twice as many, 67.4%, as non-recidivists, 28.47%, or that crimes against persons were relatively much fewer. It is doubtless the elementary instruction given in the prisons of France, Saxony and Sweden that accounts for the large number of forgeries committed by recidivists. The pickpocket and cutthroat learn in prison at the expense of the state and make false keys to make counterfeit money to engrave banknotes and to commit burglaries. Subchapter 53. Dangers of Education Knowledge, says Seymour, is power, not virtue. It may be the servant of good, but it may also be the servant of evil. To put the same truth in other words, the simple sensory knowledge, or the form of letters or the sound which indicates an object, or the knowledge even of the great technical scientific advances which have been made, does not raise a moral plane in the least degree. Indeed, it may become, on the contrary, a powerful instrument for evil, by creating new crimes that more easily escape the clutches of the law. Thus, the advancement of science may enable criminals to use a railroad, as was the case with Taybert in 1845, or dynamite, as with Thomas, or the telegraph and cipher messages, as in the case of the Venetian Fangin, who used this means to indicate to his accomplices the courier who was to be robbed, Caruso, the bandit, who were accustomed to say that if he had known the alphabet, he would have conquered the world. And the murderer Del Perro declared, at the foot of the gallows and the cause of his ruin, was the education which his parents had procured for him, since it had made him prefer idleness and poorly paid labour. Finally, all criminals learn, by reading the accounts of trials, of which they are very fond, to put into practice the arts of their predecessors. Thus among 150 vagrants, may you found 50 who had read Jack Shepherd and other stories of criminals, who declared that this reading had inspired their first steps in a life of crime. From the lowest education to the highest among the Latins, with whom crime is continually increasing, there is no teaching given that does not open the wound rather than heal it. And especially is this the case with political crimes. We live in a stirring time when the days are years and the years centuries, and would have our young people live in an atmosphere thousands of years old. The best intelligence has not time enough to take in that part of knowledge that is necessary to all, like natural history, hygiene, modern languages and economics, and would have the youth spend his precious hours in learning to babble dead languages and dead sciences, and all to make him a man of good taste. It seems ridiculous to waste ten or twelve years on flowers and musical scales. The mighty torrent of modern life, laden with facts, passes before us and we do not see it. How it will make our descendants smile to think that thousands and thousands of men have seriously believed that some reluctantly learned and quickly forgotten fragment of the classics, or worse still, the dry rules of ancient grammar, were the best means of developing the mind 
and forming the character of a young man. Better means are the exposition of the most important facts. Better means than study of the causes of those facts. In the meanwhile, we are creating generation after generation whose brains are crammed with study of the form only and not of the substance. And worse than this, since the form may be transmitted in some masterpiece, with an adoration of the form which amounts to fetishism, and is the more false, fly and sterile, the longer it has been profitlessly employed. It is from this sort of education that has come the adoration of violence, and has been the starting point of all our rebels, from Cola di Renzi to Robespierre. What is the whole classical education but a continual glorification of violence in all its forms? In this matter, all political parties are alike. So deep said it is evil. The clericals cry hurrah at the danger thrust of Ravalniac, and the conservatives do likewise at the wholesale execution of the communists in 1871. What wonder then that in a society saturated with violence, violence breaks out from time to time on all sides in storm and lightning. It is not possible to declare with impunity that violence is holy, with a proviso that is to be used only in a certain way, for sooner or later someone will come to transfer the gospel of force from one political creed to another. I am glad that my illustrious master Taine has preceded me in this line of thought. In his last pages he has given an almost posthumous admonition to us poor Latins, so vainglorious and so obstinately attached to that which is our ruin. The true learning, the true education, writes Taine, is acquired by contact with things, by innumerable sense impressions which a man receives all day in the laboratory, the workshop, the courtroom, or the hospital impressions which enter by the ears, the eyes, the nose, to be consciously or unconsciously assimilated by him, and which sooner or later suggest to him a new combination, a simplification, an economy, an improvement, an invention. Of these invaluable contacts, of all these assimilable and indispensable elements of mental life, the French youth is deprived just at the most fruitful age. For seven or eight years he has sharp in school, cut off from the personal experience that would give him a correct and vivid idea of things, of men, and of the way to equip himself for life. It is too much to demand of young people that upon a set day they shall present themselves in the examination room in the possession of all knowledge. As a matter of fact, after two months, after the examination, they have forgotten everything. In the meantime, their mental vigour declines, freshness and fertility disappear. The accomplished man, or rather the man who is no longer capable of any change, becomes ticketed, resigned to a life of routine, perpetually turning the same wheel. On the other hand, the Anglo-Saxons, the only race in Europe, as we shall see, among whom criminality is declining, have not our innumerable special schools. Among them, instruction is given not by the book, but through the object itself. The engineer, for example, is educated not in the school, but in the workshop, a thing which permits each man to reach the grade suited to his intelligence. Workman or builder, if he can raise no higher, engineer, if his talents permits. With us, on the other hand, with the three grades of instruction, for childhood, youth, and young manhood, with the theoretic and scholastic instruction imparted by means of benches and books. The mental tension is simply increased and prolonged by the prospect of examinations, diplomas, degrees, and commissions, while our schools do not give the indispensable equipment, namely, a sound and firm understanding, will, and nerves. So the entrance of the student to the world, and his first steps in the field of practical action, are oftenest by a succession of unfortunate falls from which he emerges bruised, even if not crippled. It is a rough and dangerous experiment. His mental poise is disturbed, and is in danger of not being re-established. The disillusioning is too rude and too violent. Finally, education often incites to evil by creating new needs and aspirations without giving the power to gratify them. Especially this brought about by the mingling of good and bad elements in the school, and influence the more dangerous when the teacher himself inclines to evil, particularly as sexual relations, as has been observed in Italy and Germany. In this matter, I am much of Dante's opinion. Che dove l'argumento di la mente, se aguinge al ma voler et alla posa, ne san reparo a vi pua fa la gente. He reckons as jolly, upon the school supplying the place of the parents, who are kept occupied at their work, or who lack the knowledge or ability to do their duty by their children. And you count, on the other hand, on the family to supply the deficiency of the moral training of the school. But while each waits for the other, they unite in accomplishing nothing. There's a footnote of the page, translated from the Italian pose, 
where intelligence is united with power and wickedness, the efforts of men are vain. Inferno, chapter 31. End of section 8. Section 9 of Crime, Its Causes and Remedies by Caesar Lombroso. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 9. The Influence of Economic Conditions. Wealth. Subchapter 54. The influence of wealth is a factor much more disputed than that of education, and the most impartial examination of the facts fails to give a complete solution, for the investigator fails to secure a sufficient number of decisive proofs. Bodio himself in his classic work, De alcuni indici numeratori del movimento economico in Italia, 1890, shows that it is impossible to give an answer to the question, what is the actual wealth of Italy? It is impossible to place a valuation upon all the agricultural mineral wealth, because we have no exact statistics of mining and agriculture. A statement of all individual properties is possible for lack of a stimulus, appraisal of all real and personal property. It is necessary, therefore, to rely upon private statements as found deeds of gift and wills. The average wage must be arrived at hypothetically upon the basis of the minimum necessary for living, which itself, in turn, is based upon conjectural data. To estimate wealth on the basis of taxes alone is seen plainly to be impossible when one reflects that the errors of the assessors by themselves will be sufficient to overthrow all calculations without considering the numbers of businessmen and beggars, and even professional men who escape taxation more or less completely. This is why the results in this division of the subject, however, one may attack it, hardly succeeded in establishing an exact relation between wealth and the more important crimes. Subject 55. Taxes. The following tales present a comparison of the number of the principal crimes compared with the sum total of all taxes paid by the inhabitants of the various provinces, including taxes upon consumption, internal revenue, tobacco, salt, etc., direct taxes, farm property, real estate generally, personal property, etc., and taxes upon business. A table is displayed on the page, titled Maximum Wealth, with six columns. Averaging tax paid in capital in francs, province, sexual crimes, frauds, thefts, homicides. Additional table, mean wealth, with taxes, providence, sexual crimes, frauds, thefts, and homicides. Same comparison on a second table with mean wealth, and a third, minimum wealth. The next table is formed by arranging these figures in groups, and adding to them the data for the years 1890 to 93, furnished by Baudio, in which he includes besides the thefts tried at the Aziz, those coming before the minor courts. A table is displayed with fraud, sexual crimes, thefts and homicides compared with wealth in 1885-86 and wealth 1890-93, split between three columns, maximum, mean and minimum. On which it appears that fraudulent crimes increased positively with the increase of wealth, and the same is true of thefts, but if we add rule of thefts we get the maximum where wealth is least. And this last is always true of homicides. This more shows clearly the influence of mere poverty upon the minor crimes. We have already shown in the chapter on subsistence that in Germany, while thefts in general became less frequent in the years when the price of grain was lowest, and increased when the price was very high, thefts from the forests, on the other hand, pursued the contrary course. But these thefts, which still recall the ancient time when land and pasture were common property, are bound up with old tradition and only exceptionally represent the immorality of the country. The results for sexual crimes are more unexpected. They show the minimum in Italy, where wealth is moderate, and the maximum where there is the minimum of wealth. Italy thus presents an exception, as the usual course of sexual crimes is to increase with the increase of wealth. An examination of the figures shows likewise that there are individual provinces which give figures very far from the average of their several groups. Subchapter 56. Inheritance Taxes De Fauville believes that it is possible to estimate private wealth upon the basis of the declarations and wills, but if we study Pantaleone's very valuable statistics for Italy, we shall see with what difficulty we shall arrive at any idea of the relation of crime to wealth. In fact, in studying the table given on the following page, 
we draw the conclusion that the richest districts, Piedmont, Liguria, Lombardy, and Tuscany, have a proportion of crimes against property less than the average of the kingdom. The same is true of the districts, which in wealth come nearest in the average. Venice and Emilia. The poorest regions, Sardinia, Sicily, and Naples, have a high criminality. But Umbria and the Marches, which are also poor, show a very low figure for crime. Thefts are very rare in Tuscany, Lombardy, Emilia, Piedmont, and Liguria, which are the richest districts, and also in one of the poorest, the Marches. In Sicily, they are moderately numerous, and in Venice a little more so. A fact to be explained by the intense misery of the agricultural population of the latter district. The richest district, Latium, and the poorest, Sardinia, have the greatest number of thefts, so that here there is no equivalent parallelism with wealth. Bodio observes that in the case of Latium, it is necessary to take account of the disturbing influence of the capital upon both crime and wealth. The inheritance taxes are in this case an unreliable measure of the wealth of the locality, since there is capital concentrated here which belongs to other districts. Besides this, there is at Rome, on account of special conditions of rural property and the system of cultivation and use, a very limited number of persons who have immense properties, a fact which has a disproportionate effect upon the inheritance taxes. The smallest number of frauds is found in Umbria and the Marches. Then come Tuscany, Emilia, Venice, Piedmont, Liguria, and Lombardy, which are the richer districts. The districts of Naples furnish fewer frauds by a great deal than it would seem it should because of its comparative poverty. A table is displayed on the page titled Indictments. Average to 100,000 population, 1887-89. These list Latium, Piedmont, Liguria, Lombardy, Tuscany, Venice, Reggio, Emilia, Sicily, Naples, Marches, Umbria, and Sardinia, compared with average wealth, thefts, frauds, highway robberies, homicides, and assaults. The minimum number of highway robberies is shown by Venice and Lombardy, rich, and by Umbria and the Marches, poor. The medium number by Tuscany, Emilia, Naples, Piedmont, and Liguria, Sardinia and Sicily, which are poor, are joined with the wealthy district of Latium in giving the maximum. The great contradictions are very apparent. Subchapter 57. Lack of Employment One would be tempted to believe at once that unemployment must exercise a perceptible influence upon criminality. It is, however, of little importance. In New South Wales, the effect of periods of idleness upon the workmen is also nothing. Wright maintains that at the same time of industrial depressions, all crimes are increased, but he presents no proof. When he says that of 220 convicts in Massachusetts, 147 were the regular work, and that 68% of criminals have no occupation, he only bears witness that criminals do not like to work, a fact that is very well known. In the United States, 82% of the murderers about whom the facts were ascertainable were occupied when they committed their crime, and only 18% were without work. It seems then that unemployment is not a cause of crimes or violence. The fact that the majority of criminals have almost never a settled trade does not contradict this. They never had an occupation and never wanted to have one, while the real unemployed are those who have had work and lost it through circumstances beyond their control, or practically so, allowing for strikes. Subchapter 58. Days of Work A surer criterion for this question is to be found in the number of days' wages equivalent to the annual price of food for one individual. See Table. Footnote 5. This approaches closely to the study which we have already made of the cost of subsistence. A table is displayed on the previous page, comparing days of work equivalent to a year's food in England and Wales, Scotland, Ireland, Belgium, France, Germany, Austria, Italy, and Spain, and compared to the number of persons to the 100,000 inhabitants convicted for homicide, assault, several offences, and theft. We see here, one, that excessive labour in connection with the minimum wage, that is to say, with a lack of proper nourishment, has a certain correspondence with homicide. In fact, Scotland, England, and Ireland, which had the minimum number of days' work, have also the minimum of homicides. 0 0.51, 0 0.56, 1.05, and Spain and Italy, which had the maximum, had the maximum of homicides, 8.25, 9.53. 2. Further, there is a certain correspondence in the case of assaults. 
England, Ireland, and Scotland, which have the minimum necessary days of work, 127, have also in the minimum number of assaults, 2.67, Austria and Italy have a maximum number of days of work, 152 and 163, with the maximum of assaults likewise, 155, 230. But there is at the same time an exception in the case of Spain, which has a small number of assaults, with a large number of days, and also in the case of Belgium, which shows a large number of assaults, 175.34, with only 136 days of work, a fact certainly to be traced to the influence of alcoholism. The influence is reversed in the case of sexual offences. Of these, one frequently observes the lower numbers where the number of days' work required is highest. Thus, Spain, where 154 days are required, has but 1.03 sexual crimes, while Belgium, which is next to the smallest number of days of work, 130, has next to the highest number of these offences. The United Kingdom, however, which shows the minimum number of days, has the second lowest number of sexual crimes. 4. The number of thefts is apparently in no way affected, for we see all degrees of this crime in countries with both high and low figures as the days of work, as in Spain, Belgium, France, Italy, etc. Subchapter 59. Savings Banks. I have thought that the number of the depositors in the savings banks would give more reliable data for the real wealth of a country, because this would give the measure of the principal source of wealth, foresight and economy, and hence measure how prevalent among the people are the forces that inhabit violence and crime. As a matter of fact, we have already seen that in France, wealth is in direct relation to the lower birth rate, which at bottom corresponds to greater foresight and a greater inhibitive power. According to Coglain, Obsit, we find in Europe, a table displayed on the page, comparing Switzerland, Denmark, Sweden, England, Prussia, France, Austria, and Italy, to Persons Street Savings Bank Book, and crimes to 100,000 inhabitants, homicide and theft. These figures show how homicides decrease as the number of bank books increases, while the contrary is true of thefts. In Italy it is true, from the very limited data that we have, we see the greatest number of savings bank books, while corresponding, as elsewhere, with the smallest number of homicides, corresponds also with the smallest number of thefts. The average of the different crimes in the 20 Italian provinces that have the greatest number of savings bank books, 1, 2, from 3 to 6 inhabitants, in the 20 with the smallest number, 1, 2, from 15 to 24, and in the 20 that we have a medium number, 1, 2, from 8 to 13, is as follows. The average number of crimes in 20 provinces in which number of books is a table displayed on the page, listing fraudulent crimes, sexual crimes, thefts and homicides, compared to maximum, intermediate and minimum. As we have seen in the case of taxes in Italy, so it is here. And there is less foresight in saving, as evidenced by the number of savings bank books. There are more crimes of blood, thefts and rapes, but less swindling. While these relations are just reversed for the maximum and moderate degrees of wealth, this simply means that a country is still barbarous is more inclined to violence than into cunning. But the same peculiarity with regard to Italy that we noted in connection with the taxes is again apparent here, namely that rapes, which elsewhere increase with wealth, here are most common in the poorest provinces. However, where race and climate already impel to evil, wealth, as I've already said, can do nothing. Thus we find a high number of homicides in the richest provinces like Palermo, with 42, Rome with 27, Naples with 26, and Leghorn with 21. These apparent exceptions are explained by the geographical position of Palermo and Naples, by race at Leghorn, and in Rome by race, abuse of alcohol, and political conditions. The contrary is true of the poorer provinces, which geographical position, climate, and race exaggerate the influence of poverty. For the highest figures are to be found in the southern and insular provinces, in the case of sexual crimes also, there are analogous exceptions and explanations, since a large number are to be found in the rich provinces of Leghorn, 26, and Rome, 22, while among the poor provinces, a very small number is shown by Reggio, Emilia, Vicenza, 4, Bolino and Rovigo, 5, Udain, 7, etc. Here again, the explanation is evidently ethnic and geographic. This proves indirectly that the high figures shown by the poorer provinces in southern Italy and the islands are connected not with economic peculiarities, but with race and climate. Subchapter 60. 
savings in France. As regards France, by estimating the wealth in the several departments on the basis of the number of savings bank books to 1,000 inhabitants, we find that crimes invariably increase directly as wealth increases. Thus, departments where the degree of wealth is a table displayed on the page, with average number of homicides, thefts, rapes compared to minimum, medium, and maximum. The striking difference of the influence of savings in France and in Italy is explained, up to a certain point, in the same way that we have explained the difference that we have found between the two countries in the influence of density, see chapter 5. Namely, that it is to the richest districts of France, when manufacturing is most developed, that the emigrants flow, and these commit, in general, four times as many crimes as the French. Now, from 1851 to 1886, the number of immigrants into France tripled, and the quality of the immigrants deteriorated as their numbers increased. From the beginning, it is the better elements that come in. The latter, when the current that carries men from one country to another becomes too strong, it carries the worst elements with it, jolly. The departments of Nord has four times more foreigners than Bouches du Rhône, and nineteen times more than Herod's, but it has nine times more naturalizations than the former, and seventy-five times more than the latter. That is to say, the foreign element in Nord is much more stable and assimilable, being largely Belgian, while Herod is much frequented by Spaniards. Immigrants are also drawn into France by the low birth rate and by the frequency of strikes, which give them hope of finding work. In southern Italy, climatic and ethnic factors come into collision with the economic factor. We have already seen that in consequence of the joint effort of the Semitic element in the population and the hot climate, all crimes against persons, and in part those against property, are abnormally increased. But it would be a great mistake to suppose that the explanations are sufficient. We have still to look for a graver cause. If we compare certain districts of Italy, like Piedmont and Lombardy, with parts of France that are similar in race and climate, we shall see that under nearly identical conditions, opposite phenomena occur. In Italy, the greater savings correspond with a smaller number of crimes, while in France the contrary happens. Here we must see the cause and the fact that in France the maximum wealth is enormously greater than in Italy at least four times as great in fact. This is the more important, since in many places in France, this wealth, being too quickly acquired, drives its possessors to the greatest debauchery, so that, as Jolly Well puts it, to amuse oneself and to debauch oneself becomes synonymous. We find direct proof of this in the fact that in Italy, moderate and maximum wealth both lead to the same results, just because there is so much resemblance between them. While in France, on the contrary, the maximum degree of wealth differs enormously from moderate means, and in consequence produces contrary results. In Italy, the increase of savings is an effect of economy rather than of positive wealth, while in France, at least, in the manufacturing districts, especially Herald and Bouches du Rhône, savings accounts are an indication of a wealth so great that it too often degenerates into an occasion of a wild speculation. Hence it is that we find all the advantages of wealth in one country, and all the disadvantages in the other. Moderate wealth slowly accumulated restraints from crime. In order, wealth is no longer a reign, but a spur and an incentive to crime. Subchapter 61. Agriculture and Manufacturing In fact, when manufacturing crowds agricultural hard, and still more, it displaces it entirely, we see the number of crimes increased immediately. Indeed, if we divide France, as in the study, sur la criminalité pendant 50 ans, above, into agricultural, mixed, and manufacturing districts, we see that crime nearly always increases as we pass from the first name to the last. Of 52 agricultural departments, only 11 or 26% go beyond the average number of assassinations in France, while the average is exceeded by 10 out of the 26 departments of mixed industry, or 38%, and by 7 out of 17 manufacturing departments, or 41%. Rapes upon adults and crimes against persons show us similar results. Percentage of departments exceeding the average of all France. In a table displayed on the page, comparing agricultural departments, 42, mixed, 26, manufacturing, 17, to rapes and crimes against persons. These figures are certainly to be explained by aggregations of population and the coming of immigrants. In the departments of Herald, writes Jolly, Fraud came in permanently with wealth. Never were there more attempts at bribery, 
whether the local officials or the highest representatives of the central administration. A case has been cited to me in which the entire municipal council fraudulently evaded the payment of their own taxes. This evil was the greater for going unpunished, the jury having brought in the acquittal. Was not this general demoralization produced or hastened and aggravated in any case by the crisis of wine growing which has permitted these people since 1874 to make enormous gains with the wines? As a matter of fact, it was in 1874 that Herald passed from the fifth place as regards criminality up to the 61st in 1884 and went up to the 81st. From that day, writes Julia again, when the peasants hither the poor could change their uncultivated land into vineyards and from the day when, thanks to the railroads, their products increased enormously in value before their eyes. From that day they became greedy. The man who has gambled and won in the stock exchange dreams only of stocks and bonds, and of corner in the market. Now all wealth gained without effort resembles a little money won by gambling, and has the same effect upon the mind. It is good fortune, says the Commissioner of Sith, that has ruined this country. When Bocage was poor, it was honest. Now those who steal have positions themselves, and the well-to-do peasants commit more crimes than the vagrants, surely. In the east, in the departments of Yer, and the west, in Calvados, manufacturing and agriculture are backward, and there is little criminality. In Ver, the inhabitants live by working the ground, and crime is almost unknown. Subchapter 62. Wealth as a Cause of Crime those consequently who affirm that criminality is always an effect of poverty have not considered the other side of the question and observe the case where crime is the effect of wealth. Rapidly acquired wealth which is not balanced by a higher character or by a lofty religious or political idealism is harmful rather than helpful. Spencer also has said of wealth that accommodating as the fundamental character of a people is good or bad, at least to virtual vice and especially as the latter the effect of excessive wealth which, like excessive power or excessive education, is a natural instrument of despotism, of all sorts of sexual and alcoholic abuses and a consequence of crime. Accordingly, wealth is now a check, now a spur to crime, just as we have seen is the case with education, civilization, and density of population, and as we shall see to be true of religion. Here is a criterion which must especially be kept in mind in the etiology of crime. For according to our character and stage development, the same cause now destroys and now saves us. Thus we shall see apparent contradictions disappear, even contrib towards a full explanation. Thus the United States, those states which have the highest criminality, have now the maximum, now the minimum of wealth, as shown by the debt obtained directly from individuals in taking the census. We see there that the richest states have a low criminality. Rhode Island, for example, $183 per capita, has a criminal figure of 0.11. Massachusetts, with nearly the same degree of wealth, $178, has nearly twice the criminality, 0.2. Almost the same as the District of Columbia, 0.21, which is a moderate degree of wealth, $112, and has also Wyoming, which, however, shows nearly twice the criminality, 0.35. Some poor states like Dakota, $30 per capita, Alabama, $19, and New Mexico, $19, give the lowest criminal statistics from 0 0.04 to 0 0.03. But here we counter a contradiction for Delaware, with a criminality figure of only 0 0.05 as a moderate amount of wealth, $82. We have seen above how in France and Italy criminality in general increases, only changing its character. We have seen that Atira furnishes a maximum of crime for Italy, and yet there is no one, according to Zagil, is really poor, all being small landholders, etc. This does not prevent the fact that when a state of barbarism prevails, as in Corsica, crimes against persons increase, as simple thefts do, in the years in the districts in which there is extreme poverty. Subchapter 63. Explanation The cause of all this is only too clear. On the one side, poverty and the lack of absolute necessities impel toward the theft of indispensable things for the satisfaction of the individual's own needs. This is the first cord binding poverty and assaults upon poverty. On the other hand, poverty makes men impulsive through the cortical irritation following the abuse of wine and alcohol, that terrible poison to which so many of the poor resort is still the pangs of hunger. Account must be taken also of the degeneration produced by scurvy, scrofula, anemia, 
and alcoholism in the parents, which often transforms itself into epilepsy and moral insanity. Poverty also drives men to commit brutal eliminations of individuals who are an unwelcome burden upon the family. According to parasites and infanticides committed by savages under similar circumstances, poverty is indirectly a cause of sexual crimes on account of the difficulty which the poor have obtaining satisfaction through prostitution on account of precocious promiscuity in factories and mines, and also because of the frequency of infantilism or feminism among the boys. On the other hand, when a slight temptation toward evil is presented to an individual in comfortable circumstances, he is rendered physically and morally stronger by sufficient nutrition and a sound and moral training, and is thus pressed by need, so that while he feels the impulsion to do evil, he can more easily resist it. But wealth, in its turn, is a source of degeneration from other causes, such as syphilis, exhaustion, etc. It drives men to crime through vanity, in order to surpass others, and from a fatal ambition to cut a figure in the world, which, as we have seen, is one of the greatest causes of crimes against property. Also, as Foreign Asari has very truly remarked, where wealth is absolutely the greatest, it is always accumulated in the hands of a few, so that, at the same time, there is always great poverty, or keenly felt because of the contrast. This phase of tendency towards crime on the one hand, and on the other, furnishes better opportunities for it. Besides, it should be noted that, where wealth is least, the crowding in of population is least, especially of dangerous individuals who gather in the richer districts to carry on their criminal practices more easily, as for example in France, at Sid. If it is true, on the other hand, that urgent need drives the poor to wrongdoing, it is only to a very limited number of crimes, although these are more violent ones, while the artificial wants of the rich, although less urgent, are more numerous, and the kinds of crime among them are infinitely more numerous also as well as a means of escaping punishment encouraged by the example of persons high in politics. This we see in Italy, ministers guilty of crimes against the public who remain in power in spite of the discovery of their crime, and even use it as a means of fortifying their position. It is only in France and England that the people refuse to be governed by criminals. As for sexual and alcoholic crimes, the first satisfaction made possible by wealth never sufficiently appeases the bless, but drives them on to seek new excitements such as rapes upon children, sodomy, the misuse of morphine, cocaine, etc. To great wealth then, instead of being a preventive, is often a spur to new crimes. There are many, says Jolly, who have nothing and want nothing, and many who have too much and are always ambitious to possess more. And besides, just as in the war, killing in mass, and at long range seems remote from the idea of homicide, so in great cities, to ruin at a distance by fall to bankruptcy, an enormous number of people does not seem really a crime, even to many timid people. The born criminal finds, on the whole, more opportunities for crime and wealth than in poverty, but the case is still worse with the occasional criminal. It is only necessary to study the physiognomy of Beihot, D.Z., Tenlango, etc., to be convinced that these were not congenital criminals, and without politics would never have become criminals. Subchapter 64. The Preponderance of Poor Criminals But why, someone may object, are those convinced almost always poor? We see, for example, in the Statistica Penale for 1889, that 100 Italians inducted, of whom it was possible to know the economic condition, were divided as follows in the years given. The tables are displayed on the page, with indignant, having only the necessities of life, fairly comfortable and well-to-do rich, Compared with the years of 1887, 1888, and 1889. These figures agree with those published by Gillaume, Stevens, and Marrow. It shows us an enormous disproportion of crimes among the poor. But before we let ourselves be led away by these figures, which appear to be flatly contrary to our conclusions as to the evil effect of wealth, it is necessary to remember that the conviction of rich men is very rare, and that when they violate the laws, as Marrow very truly says, they're not put into prison so easily as a poor. The rich man has in his favour the influence of his fortune, his family, his social relations, his intelligence. This is often enough to save him from prison, and always gives him able defenders. In the private asylums, which are used only by the rich, the morally insane are very numerous, though there are but few in the public asylums and the prisons, which means that wealth helps to clear up the pathology of the born criminal 
or poverty obscures it. Further, in the contest between classes, the courts are used as a means of dominating the poor, who are already, a priori, convicted as such. The upper classes are accustomed to say, poor is a thief, and alas, what is worse, to turn the proverb around. Ivers Collegiani says, some of the delinquencies of the poor remain concealed, whether because the moral sense is deficient among them, and for this reason no information is laid, as in the case of sexual crimes, or because the offences take place under such conditions that they are not discovered, as in the case of field thefts. Does it always happen that all the crimes of the rich come to light? Is there an army corps set aside to discover the crimes of the rich, as there is for the offences committed in the fields of forests? And have there not been cases of parliamentary and political immunity, flagrant or secret, a kind of right of asylum, enormously extended to take in all delinquents having political power, ministers, deputies, great electors, journalists? A great poet has told us that rags allow crime to be seen at once through their rents while gold conceals and defends it. To sum up, the economic factor has a great influence upon the crime. Not, however, that poverty is a principal cause of it, for excessive wealth or money too quickly acquired plays a large part as well, and poverty and wealth are frequently neutralised by the effect of race and climate. End of section 9《Of Crime, Its Causes and Remedies by Cecil Ambroso. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 10. Religion. Subchapter 65. The influence of religion also is complex, even more so than that of civilization or wealth. We have seen that there are criminals who are very religious, especially in the country, and in relatively uncivilized localities, and also criminals who are irreligious or even atheistic. We have seen that among churchgoers, criminals and honest men are almost equally numerous, and often the criminals are in the majority. Of 700 criminals examined by Ferry, one alone was an atheist. One was indifferent, and said him would were devout, and even found religion an excuse for their crime. One of these said, It is God who gives us the instinct to steal. Another, Crimes are not sins, for the priests alone commit them. And still another, I have sinned that is true, but the priests pardoned me at confession. The greater number were as careless of punishment in the hereafter as they were of human punishment. Thus the murderer, when Ferry asked him whether he did not fear the wrath of God, answered, But God has never punished me yet. But you will go to hell, O oh, I may go, and I may not. And a third, we shall see whether we shall be punished when we are dead. If we rely upon the somewhat limited statistics available in this matter, we shall find that there are fewer criminals where atheists abound, than where, under equal conditions, either Catholics or Protestants dominate. This fact may proceed from the greater degree of education, the more so as in Europe, atheists are especially numerous among the more highly educated. A certain amount of energy is necessary to separate oneself in religious feeling from the general and conventional modes of thought. The same power of inhibition which enables one to resist the imitative instinct makes it possible also to resist the impulse toward crime. Jolly, who nevertheless insists upon the ennobling influence of the external practices of religion, cites Normandy as an example of a district where the respect for ritual religion is very great, and yet at the same time, there is a high degree of criminality. This is expressed in a proverb which she quotes as being in use among the inhabitants of Lazier. Lazarian rosary in one hand and knife in the other. He further illustrates his point by the following occurrence, which happened in Adik. Two groups of men had fallen to a quarrel at the market, and they had already raised their great iron short sticks when Sally the Angelus sounded. The two hostile parties immediately lowered their clubs, uncovered, made the sign of the cross, and aside the Angelus. But the prayer finished, they seized their weapons again, and the fight began anew. Jolly observes that although in France the girls are more carefully instructed in religion than the boys, nevertheless, the number of female juvenile offenders has not diminished, and if on the whole there is a decrease in juvenile crime, this is among the boys. Reckless writes that there is a chapel at Trenier, where they go to invoke the Madonna of Hatred, to procure the death of some detested person, 
In speaking of Sicily, the advocate Locatelli says, It is impossible to conceive the corrupting influence which must have been exercised upon the poorer classes by these thousands of priests, possessed of wealth and influence, idle but endowed with the spirit and sensuality of all southern people. For them, seduction, adultery, and incest itself were pardonable sins. The murderer who revealed his crime and excused himself on the ground that he had been provoked or injured, or even merely that he was in great poverty, was not only absolved, but also released from the necessity of satisfying the secular court. Even where an innocent man had been arrested in his place, the witness who hid the truth from the judge in order to escape danger or to avoid compromising a neighbour was equally certain of reconciliation with God through the mediation of the confessor. The rich man who secluded his own wisdom with a truly Turkish jealousy was treated with consideration if he attempted the honour of a daughter of the people. From small transgressions, such as forgery, a man could purge his conscience by paying the church 32 francs and 18 centimes. It is only a few centuries since the great vicar's general of the richest cities granted permission to commit adultery for a whole year. In other cities, the right to commit fornication with impunity for a lifetime could be attained by the payment of a quarter cask of wine to the bishop's officer, who drew this privilege from the canon de delictissimis by the decretals of the Pope. One man even had the audacity to present to Pope Sixtus IV a petition for permission to commit this sin during the dog days. In our own time, there was a papal bull in force in Palermo until annulled in 1868, by which there was granted dispensation from the necessity of repaying unlawfully acquired money by whatever crime attained upon payment of certain sums to the church. Dupin de saint andre republished in 1879, Les Taxes de la Penitentiary Apostolique, in which crimes are taxed according to tariffs established by Pope John the Twelfth and Pope Leo the Tenth. Thus a layman who had killed a priest was absolved upon payment of seven gros, only five if he had killed another layman. If an ecclesiastic committed fornication with a nun, whether in or out of the monastery, or with one of his cousins or goddaughters, he was absolved only upon payment of sixty-seven francs, eleven sous. If the act was against nature, two hundred nineteen francs and fourteen sous, a nun who had committed fornication with a number of men, whether in or out of the convent, one hundred and thirty one francs fourteen sous. Adultery was absolved for eighty seven francs and three sous. A layman might be absolved for adultery, however, for only four francs, but for adultery and incest for ten francs, and a John twelfth incest with sisters or mother cost forty sous. Who does not know the maxims of the Jesuits of the last century? Lacroix, for example, says Although the natural law forbids lying and murder, under certain circumstances they are permitted. So Bosenbrom declares, an extremely poor man may take what he needs, may even kill any one who tries to prevent him from taking what is necessary. In the same way, Majorca authorised regicide, and Pierre Lugut says, a man does not sin against justice, and is not obliged to return the money that he has given him for killing or wounding. Opposite. However, one thing seems clear to me, namely, that the younger religions are, the greater is their moral power, because the latter has not yet encroached upon their spirit, because the enthusiasm for new ideas occupies the mind and draws it away from crime, and finally because, whatever be its origin, the organism is then more free from symbols and formulas that clog its activity. This fact has been observed with us with regard to Savonarola and the Vaudois, and may still be noticed among the Negroes in the United States, who, when they are converted to Methodism, renounce their idleness and practice of infanticide, so that in the districts where conversions abound, the population increases noticeably. And it is a curious phenomenon that even the new religious sects created by pure paranoiacs, like the Lazaretists in Italy and the Quakers in England, brought about an immediate diminution in crime. Even the Scopsi, who castrate one another as part of their religion, are renowned for their honesty. In northern Russia, the Bielorossites do not drink alcohol nor smoke. They wear white clothing women by their own hands and lead a virtuous life. The same is true of the Suzazetsi, who reject priests, images, and military service, and as a consequence often suffer martyrdom. The sons of God believe that each one is his own God, 
and that it is sufficient to address prayers to any neighbour. They unite in wild dances in honour of God, continuing until they fall exhausted to the floor, and, with all this, they are very honest. The Verginsky or Tostosins drink only tea, and allow themselves to be maltreated without resistance, saying nothing more than God help me, until their persecutor falls down in admiration at their feet. These new sects are veritable epidemics of virtue and saintliness. It is a strange fact that the South Russian sects, which are known for their sanguinary character, doubtless the effect of the hot climate, which, as we know, produces an inclination to homicide, nevertheless inspire high morality. Thus the Dukoboros kill all the children of normal and body or mind, out of respect for the divine spirit that ought to dwell in them. One of their chiefs, Kopstein, had his traitors to the dogmas of the sect buried alive, and in an action that was brought against him it was found that he had committed twenty-one religious homicides. All this appears to us more than criminal. Yet this sect is opposed to war and preaches that the Tsar reigns only over rogues and criminals, while honest men, the true Dokubos, have nothing to do with his laws or his authority. It is from this sect that the Molokani arose, drinkers of milk, enemies of priests, ornaments, and useful ceremonies. All educated and very honest, these people help one another, have no poor, and to whatever place they are deported, turn the most inhospitable locality into a garden. The Mormons of America also were famous for their industry and property. On the whole, the contradiction of the influence of religion, now great and totally lacking, disappears when one grasps the significance of the facts. Religion is useful when it is based absolutely upon morals and abandons all rights and formularies. This is a condition that can be realised only in the new religions, because while all in the beginning are moral, afterwards little by little they become crystallised, and ritual practices emerge the moral principle, which is thus easily conceived and retained by the crowd. All members of new sects are men of one idea, which protects them, like a vaccine, against ignoble passions. It is for similar reasons that certain Protestant cities which have a more or less ardent religious fervour, like Geneva and London, are the only ones where crime is decreasing. Notwithstanding the progress of civilization and the dense population, London alone having more people than an entire Italian province. Here it is not an ambition that comes into play, but a great religious passion which neutralizes ignoble instincts and combats vices and immoral tendencies with such vigor that it ends by conquering them. In England, religion recruits thousands of fanatics who, under the most diverse names and theories, work themselves into a fever of saving men's souls. They extend their activity over an immense field, organising services, preachings, processions, pious works, etc. In the Latin countries, on the other hand, where the Catholic Church extends its domination, religion can only rarely be a preservation from vice, and this not so much because of the irreligion or scepticism of the people, a smaller factor than is generally believed, even in the country of Voltaire, but because of the very organization of the church itself. The Catholic Church is a great disciplinary institution. It is almost an army, founded on obedience and subordination, in which each man has his place and prescribed course of action, laid down by immutable laws. Add to fanatical natures like Dr. Laranado, who are naturally independent and inclined to revolt, find themselves ill at ease in the church, except in missions, which is the only department that grants individual autonomy. On the other hand, they find themselves much at home in the Protestant sects, which are as free and autonomous as little clans or barbarous tribes, as is the case with the Baptists, for example, or the Salvation Army. Further, fanaticism finds in the Germanic nations, and especially in England, a great field for its development in philanthropy, something which is almost always lacking in Latin countries. London is a principal city of these fanatics of philanthropy. Here are men and women of all classes and social positions, rich and poor, educated or ignorant, sane or mad, who have taken it into their hands to cure the disease of society or to extirpate some special form of misfortune or sorrow. One has taken to heart the cruelties practiced upon children by their parents. Another is concerned for blind old men. A third is concerned for the insane maltreated in the asylums. A fourth is interested in the liberated convicts, and all work without ceasing. Publish journals, organise societies, make speeches, and sometimes succeed in bringing about great social epidemics and movements of popular opinion intense enough to result in some important humanitarian reform. 
This kind of activity may be an excellent substitute for political fanaticism, which results in dynamite outrages. But in the Latin countries, such agitations would come to nothing. The tradition of the administration of charity by the public authorities or by the church is so dearly rooted that no one wants to concern himself principally with social miseries. If children are often maltreated in the great cities and the papers protest vigorously and stir up public opinion a little, public opinion will simply demand the enactment of a law by the state and then risk content, though the law will never be enforced. No one would think of founding private societies, such as they have in England, which watch cruel parents and at all times come and snatch their little victims out of their hands. This is natural. In the religions which have survived for many centuries, the moral element disappears, because it conforms less to the sentiment of the masses, while only the ceremonial remains and superabounds. Of 73 principal articles in the Order of St. Benedict, only 9 pertain to mortals. In the Order of St. Columbus, one year of penance is decreed for anyone who loses a piece of the host, sacred bread, and six months for one who has two pieces be eaten at once. The only religions, then, which can prevent crime are those that are fanatical, passionately moral, or just arising. The others are no more effective than atheism, and perhaps less so. End of section 10 Section 11 of Crime, Its Causes and Remedies by Caesar Lombroso. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 11. Education, Illegitimate Children, Orphans. Subchapter 66. Illegitimate Children. The influence of education upon crime is shown indirectly by the continually increasing proportion of criminals of illegitimate birth in the most civilized countries. In Prussia, the illegitimate delinquents, who constitute 3% of the whole in 1859, rose by 1873 to 6%, and the women from 5% to 8%. In France, of the 800 minors arrested in 1864, 60% were orphaned or illegitimate, and 30 percent were the sons of prostitutes or delinquents. In Austria in 1873, 10% of all the male criminals were illegitimate, and 21% of all the female. In Hamburg, 30% of the prostitutes were illegitimate, Hugel, and in Paris, a fifth of the Parisian-born prostitutes and an eighth of the country women. In the prisons of Württemberg in 1884-85, 14.3% of the inmates were illegitimate, in 1885 to 86, 16.7%. In 1886 to 87, 15.3%. While the illegitimate individuals in the non criminal population rose to 8.76%, Sickert found among 3,181 whom he examined in these same prisons, 27% of illegitimate criminals, or nearly double the other figures. These were divided as follows. The table displayed on the page, listing percentage of illegitimacy. Thieves, 32.4%. Pickpockets, 32.1%. Sexual criminals, 21%. Perjurers, 13%. Incendiaries, 12.9%. Of the habitual criminals, he found 30.6% illegitimate and 70.5% a little more than half as many. Of the accidental criminals, he found also the following. Of 1,248 legitimate thieves, there were 52% aversion of work, 32% beggars, 42% vagrants. Of 600 illegitimate thieves, there were 52.3% averse to work, 39% beggars, 49% vagrants. In Italy, the statistics of the prisons show 3% to 5% among the male minors, and 7% to 9% among the females. We may add that 36% of the recidivists in Italy are either natural children or foundlings. To comprehend the greater importance of these figures, it is necessary to recall that a greater proportion of all illegitimate children, at least 60%, and often 80%, die in the first 18 months or two years. Marbell can then say without exaggeration that of four foundlings, three die before they are 12 years old, and the fourth is doomed to a life of crime. To get at the significance of these figures more exactly, I have made researches with regard to 3,787 entries, nearly all adults, 
in the asylums of Imola, Dr. Lully, of Padua, Professor Tabaldi, and of Pavia, and also with regard to 1,059 entries in the City Hospital of Pavia in 1871. And I found that there were 1.5% of foundlings in the asylums and 2.7% in the City Hospital. And nevertheless, the mortality is less among the illegitimate in Pavia than in many other places. Age and conditions being equal, families furnish 20 times more delinquents than insane persons. We may affirm then, with the greatest certainty, that the greater part of the foundlings that escape death abandon themselves to crime. Doubtless hereditary enters largely into this result. Most of these children are the fruit of sin. They have no name to uphold, no rain to stop them when spurred by passion, no mother who, by her insidious care, affection, and sacrifices, aids in developing noble instincts and suppressing tendencies to evil. They find an honest, living heart to get, and are inevitably drawn toward evil. If they have no perverse tendencies, they acquire them by imitation. On the other hand, philanthropic institutions like orphan and foundling asylums have also an evil influence. For, as we have seen, a multiplicity of contacts always fosters criminality. Subchapter 67. Orphans. That abandonment and the lack of education play a great part in producing criminality is demonstrated by the great number of orphans and stepchildren found in the prisons. In Italy, among the juvenile delinquents, in 1871 and 72, there were from 8% to 13% of stepchildren. Brace tells that in New York, 1,542 orphans and 504 stepchildren were arrested for various offences. He has that 55% of the criminals in the penitentiaries were without father and mother, and 60% of the children arrested had lost one parent, or their parents were separated. According to Marbell, of 100 juvenile prisoners, 15 have been abandoned by their mothers. In Italy, during 10 years, we have an average of 33% to 35% of orphans among the delinquents. Out of 580 insane asylums in my clinic, orphans furnish 47%, and the number of orphans reached 78% among the 1,059 entering the hospital of Pavia. But it is certainly a still more important fact that we find an average of 18% to 20% of orphans among the juvenile criminals, for the proportion of orphans in the general population is lower than this. The same is true of half-orphans, who furnish 18% of the general juvenile population, by 23% to 30% of the juvenile delinquents. The Italian statistics show 26% of the delinquents to be fatherless and 23% to be motherless. While among the insane, 51% have lost their fathers and 10% their mothers. It is certain, on the other hand, that the female sex predominates among orphans who are criminals. Even more so in the case of families. This is true even leaning out of account prostitution, which is a sort of minor criminality. So what's in general arrives at the strange result? While for each five male delinquents, there is one female. In the case of foundlings, there are three females to one male. This is, however, quite natural. For a woman, being weaker and more passionate than a man, has more need of the support and restraint of the family to keep her in the right way, for which she is more easily turned. Than a man, on account of the slippery path of prostitution, that is always open to her. Here the hereditary influences are very powerful, and women who have sprung from a sexual transgression are easily led into the same error, and from this to graver offences. The great number of families among delinquents explains also the predominance of Judo delinquents in the urban population, Cardon, and gives us the measure of the harm done by defective education and by abandonment. Subchapter 68. Vicious Parentage, Education. It is entirely natural that evil education should have a still more deplorably criminal element than even abandonment. We may recall here the large proportion of criminals who were sprung from unsound parents. Sigurd finds the proportion of pathological inheritance to be 36%, while Marrow makes it 90%. 6.7% had epileptic parents, 4.3% are descended from suicides, 6.7% from insane persons, while in the case of those guilty of grave crimes, Pender finds an alcoholic hereditary of 37% and marrow of 41%. How can an unfortunate child protect himself from evil when it is presented to him in the most attractive colours, or worse still, when it is imposed upon him by the authority and example of his parents, or those who were charged with his education? 
we shall comprehend the situation best from actual examples. Fee, a sister of thieves, was brought up by her parents as a boy. Clothed as a boy, she took on a masculine air and wielded her knife vigorously. One day, while on a journey, she stole a cloak and, being arrested, accused her parents of the theft. The Cornu family was composed of thieves and murderers, habituated to crimes from their tenderest infancy. Of five brothers and sisters, only one, the youngest, had shown a strong aversion to crime. Her parents found a means of overcoming her repugnance, making her carry the head of one of their victims in her apron for two leagues. In a little while, she was so stripped of all remorse that she became the fiercest of the band and wanted to practice the most horrible cruelties upon their victims. The murderer, Croco, who, at the age of three, used to hit his comrades with stones and pluck birds alive, had often been left by his father entirely alone in the forest as late as the nineteenth year. Fregier tells of the son of a thief, who was his father's pride because he was able, at the age of three, to take an impression of a key in wax. The wives of assassins, according to Vidoc, are more dangerous than their husbands, for they accustom their children to crime and give them a present for every murder they commit. We have seen, and shall see more clearly in the next chapter, how numerous the criminals are who have immoral parents or families, in which case vicious education and vicious hereditary work together. Here also is a case of abandonment, and for the same reasons, namely prostitution and greater persistency of the women in crime. The number of women subject to these influences is greater than the number of men. To many readers, the influence of education, as shown by these figures, will appear of little importance. But aside from the fact that we must add the figures for families already cited, we must also recall the fact that many crimes have an autoctuous origin, and that many individuals are born perverse and remain perverse, notwithstanding the desperate efforts of their parents to correct them. Among the juvenile delinquents of the year 1871-72, to 84% of the boys and 60% of the girls belong to moral families. This is to be explained by weakness shown by the parents early in the child's training which later renders unavailing the most strenuous efforts to obtain obedience. Noel Vidoc, Donon, de Marcelli, Le Canier, Abado, Hesso, Frati Valo, Cartouche, Trocerillo, Tropin, Azalone, and Dem all belong to one of his families. Rosati told me that after his first thefts, he had many times been beaten by his father and seen his mother weeping bitter tears over him and he had promised them each time to restore the things stolen. Naturally, they are keeping this promise. On the other hand, it has often been observed, and the investigations of parents du Chatelet and Mayhew confirm the observation that thieves and prostitutes who have become rich do their best to bring up their children to lead virtuous lives. End of section 11「Section 12 of Crime, Its Causes and Remedies » by Cecil Ambrosio. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 12 Heredity Subchapter 69 Statistics of Hereditary Influence Among 104 criminals whose heredity I have examined, I have found the following facts. 71 showed some hereditary influence. 20 had alcoholic fathers. 11 alcoholic mothers. 8 criminal fathers. 2 criminal mothers. 5 fathers who were insane or had meningitis. 5 insane or epileptic mothers. 3 mothers who were prostitutes. 6 insane brothers and sisters. 14 criminal brothers and sisters. 4 epileptic brothers and sisters. 2. Brothers and sisters who were suicides. 10. Sisters who were prostitutes. Dr. Virgilio, who pursued his investigations under more favourable conditions, found crime among the parents of criminals in 26.8% of the cases, almost always, as with alcoholism, present in the hereditary of 21.77% of the cases on the father's side. Aside from this, with 6% of the criminals' crime appeared in collateral lines. Penta also found among 184 born criminals at San Stefano the following. Advanced age of parents, in 20 cases or 16%. Drunkenness, 
in 50 cases or 27%. For thesis, in 17 cases or 9.2%. Cerebral epilepsy of parents, in 20 cases or 11%. Pellegra, in 3 cases or 1.6%. Insanity, in 12 cases or 6.5%. Insanity in ancestors or collateral lines in 27 cases or 14.5%. Hysteria, 25 cases or 13.5%. Epilepsy, 17 cases or 9.2%. Headache, 17 cases or 9.2%. In 4% to 5%, only were the parents perfectly sound. Later he has given us a new table of statistics of morbid hereditary, embracing 447 cases arranged in two series. A table displayed on the page where the first series are 232 cases and second series 215 cases compared to criminality of parents, hysteria, epilepsy, other nerve diseases, alcoholism, insanity, pulmonary tuberculosis, advanced stage of parents, cerebral epilepsy, predisposition to grave disease, chronic malaria. Marrow investigated the causes of death of 230 parents of criminals and of 100 parents of honest men, and found the following. A table displayed on the page with alcoholism, suicide, insanity, cerebrospinal disease, heart disease, dropsy, physesis, nervous shock, worry, etc. Compared to, in the case of the father and the mother, which is split between criminal and honest. Even in place of examining each group separately, we add together the deaths caused by alcoholism, suicide, insanity, and cerebral diseases. You find that among the 230 parents of criminals, these causes constitute 32.1%. While in the case of the parents of normal persons, they are only 16.1%, almost exactly half. The number who have delinquent brothers is especially great. Out of 500 criminals, Mara found 68 who had one or more delinquent brothers and the following parentage. Insane, 17. Epileptic, 4. Delinquent, 6. Alcoholic, 34. In four cases, mother as well as father. Already old, 33. In four cases, both parents were old. In studying the still living parents of 500 criminals, Mara found in 40% of the cases, alcoholism of the father and 5% alcoholism of the mother, while with 500 normal persons, there was alcoholism in only 16% of the cases on the father's side. Insanity of progenitors or in collateral line occurred in 42.6% of the criminal, 16% of the normal cases. Epilepsy in 5.3%, 2% of the normal cases. And a moral and violent character, 33%. In looking into the question of parents who were insane, epileptic, alcoholic, epileptic, hysterical and delinquent, including also cases where there were anomalies of age and character, he found a morbid hereditary in the case of from 77% to 90% of the prisoners. Opposite. Sigurd studied 3,881 subjects imprisoned in Württemberg for theft, rape and fraud. In comparison with the general population, he found that anomalies of crime in the case of parents are the various classes in the following proportions. Thieves, 32%. Incendiaries, 36.8%. Sexual offenders, 38.7%. Bergerers, 20.5%. Swindlers, 23.6%. With the higher numbers then, in the case of these and incendiaries, taking account simply of alcoholism, epilepsy, and suicide in the direct line, he found a morbid hereditary in 71% of the incendiaries, in 55% of the thieves, in 43% of the ravishers, and in 37% of the swindlers. With regard to suicide of the parents, Sir Carter Marrow found... A table displayed on the page, comparing the suicide appearance of thieves, incendiaries, sexual offenders, perjurers, swindlers, and homicides, paired with data found by Sickarts and Merrill. Total, 4.3%. Comparing the proportion of vicious parents of the 3,000 criminals given by Sickart with those reported by Merrill, we find them so divided. Tables displayed on the page with thieves, incendiaries, swindlers, sexual offenders, perjurers, and libelers. Compared to Fisher's parents, split between Sickarts and Marrow. We have here very high figures for thieves, not so high for swindlers, and lowest for incendiaries and perjurers. Of 3,580 juvenile criminals of Mitre, 707 were children of convicts, and 308 were parents living in concubinage. Of the inmates of 
the Elmira Reformatory. There were 13.7% whose parents were insane or epileptic. 30% whose parents were drunkards. Thompson, out of 109 convicts, found 50 who were related to one another, three of them being members of one family and descended from a recidivist. He noted also two sisters and three brothers, all thieves, whose father, uncles, aunts, and cousins were murderers. In one family of 15 members, of whom 14 were counterfeiters, the 15th appeared honest, till one day he set fire to his house, after having insured it four times over. The influence of hereditary may be observed among the female offenders and prostitutes studied by Madame Tolwonski, Marrow, etc., and by Parent du Chatelet. Of 5,580 prostitutes, Parent du Chatelet found 252 who were sisters, 13 mothers and daughters, 32 cousins, 4 aunts and nieces. One cannot read without a feeling of repugnance the speech that was made to La Cour by one of these unfortunates. My father is in prison, and my mother is living with a man who seduced me. She has had a child by him, whom I and my brother are bringing up. Subchapter 70. Clinical Proofs I have studied a child in the prison at Pavia, who had very exaggerated prognosticism, tough tear, feminine physiognomy, and strabismus. He had been guilty of murder at twelve years of age, and had been, besides, convicted of theft six times. Two of his brothers were thieves, two sisters prostitutes, and his mother was a receiver of stolen goods. Five brothers and a brother-in-law of the Fossey family were convicted for participation in a robbery. Their grandfather and their father had both been hanged. Two uncles and a nephew were in prison. A more noteworthy proof of hereditary influence is offered by Dr. Harris, who, noticing in a certain country in the Upper Hudson the great number of crimes committed by persons of the same name, consulted the registers and discovered that a great part of the inhabitants were descended from a certain Margaret, a woman of evil life, who had lived there two centuries before, among whose descendants there were two hundred delinquents and two hundred more who were either insane or vagrants. The table is displayed on the page, displaying father alcoholic, father insane, parents old, parents epileptic, parents tuberculosis, and parents delinquent. Compared with female criminals by Sal Soto, female criminals by Mano, prostitutes by Grimaldi, thieves, and prostitutes by Tarnowski. Despine has given us another proof in the genealogy of the Lemaitre and the Cretine families, which I have here arranged in tabular form that it may be taken in at a glance. The family tree is displayed on the page, starting with G. Cretine. The Faishi were also hereditary assassins. A family tree is displayed on the page, starting with great-grandfather Faishi. Strahan gives us yet another proof of hereditary criminality in the history of a family whose descendants numbered 834 individuals, of 709 whom it was possible to trace a history with sufficient accuracy. Among the 709, there were 106 illegitimate children, 164 prostitutes, 17 prosecutors, 142 beggars, 63 in hospitals for chronic diseases, and 76 criminals, who altogether spent 166 years in prison. The Wyatt family occupied a high place in society in past times, but at the beginning of the 19th century had fallen completely into decay and consisted only of the sons of two brothers, Lou and René. René had passed all his life in contact with criminals without having been convicted himself. He was an original, passionately fond of cockfights and addicted to liquorice. He had innumerable mistresses and children, so that all the children of the quarter called him Papa. One of his mistresses was the mother of a great number of criminals. The family of his brother presented nothing abnormal except that one of his sons, learning that his uncle René had disinherited him, killed himself the day after the latter's death, and left behind him this writing. Let no one be accused of my death. I have killed myself to escape from insupportable enemies whom my stupidity has gained for me, and because I have not been sufficiently on my guard against the rascality of certain people. The two mistresses of René, who gave him a progeny of degenerates, were Z, wife of an executioner, from whom was born a tuberculosis daughter that died at twenty-four, and F, who was also married, and accused by public opinion of having poisoned her husband. F had five children, of whom two were by her husband and three by her paramour. The children of her husband were, first, Z, who lived separately from her husband, was a matoid and quarrelsome. 
everything furnished her with an opportunity for a lawsuit, which, however, she regularly lost. She had many paramours, among others an orator of great talent by whom she had several children, including a celebrated poet, painter, etc. Second, F.L., proprietress of a house of ill fame. She had two children, of whom one was blind and the other had Parkinson's paralysis. Among the children whom F. had by her paramour, René, were the following. First, M., who, while watched by the body of her father, became drunk with her sister-in-law. She had a daughter of evil life. Also, a niece who was a prostitute at fifteen and a thief. Second, M., a peasant who tried to hang himself. He married F. L., a woman of dissolute morals, notorious for her incestuous relations with her older son and associating the theft with her daughter, who was a drunkard. She was strongly suspected of having killed her son-in-law, and her daughter called her the old woman loaded with crimes. From this sad marriage were born two children. First, Marie, who during a menstrual period killed her husband with the aid of her mother. They were both acquitted. Second, M, who had sexual intercourse with his mother and killed the husband of his mistress. In a collateral branch of the family, F. L., the daughter of F. There are many bankrupt merchants, mother who, notwithstanding her numerous children, eloped with her last lover, carrying off the money box. Husband who, after having gone off and squandered the family fortune, returned to live at his wife's expense. And a brother of Mary's second husband, who killed first his adulterous wife and then himself. In this family, nearly all the members have committed one or more crimes, and those who are not criminals are suicides. But there is a collateral branch, that of Z, which is composed of persons who occupy a high place in art. This family confirms, then, that close connection that exists between genius and crime. Laurent tells us a story of a whole family of criminals, who support wonderfully the data of Maro and Aubrey. In this family, the paternal grandfather died of an affection of the heart. It was a weak character and completely dominated by his wife. She, nervous and eccentric, struck her husband on all occasions, and was so irascible that she even took pleasure in striking her sister when she was sick. The father was very nervous and violent, but a coward, and though he had knowledge of the dissolute conduct of his wife, he had not courage to intervene. He died of aortic insufficiency. A paternal uncle, who was very vicious and violent, struck his parents to get money from them. He took advantage of their absence to sell a part of the furniture, and tried to kill his son on account of jealousy. A cousin German of the two preceding was addicted to pedestry. The maternal grandfather was intelligent, but a drunkard, and served two years in prison for theft. He was a captain under the commune, but was punished for a misconduct. He was unbalanced, brutal, and coarse. By his first marriage, he had four daughters, whose mental state we shall describe later. The maternal grandmother abandoned her children and dissipated the week's wages in company with her husband. She died of cancer of the uterus. The mother, very vicious, idle, and violent, married at the age of 20, and had two children by her marriage. At 23, she abandoned her husband to live with a young man by whom she had a son. She had returned to her husband, and by him had a fourth child. Yet during this time, she was the mistress of a wine merchant. To this paramour succeeded another, and at the age of 35, she brought into the world a fifth child, abandoning her family and children without concern. She spent her time playing cards and dives and quarrelling with druggers. She tried several times, while in a state of drunkenness, to kill her husband. At thirty-seven she had, by one of her lovers, a sixth infant, who died of meningitis. She became pregnant once more, and abandoned definitely the conjugal roof, taking her daughters with her, but giving them up to the first comer, to surrender herself to drink. At the age of thirty-nine she became pregnant once more, and had her paramour produced an abortion. This woman had three sisters. The first was vicious from infancy and abandoned herself to a life of prostitution at the age of sixteen. So irascible was she that in a fit of jealousy she tore off another woman's ear. The second sister, Dole, less of us, and given to drink, had three children, one of whom, at the age of nine, she threw out of the window for some trifling reason. At another time, without apparent cause, she threw it in front of the wheels of a carriage. It suffered from meningitis, but recovered. The third sister was weak-minded and dissipated, and used to get drunk in company with her husband. Let us pass on now to the examination of the third generation, which includes eight children. First, a young girl of nineteen years, very blonde, not very intelligent, very hairy, with a high arched palate, and frontal protuberances strongly developed. 
Malicious and jealous, she put pins in her brother's broth. When ten years old, she was found in a dive with some young men, giving herself up to a precocious debauch. Second, a young man of eighteen years, a workman, economical and honest but nervous and stubborn, and a weak character like his father. Third, an adulterous daughter of fifteen, vicious, a drinker, and a gourmand. She frequently the wine shops, was often drunk, and stole from the showcases of the grocers. Fourth, a daughter of fourteen, lazy, deceitful, thievish, irascible, egoistic, coquettish, and lascivious. Her figure is constantly contracted by a nervous twitching. Her physiognomy is one continual grimace. Having no family feeling, she takes advantage when her grandmother is asleep to pinch her legs in revenge for punishments that she herself has received. Fifth, an eight-year-old boy, rickety, scrofulous, very nervous, irascible, and despotic. He has paroxysms when he breaks anything that comes into his hands. Six, an adulterous daughter who died at sixteen of meningitis. The famous thief Sans Rifus was the daughter of a thief named Comedois, who died upon the wheel in 1788, and of a female thief named Limpave. Marianne, the most skilled member of the three-bit band, was a child of two thieves, her father being a recidivist five times over. She first threw light on the high road in a stolen cart. Sigil has studied all the proceedings instituted against the inhabitants of Artina since 1852, and has continually met the same name. Father, son, and nephew followed one another at intervals, as if impelled by a fatal law. In the last trial, there were two families concerned, who were already known in criminal annals. One was composed of seven members, the other of six, father, mother, and four sons, not one lacking. It is appropriate in this connection, says Sigil, to quote the words of a doc. There are families in which crime is transmitted from generation to generation, and which appear to exist only to prove the truth of the old proverb, like father, like son. Subchapter 71, Elective Affinities we see that this hereditary red is so active by the union of two criminal families, for which organised bands naturally arise, has its source in a kind of elective affinity in paying the delinquent woman to choose a lover or husband from among the most inclined to crime. We may recall the elective affinity which, in the Y family, drove René to choose his mistresses among the prostitutes and delinquents, as well as the marriage of the Coutin and Lavatrier families. We find another striking example of this affinity in the fatal sympathy of the Marquis de Brinvilliers for Saint Croix, and that of Louis Pouch and Marie Cattell, thieves, swindlers, and prostitutes for Rosignol. The former of these felt herself drawn to him when a rival told her in prison of his exploits. Marie Cattell, born of a noble family, was already ruined at the age of fourteen, and at fifteen she had committed highway robbery as Ragnos Kokobolis. In turn, there was a certain girl named Cambrusano, who became the mistress of a thief, while not yet nubile. When sent to a reformatory, she escaped, and the same day joined herself with an assassin named Tomo, whose accomplice she became, and the instigator of his most atrocious murders. Subchapter 72. Anaphysic Hereditary in the Duke Family. But the most striking proof of the hereditary of crime and of its relation to prostitution and mental disease is furnished us by the fine study which Doug Dale has made of the Duke family. The originator of this deplorable family was a certain hunter, fisher and libertine, called by Dungale Max Duke, who was born sometime between 1720 and 1740. He became blind in his old age. He had numerous descendants, 540 legitimate and 169 illegitimate. All the ramifications of his posterity cannot be traced down to the present, but we have the lines of descent from five daughters, three of whom were prostitutes before they married, as well as that of some collateral branches for seven generations. We give the tabular summary of the family. A table is displayed on the page, listing the generations of the dukes, compared with total numbers in generation, and the parentage by sex divided between total of each sex, legitimate and illegitimate. We see from this table the singular connection existing between prostitution, crime, and sickness. For from the same hereditary causes we find a family tree is displayed on the page, starting with Max, with one branch, 
26 delinquents and 142 vagrants and beggars, 64 in animals' houses. A second branch, 128 prostitutes, 18 brothel keepers, 91 illegitimate. And a third branch, 131 impotent, idiotic, or syphilic, 46 sterile. A number of the table is displayed on the page, querying marriage relations, pauperism, and crime. We see the delinquents scantily represented in the second generation, but multiplying with extraordinary rapidity, and rising from 29 in the fourth generation to 40 in the fifth, just as a number of prostitutes rise from 40 in the 35 and 76, and of beggars, which increases from 11, 56, and 74. They diminish in the sixth and seventh generations, only because nature herself makes an end of the matter through the sterility of the women, which affected nine individuals in the third generation and twenty-two in the fifth, and also by the early deaths of the children, which rose as high as three hundred in the last years. The members of this family pass altogether one hundred and sixteen years in prison, and receive poor relief for a total of eight hundred and thirty years. In the fifth generation, half the women were unchaste, and a correspondingly high number of the men criminals. Of the seventh generation, the oldest individual had reached the age of only seven years, yet six members of it were in almshouses. In seventy-five years, the maintenance of this family and the damage done by them cost the state one million three hundred thousand dollars. It has been shown that in all or nearly all the branches of this family, the tendency to crime, like the tendency to pauperism, was strongest with the eldest son, always following the male line in preference to the female. This tendency was accomplished by excesses of vitality, fecundity and vigour, and was more developed in the illegitimate lines than in the legitimate. A statement which is also true of the other forms of immorality, thus by comparing the 38 illegitimate members of the fifth generation with the 85 legitimate members, we get the following. Two family trees are displayed on the page. With the first, 38 illegitimate split between four drunkards, 11 beggars, idiots or prostitutes, 19 convicts, six of whom were convicted for serious crimes, and 85 legitimate, split between 5 convicts, 13 beggars of prostitutes. The figures here given for prostitution represent only a small part of the sexual immorality, as if proved by the large number of bastards, 21% of the males and 30% of the females, on syphilitics and harlots, of whom there are 60% in the second generation, three daughters out of the five, 37% of the third, 69% in the fourth, 48% in the fifth, and 38% in the sixth, an average of 52.4%. In addition, there were 42% of harlots among the women who married into the family. The data with regard to exaggerated fecundity and to prostitution tend to prove that sexual excesses are one of the most serious causes of pauperism, which, in its turn, appears to be hereditary in its character, especially with the women, and to gain recruits by preference among the young. Barbarism again is bound up with crime and disease, on account of the great number of individuals who became tainted with syphilis, or have bodily deformities, or inherit a tendency to crime or vagrancy. On the other hand, it is noted that in the families where the brothers are criminals, the sisters give themselves up to prostitution and are indicated only for sexual offences. Sir Dugdale says, page 26, Prostitution in the woman is the analogue of crime and pauperism in the man. It may be seen here how prostitution arises by hereditary, without being explainable by destitution or other causes, and is checked only by the intervention of an early marriage. The distribution of the bastards as is sex, 21% of the males, 13% of the females, shows a curious predominance of the male sex, or the opposite is true among the legitimate offspring. Among the firstborn also, where legitimate daughters predominate, and were illegitimate sons. The following table shows us the connection between crime and prostitution on one side, and disease and deformity on the other. A table is displayed on the page displaying diseases, malformities, and injuries. Although Dugdale found 200 thieves and other criminals, 280 beggars or invalids, 90 prostitutes or women afflicted with syphilis, or descend for one drunkard, to which should be added, as additional consequence, 300 children dying prematurely, 400 men infected with syphilis, and 7 assassinated. This is not a unique case. The savage Galetto Amarcelles was a nephew of Ortolano, ravisher and cannibal. Domillard was the son of a murderer. 
Patriot had assassins for grandfather and great-grandfather. Papa, Croco, and Cedavale had grandfathers who had been in prison. The Cavalante's father and grandfather both were convicts. The Cornu family were assassins from father's son, as were the Verdures, the Serfbeers, and Nathans. Of this last family, 14 members were incarcerated at one time in the same prison. Malk, a brazen adulteress who poisoned her husband, was the issue of an incest, and prostitutes are nearly always daughters of delinquents or drunkards. Mame de Pompadour was a daughter of a drunken thief who had been pardoned. Subchapter 73 Insanity of Parents as all these dismal genealogies prove to us, a certain number of the parents of criminals are afflicted with insanity. I have found in the case of 314 criminals whose descent was known to me, seven whose fathers were insane, two who had fathers that were epileptic, while in the case of four the mother, in two cases the father, in three a brother, in four an uncle, and in one a cousin, were afflicted with cretinism. Of 100 other criminals, five had insane mothers, three insane fathers, six insane brothers, and four had epileptic brothers. I had under my care in Pavia a family whose genealogy alternated between criminals and prostitutes, as seen by the following outline. A family tree is displayed on the page, titled F.E. R.I. Insane at 80 with hallucinations. Another family that I investigated was as follows. A family tree is displayed on the page, beginning with Alla. Wife epileptic. In the cases of 67 criminals, Moeli found in 61% insanity or epilepsy of parents, 15% suicide or criminality of parents, 21% insanity of brothers or sisters. Koch, leaving aside all doubtful cases, found that 46% of criminals were of morbid descent. Virgil studied 266 convicts, all, however, with chronic diseases. Ten of them been insane and thirteen epileptic. He found insanity of one parent, generally the father. Epilepsy was present with still greater frequency, being found in 14.1% of the cases. In six cases, the father was eccentric. In one, the mother. In one case, the father was a semi-imbecile. One ravisher had a deaf-mute father. Venter found insanity among the parents of 16% of the criminals investigated by him. At Elmira, New York. In 1890, 127 of the prisoners had insane or epileptic parents. Maru and Sukart found, a table split on the page, titled Insanity of Parents, listing incendiaries, sexual criminals, thieves, swindlers, perjurers, homicides, guilty of assault, compared with percentages found by Sukart and Maru. Gordon, who set fire to the house of his benefactor, had an insane grandfather. Mio, had his father and grandfather both insane. John D. Gordo, a parricide, had insane brothers. Martianti's sister was a cretin. Vizucaro, at once parricide and fratricide, and Palamirini, an assassin, both had insane brothers and uncles. Busi, insane father and mother. Alberti, an insane father and grandfather. Fela, an insane father. Gotau, had an insane father, uncles and cousins. Perusi, a forger and murderer, was born in an insane asylum, had an insane mother, who committed suicide, and a father with megalomania. Virgil, had a mother and sisters who were suicides. Godfroy, who killed his wife, mother, and sisters, after ensuring their lives in his favour, had an insane grandmother and uncles. Didier, a parricide, had an insane father, Louise Brings, who killed her husband, had an epileptic mother and an insane sister, and Serissa Abado and Coleman all had insane parents. In the connection we find the same thing true of the insane as of criminals. Golgi, Stewart, and Teagues have proved that insane men are more apt to have insanity on the paternal side than on the maternal, as is also the case with criminals. However, it is important for the purpose of medical jurisprudence to note that insanity of the parents is less frequent with criminals than with the insane. Among 3,115 insane persons, Teagues found that 28% had insane parents, 
while Stewart's figure is 49%, and that of Golgi 53%, if we take in also the hereditary influence of epilepsy and other nervous diseases. Golgi gives us a figure of 78%. Subchapter 74. Epilepsy of Parents Necht found epilepsy among the parents of 15% of the criminals examined by him. Rabaudo, investigating 559 military prisoners, found 10.1%. Penta found 9.2% among the parents of 184 born criminals. Clark showed that 46% of the parents of epileptic criminals had epilepsy, and only 21% of the parents of non-criminals epileptics. Dejerin, however, gives the figures as 74.6% and 34.6%. But, though higher, the ratio between criminal and non-criminal remains the same. Barrow and Seekart found the following percentages of epileptics among various classes of criminals. A table is displayed on the page, listing thieves, swindlers, incendiaries, sexual criminals, perjurers and homicides, compared to percentages presented by Seekart and Barrow. Subchapter 75 Alcoholic Heredity Penta found alcoholism in 33% of the parents of criminals, and I myself have met it in 20%. At El Mira, of 6,300 criminals under age, 38% had drunken parents. Lagrain found that 157 individuals belonging to 50 different families of alcoholics showed the following. Insane, 54%. Alcoholics, 62%. Epileptics, 61%. Having convulsions, 29%. Morally insane, 14%. Having meningitis, 6.5%. According to Bayer, the following percentages of the parents of criminals were drunken. In Saxony, 10.5%. Baden, 19.5%. Württemberg, 19.8%. Alsace, 22%. Prussia, 22.1%. Bavaria, 34.6%. Sikhards and Mara found the parents of criminals, alcoholic, in the following proportions. A table displayed on the page, listing thieves, swindlers, incendiaries, perjurers, and sexual criminals, compared with percentages presented by Sikhart and Mara. Mara found also 49% in the case of parents of homicides, and 50% of the parents of those guilty of assault. Thus, those guilty of crimes of blood showed the highest figures, followed closely by thieves. In Italy, alcoholism of the parents is much less frequently a cause of insanity than of crime, being found in the case of 70% of the insane, but in 22% of those imprisoned at Aversa for long terms. The Legrain observed that precocity is the first characteristic of alcoholic hereditary. He found children who were alcoholics even at four years. Another characteristic is the impossibility of withstanding the effects of alcohol. Thus a father had been a drinker for seven years of that having his brain affected, while his son was thrown into a delirium by a two days' orgy. Further, alcoholic heredity manifests itself by an imperious need of larger and larger doses of alcohol. All these characteristics are frequently met in criminals. Subchapter 76. Age of Parents Marrow, in investigating this subject, has come to the following conclusions. Among criminals against property, the children of young parents abound, except in the case of swindlers, among whom they are rare. Swindling demands, in fact, dissimulation and artfulness, rather than physical quickness and force, which are the gifts of youth, as the former qualities are the properties of a mature age. He found dissent from elderly parents very numerous, in the case of those committing crimes against persons, appearing in the case of 52.9% of the homicides, while the parentage for the general population is only 17. On the other hand, only 3% of this class of criminals were found to have youthful parents. Among those punished for assaults, old and also very young parents were much more numerous than in the general population. 40% and 13.5% respectively. This is easy to comprehend when we remember that callousness is as much a preparation for brawling and insurrection as excessive vivacity. Among ravishers, on the other hand, the proportion of elderly fathers falls to 30%, but there is also a higher number of elderly mothers than normal. Marrow, taking 21 
as the beginning of maturity for women and 30% as the beginning of decadence, arrives at the following table of percentages of criminal, normal and sane persons, according to the mother's age at their birth. A table is displayed on the page titled Age of Mother, listing murderers, guilty of assault, ravishers, highway robbers, burglars, pickpockets, house thieves, thieves, swindlers, general average of criminals, normal, insane, is compared with percentages of immature, mature, and decadent. The law observed for the fathers in the different classes of delinquents holds good for the mothers also. The percentage of elderly mothers as of elderly fathers is especially high with murderers and ravagers, though in the case of the latter, to a more limited extent for both parents. Both fathers and mothers are frequently young in the case of those guilty of assault and theft, and especially is this true of highway robbers. Marrow has stated the conduct in school of 917 pupils with reference to the age of their parents with the following results. A table is displayed on the page titled Conduct of Children in School, listing age of parents, as under 26 father, from 26 to 41 father, over 41 father, under 22 mother, from 22 to 37 mother, and over 37 mother. It is compared with percentages for good, medium, and bad. The maximum of bad and the minimum of good children are to be found where the father is young, but on account of the mildness and docility of character belonging to women, especially in youth, the greatest proportion of good children are to be found among those born of young mothers. With regard to pupils whose parents both belong to the same age period, the following results are reached. A table is displayed on the page titled Conduct of Pupils, listing age of parents, immature, mature and decadent, and percentages for good, medium and bad. Marrow found that fewer delinquents than all persons had parents belonging to the same age period, there being 63% of the former to 70% of the latter. In the case of pupils, the maximum of intelligence and minimum of good conduct were found where both parents were very young. The age of complete development of the parents gives the maximum of good conduct and the same proportion of intelligent children as when the mother is of full age. In the period of decadence of the two parents, both good conduct and intelligence are less often found than in the preceding period. Subchapter 77 Synthesis Of all nervous anomalies, the most typical as a sign of degeneracy, aside from creditism, is a neurosis of the criminal. This recalls the phenomenon that was so striking in the history of the Duke family, the excessive vigour and fecundity in the earlier generations, neutralised in latter generations by child mortality, and finally giving place to complete sterility, such as occurs in the case of freaks and two violent crosses. Pentecouts among the signs of degeneracy found in the born criminal, a great fecundity rendered futile through the speedy dying out of the offspring. Of 104 brothers of criminals whom he studied, 70 died at an early age. Of 100 parents of criminals, 53 showed an exaggerated fecundity and 23 a partial sterility. Of 46 criminals, 10 showed exaggerated and 31 restricted fecundity. In studying the figures of Marrow and Sycart, we find that epilepsy is more common with the parents of thieves, suicide with those of incendiaries, alcoholism with those of thieves and ravishers, and insanity with the parents of incendiaries. We have seen from the Duke family that males, especially the oldest, are more often affected by a criminal hereditary than females, and illegitimate than legitimate children, the relations being inverted in the case of pauperism, in which organic weakness plays a greater part. We have seen that in hereditary, for normal as well as for criminal men, the influence of the father exceeds that of the mother. Thus Marrow found the diseases given below to have their hereditary influence from the paternal or maternal side in the following ratios. The table is displayed on the page, listing alcoholism, insanity, disease of spinal cord, heart, and physicists, compared with the percentages from father and mother. Here the mothers lead only in the last. In the parents of homicides, vicious tendencies are found with 23% of the fathers and only 7% of the mothers. Of those guilty of assault, 20% of the fathers are of evil character, and 16% of the mothers. We may say the mother has a power of transmitting her emotional characteristics to her children more than her intellectual characteristics. These conclusions agree with the general laws of hereditary set forth by Orchansky. 
he shows that hereditary being a function of the organism of the parents. It corresponds at any given moment to the energy of their other functions and to their general physical condition. Each of the parents shows a tendency to transmit his own sex, and the one that prevails is the one nearest the period of maturity. Resemblance to the father prevails, but more in the case of boys and girls. The same principle holds true for structure, though the boys show more variability, the girls more stability. If one of the parents is diseased, there is a tendency, stronger in the case of the father, to transmit the disease to children of the same sex as the parent affected. This phenomenon shows itself especially in the case of neurotic parents, physical parents reversing the relationship. Transmission of disease, consequently, is progressive with the father, regressive with the mother. The pathological condition of the father tends to repair itself in the children. Morbid hereditary depends, then, upon two factors, the sex of the parent and the intensity of the morbid condition. Males inherit diseases from both parents and in greater intensity, having a tendency to transform functional disorders into organic ones, while females show the opposite tendency. To sum up, the organic type is constantly being fixed by heredity. The children themselves have a large part in the manifestation of hereditary by the fact that they can assimilate more or less actively the hereditary characteristics. Hereditary influences are not all manifested at any given moment, or once for all. They are latent in the organism and manifest themselves gradually throughout the whole period of development. Everything organic is subject to the general laws of heredity. The characteristics inherited in any part of the organism follow the general course of the development of that organ and reaches the highest point at the period of the organ's greatest development. The antagonism between the influence of the father, which favours variability and individuality, and that of the mother, which tends to preserve the type, has already been observed in the determination of the sex of the offspring. The same contest goes on in the matter of transmitting disease, which the mother diminishes by transmitting her own diseases to a milder form and combating the morbid tendencies of the father. There is the same difference between the parts of the male and female children play in inheriting as there is in that which the father and mother play in transmitting hereditary characteristics. End of section 12section 13 of crime as causes and remedies by caesar lombroso this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recorded by leon harvey chapter 13 age precocity subchapter 78 age precocity one of the few striking differences between crime and insanity is found in the part played by age. A glance at the following tabular comparison between nearly equal numbers of insane, delinquent and normal persons shows that criminals are most numerous at ages between 20 and 30, at which age is the number of normal persons and of insane is much lower, while the latter are almost numerous between 30 and 40. A table is displayed on the page comparing the age two percentages of Italians, normal, insane and criminals, and English and Austrians. It will be noted that from the age of 40 on, the percentage of the insane is twice that of normal individuals and criminals, while these latter, after the age of 50, are less than half as numerous relatively as normal persons of that age. A more detailed analysis shows that the maximum of criminality is found at ages ranging from 15 to 25 years. In England, the proportion of juvenile crimes declining, and the percentage of criminals under 21 will be seen to be less than the percentage of the normal population falling within this age group. While from 22 to 30, the criminal percentage is double the normal. In Austria, one-sixth of the convicts are between 14 and 20 years of age, and four-sixths between 21 and 40. Of 1,477 criminals condemned to death in France, 107 were between 16 and 30. 534 between 30 and 40, 180 were between 40 and 60, 69 were 60 and over. Of 46 criminals studied by me, 35 had commenced their criminal career in the following ages, 1 at 4 years, 2 at 7 years, 6 at 8 years, 1 at 9 years, 5 at 10 years, 4 at 11 years, 3 at 12 years, 3 at 13 years, 3 at 14 years, and 7 at 15 years. 
Twelve others confessed that they had run away from home to escape either punishment or work. Ten percent of the inmates of the reform school at Turin admitted freely that they had learned to steal before twelve, not from necessity, but led by the encouragement and instruction of their companions. In the hundred criminals investigated by Rossi and myself, we found thirty-five who had begun to drink between the ages of two and ten, and of these, twenty-five drank only brandy. Six had become addicted to the practice of masturbation before the age of six, and thirteen had had sexual intercourse before the age of fourteen, all of which shows great precocity and vice. The table is displayed on the previous page, comparing the list of ages to percentages in England of criminals and general population. Marrow found that of his 462 criminals, 18% had become delinquents before the age of 13. Manzoni has very well hit off the principal source of this early leaning toward crime, namely, the mania to pass as full-grown. In his famous novel, he says, Gervais, on account of having had a hand in something that savoured of crime, thought he had become a man like the others. Marrow, in his studies of the conduct of pupils in the schools, found that there were two periods especially marked by bad conduct, the first between 11 and 13 years of age, and the second between 16 and 17. Precocity in crime points to the fact that criminality, much more than insanity, is an inherited characteristic. This reminds us that precocity is one of the distinguishing features of savage peoples. A new proof of the atavistic origin of crime. In this connection, certain customs of the nature peoples are interesting. Thus, young men in certain African tribes, upon attaining their majority, strip themselves and withdraw to the woods where they remain until they have killed someone. We may also certainly ascribe to activistic influence an institution like that of the Scuano in Naples, which for the 15-year-old boys means to play the tyrant, to carry clubs or revolvers, to have love affairs, and to put parents and policemen in their proper places. It is thus a sort of juvenile camorra, in which the highest honour belongs to him who has wounded or killed someone. Another proof of the influence is found in the Sicilian word omota, which means either manliness or brigandage. Subchapter 79. Supposed scale of crime. In one case I have found a true graduation in the character of the thefts of a young criminal, who began as a boy by stealing four sous to buy a top. He then stole eight sous, then one franc and finally three francs. But in general, the ascending scale of crime is imaginary. For many enter the criminal courts by the great door of homicide and rape, while the most atrocious crimes are often the most precocious. There was found one day in Milan an old man riddled with eighty-two wounds, who was believed at first to have been the victim of an atrocious act of revenge. It was discovered that his murderers were five youths of from fifteen to nineteen years, who committed this horrible crime for the purpose of getting money for a visit to a brothel, that all he wanted was to have a part in stabbing the victim. All great criminals have given proof of perversity in their youth, especially the age of puberty, and sometimes even before. This is true of Bonsegini, at 18 years of age, of Boulot at 17, and of the Marquis de Brinvilliers at 18. At seven and a half, Dombey was already a thief, and added sacrilege to his theft at 12. At three, Crotto tore out the feathers of living birds. Lesang cut out the tongues of cattle at eleven. At the same age, Cartouche stole from his schoolmates, while Mme. Lafrange, as a child of ten, strangled fowls. Fiorabac tells of a parricide who was taken great delight as a child in making hens jump about after he had put out their eyes. The tendency to theft, says Locatelli, shows itself in extreme youth beginning with little pilferings at home and increasing gradually. Murderers, on the contrary, become such all at once, frequently at a tender age. It's for this reason that children below the age of puberty who have already committed homicide are less rare than second-story thieves at the same age. In the prisons of Paris, there are no less than 2,000 youths from 16 to 21 years of age, 993 of whom are incarcerated for murder or theft, and the assassinations committed by these young criminals are marked by the most horrible ferocity. Melotte and Gil killed their benefactress with the aid of their comrades, and bit off her fingers to get her rings. The youngest of this band was fifteen, and the oldest eighteen. Each of the Parisian bands of young assassins included a girl who had scarcely reached nobility. Pepino, Baquinis, Quaternary, 
Virginie Moreau and Prevost, began with assassination. Prevost later was an irreproachable agent of police for 21 years. Martin killed his own wife, having previously been perfectly reputable. Charles IX was cruel from childhood. Subchapter 80. Criminality at different periods of life. Each period of life has its own form of criminality, as Quillet, Goody, and Messer Daglia have very well shown. Youth and old age are found in Austria to furnish the greatest number of sexual crimes, 33%. Goody also finds the two highest points for these crimes to be between 16 and 25, and between 65 and 70 years. In England, the greatest number of crimes contrary to nature are committed by persons between 50 and 60, but doubtless what is taken for a crime at this age may often be the result of creeping paralysis and senile dementia. Another tendency which is observed in youth is that towards arson, 30.8%, in Austria, and in this case, also, it is to be noted that mania before the age of puberty is apt to take the form of pyromania. A similar observation may be made with regard to theft, but Quetel observes that if the tendency towards theft is one of the first to show itself, it also makes itself felt throughout the whole life, and is common to every age period. In the period of manhood, the predominant crimes are murders, homicides, infanticides, abortions and rape, and counting Austria to about 80%. At a ripe age, there is an increasing number of libels, frauds, breaches of trust, crimes contrary to nature, instances of blackmail, and of aid given to criminals. In old age, there are to be observed crimes contrary to nature, aid to criminals, breach of trust, swindling, and what furnishes a new analogy with the crimes of youth, arson. We may get a more exact notion of the distribution of crime according to age with the following table, in which is given the number of persons out of 1,000, of the same age who were indicted in France between 1826 and 1840. A table is displayed on the page comparing age, theft, rape, assault, murder, homicide, poisoning, fraud, label, and total. End of section 13. Section 14 of Crime, Its Causes and Remedies by Caesar Lombroso. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 14. Sex, Prostitution. Subchapter 81. Sex. All statistics show that women are much less criminal than men, and this will be even more striking if we regard those guilty of infanticide as outside of the regular criminal class. In Austria, female criminals do not reach 14% of the total. In Spain, they are under 11%, while in Italy, they are only 8.2%. Bringing together the different data, we get the following table, showing the part played by women in crime in different countries of Europe. A table is displayed on the page, listing Italy, 1885-89, Great Britain, 1858-64, Denmark and Norway, Holland, Belgium, France, Austria, Baden, Prussia, Russia, Buenos Aires, 1892, Algeria, 1876-80, Victoria, 1890, New South Wales. A compared to percentages of men, women, and the number of men to one woman. Bringing together the figures of all classes of delinquents convicted in Italy during the years 1885-89, we get the following yearly averages. For the men, 186,825. For the women, 54,837. If, however, we take account of the fact that the causes passed upon by the justices of the peace are the least serious, those which come before the Aziz are the most serious, and those which come before the tribunals are of a degree between the two, we shall see that the female offenders are distinguished in an inverse ratio to the gravity of the crime. Thus, for each 100 men, the following number of women were convicted in the three classes of courts. Justice courts, 21.8 women. Tribunals, 9.2 women. Assises, 6.0 women. Almost all the statistics show that women take up a life of crime later than men. Ottingen places the climax of female criminality between the 25th and 30th years, while Quillet calls it about the 30th year. With men, the maximum of criminality is reached at 24. 
In Italy, in the years from 1885 to 1889, for each 100 crimes committed by male delinquents of the various age periods, the following were committed by female delinquents. A table is displayed on the page, listing under 14, 14 to 21, 21 to 50, and over 50, compared to justices of the peace, tribunals, and assizes. We see accordingly that for all classes of crimes, female criminality reaches its highest point as compared with that of men at the most advanced age. That is to say, when the special characteristics of sex have been affected by age, and when prostitution no longer offers a career, the second highest period of female criminality is to be found in the age below 14, when the sex characteristics are not yet fully developed. This is not true, however, of the gravest offences. For among the girls below 14, there was not one convicted at the Aziz, while the boys of that age, there were 4,650 convicted out of 10 million. In Germany, 3.8% of the female offenders and 2.6% of the male were over 60 years old. For every 100 criminal men over 60, there were 25.4 criminal women of the same age, while between the ages of 21 and 40, there were only 19.6 criminal women to 100 men. During the years 1876 to 80, among the juvenile delinquents, there were 16.3 girls under 16 to 100 boys, and 17.7 .7 girls under 21 to 100 boys of like age. Female delinquency has, then, one of its high points during youth, a fact to be explained by prostitution among girls not yet of age. According to Parentu Chatelet, 15% of the French prostitutes were over 17 and under 21 years of age, while according to Gurdy, 24% of the London prostitutes were under 20. Subchapter 82. Specific Criminality Women as criminals are naturally active in other spheres than those which men occupy. In Austria, women are most often guilty of abortion, bigamy, libel, participation in crimes, arson and theft. They are more rarely guilty of homicide and forgery. A table is displayed on the previous page, titled in Italy, in the years 1871-72, to 72, juvenile criminals of the two sexes were divided into age groups as follows. Under 10, 11 to 14, 15 to 18, and over 18, compared to of 100 girls and of 100 boys. A table is also displayed, titled, In Austria, out of 100 criminals of either sex, there were age compared to women and men. In France, their principal crimes are infanticide, abortion, poisoning, parasite, maltreating of children, domestic thefts and arson. In England, they are beginning to be more often guilty of passing counterfeit money, burglary, and libel, and homicide also is slowly increasing there. In studying the situation in Italy, Rin Coroni, opposite, arrived at the following results. A table is displayed on the page listing crimes, as eases, crimes against the state, forgery and commercial crimes, vagrancy, etc., Sexual crimes, abortion, infanticide, homicide, murder, poisoning, assault, highway robbery, theft, fraud, receipt of stolen goods, arson. These are compared to the average of three years with men and women to 100,000 between men and women and women to 100 men. We saw above that on average six women are condemned to the assizes for each 100 men. The figures are higher for the following crimes. Receiving stolen goods, 20.2 women to 100 men, poisoning 122.7 women to 100 men, abortion and infanticide 476.8 women to 100 men, arson 8.6 women to 100 men. These four crimes then seem to have a closer connection with the feminine nature. That women less often are engaged in highway robbery, murder, homicide and assault is due to the very nature of the feminine constitution. To conceive an assassination, to make ready for it, to put it into execution, demands, in a great number of cases at least, not only physical force, but a certain energy and a certain combination of intellectual functions. In this sort of development, women almost always fall short of men. It seems, on the other hand, that the crimes that are habitual to them are those which require a small degree of physical and intellectual force, and such especially are received as stolen goods, poisoning, abortion, and infanticide. I specify intellectual force and not education, for it is well known that poisoners are often well-educated persons. Quillet has already remarked that these differences proceed not so much from slighter perversity of character as from a more retired way of life, which gives less opportunity for such crimes as highway robbery, 
and form a smaller degree of strength and intelligence, on account of which women commit fewer murders and crimes requiring the use of the newspapers. But in domestic crimes they equal, and sometimes even exceed, the men. In poisoning they reach 91%, and in house theft 60%, to say nothing of abortion and infanticide. If we add that the great number of sexual offences committed by men are not only equaled but surpassed, at least in the eyes of the psychologist, by prostitution on the part of the women, and that in the more civilised countries and periods, the criminality of women continually increases until it approaches that of men. We find that the analogy between the two is greater than would have been believed possible at first sight. Subchapter 83. Prostitution. The comparative infrequency of the rest of women for vagrancy is due in part to the fact that women are less given to drink, in part to the fact that they are less employed in trade, and finally to the fact that in youth prostitution completely takes the place of crime. With this unhappy profession, idleness and vacant bondage are inseparably bound up. If cases of prostitution are included in the criminal statistics, the two sexes are at once placed on an equality, or the preponderance may even be thrown on the side of women. According to Ryan and Talbot, there is one prostitute to each seven women in London, and in Hamburg, one to each nine. In Italy, in the great centres, they form 18% to 33% of the female population of like age. In some countries, the proportion is doubled, and some increased even tenfold. In Berlin, the number of prostitutes increased from 600 in 1845 to 9,653 in 1893. In 1876, Ducamp placed the number of secret prostitutes in Paris at 20,000. We have seen, and shall see more and more, how the physical and moral characteristics of the delinquent belong equally to the prostitute, and how great the sympathies between the two classes. Both phenomena spring from oddness, misery, and especially from alcoholism. Both connected, likewise, with certain organic and hereditary tendencies, as Doug Dale has demonstrated in connection with the Duke family. When I compare the data brought together in tentacle writings, says Locatelli, with the results of my own experience, I am convinced that those authors have fallen into error who allege that the principal cause of prostitution is abandonment or the misery into which many of the young girls of the proletariat are plunged. Prostitution, in my opinion, like theft, springs from vicious natural tendencies of certain individuals, lack of education, abandonment, poverty, and bad example can be considered at most as secondary causes, just as family care and instruction may serve as salutary checks upon evil tendencies. The tendency to prostitution proceeds from a fundamental lack of the sense of modesty, which often manifests itself at the same time as the absence of all sexual feeling, for many of these unfortunates are of an apathetic temperament. They are automatons, who concern themselves with nothing and have almost no feeling. In their many and fleeting relationships, they show no preference. If they ever show favour to some particular lover, they do it, not from sympathy, but because it is the custom of their associates. They show themselves as indifferent to homage as to the most brutal abuse. This apathy, it is true, is interrupted from time to time by violent and figurative fits of passion. Bear also, there is a striking resemblance to the criminal with whom apathy, insensibility, violent and transitory passion, and idleness are dominant characteristics. But even if we hold strictly to legal definition and official statistics, it is plain that a part of the army of prostitutes must be enrolled as criminals also. Guerri observed that in London, 80% of the female criminals under 30 years of age came from among the prostitutes, and 7% of those over that age. Furthermore, prostitution, like female criminality, tends to increase with increasing civilization and approach to male criminality in amount. In London in 1834, the female criminals were 18.8% as numerous as the male, and in 1853, 25.7%, while in Spain the figure was as low as 11%, in France 20%, in Prussia 22%, in Scotland 23%. In Austria in general, the female criminality is 14% of the male, but in Vienna, it is 25%. But aside from these facts, many other grave reasons make us suspect that the criminality of women is greater than the statistics show. The crimes mentioned above, to which women are particularly addicted, are just those which are most easily concealed and most rarely led to trial. To this may be added the well-known fact of the greater obstinacy and intensity of criminality when it appears in a woman. 
Thus in America, delinquent girls have shown themselves more incorrigible than boys. However, it must be remembered in this connection that female criminals show fewer marks of degeneracy than criminal men. Subchapter 84. Civilization. In both sexes, but especially in the case of women, we see that the more serious crimes regularly increase as civilization decreases. On the other hand, the relation of the degree of civilization with vagrancy and similar offenses and with sexual crimes is not so definite. The following table gives a ratio which the frequency of the various crimes in southern and central Italy bears to that of the more civilized part of the kingdom. A table is displayed on the page titled Number of Crimes to One Committed in Northern Italy, listing murder and homicide, assault, highway robbery, theft and arson, compared to central Italy by men and by women, and southern Italy by men and by women. Abortion and infanticide are more frequent at an early age, the more civilized a country is, but more frequent at an advanced age, the less civilized it is. This appears to be due to the fact that the more civilized a country is, the more will fear of public dishonor induce a young girl who becomes pregnant to take criminal means to save her reputation. But where these crimes are more frequent between 21 and 40, it is not a clinging to reputation so much as an unfortunate custom that is the cause. It may be remarked in this connection that abortion is a widespread practice among savages. The number of persons sentenced by the correctional tribunals in France increased from 1831 to 1880 by 180% for the men and 110% for the women. The increase of school instruction in France, then, left the female criminality even lower than before in proportion to that of the men, while in 1888, among the recidivists, 1% of the men had a higher education and 9% an elementary education. None of the women had a higher education and only 5% an elementary one. Of the men, 30% were absolutely illiterate, and 47% of the women of 244 criminals transported in 1887-88. of the men and 39% of the women were illiterate. 53% of the men and 51% of the women could read and write. 15% of the men and 10% of the women had an elementary education, and 2% of the men, but none of the women, had a higher education. The same phenomenon is equally to be found in Germany. In 1854, 23% of the crimes were committed by women. In 1878, only 16%. So that, in this period, there was a constant diminution in female delinquency. In the country, the infanticides are more frequent, and in the cities, the abortions. Thus, in Germany in 1888, out of 172 infanticides, only one took place in Berlin. While of 216 abortions, 23 occurred in Berlin. In France, 75% of the infanticides take place in the country and 60% of the abortions in the cities. In many of the more highly civilized countries, such as England and Austria, female delinquency appears for a moment to be approaching that of men. But this is due to the influence of petty offenses, drunkenness, vagrancy, etc., as regards crimes proper, the criminality of women is much less than that of men and tends to diminish rather than increase. In countries still barbarous, female delinquency is infinitely less, so that in Bulgaria, Levele found almost no women in the prisons. If we look at the effect of great cities upon each crime in particular, we see that assaults, highway robberies, and thefts are more numerous in the great cities than the small towns or in the country. In Berlin, for example, the increased density of the population is a manifest cause of the increasing crimes committed by women. In fact, 21% of the crimes in the capital are committed by women, as against 16% for the empire at large. In England during the years 1859 to 1863, for every 100 men convicted at the SEs, there were respectively 35, 36, 38, 33, 31 and 32 women. But among the arrests made by the London police during about the same period, 1854 to 62. There were 57 women to 100 men, while in Liverpool, the number was 69 and in Dublin, 84. Fewer crimes against property are committed by married women and men than by unmarried. But of crimes in general, the married woman, above 30 years of age, commits more than the unmarried, though a similar statement could be made with regard to married men until they have passed the age of 70 a fad which may be attributed to crimes against the person, against the state, etc. 
Subject 85. Recidivists. In France, the number of recidivists has increased as follows. A table is displayed on the page, titled, Parentage of Criminals Who Are Recidivists, comparing the year, the men, and the women. Male criminals are then much more apt to become recidivists than women, and this tendency increases with advancing civilization as the figures show, and this may fairly be maintained, notwithstanding the allowance that must be made for error because of the fact that nowadays recidivists are much more easily recognized than formerly. It is well known that prisoners in penitentiaries relapse into crimes almost immediately upon their release, or at least within a short period of years, as shown in the following table. The table is displayed on the page titled Release Convicts Becoming Recidivists, comparing the year, percentages for men and the percentages for women. In Germany, the results are a little different, stark. Although in 1869, there was a somewhat smaller proportion of recidivists among the female criminals, the number rose gradually, and by 1882 had reached the percentage shown by the men. A table is played on the page titled Recidivists in Germany, comparing year, percentage of men, percentage for women, and the total percent. Mr. Duglia has shown that repeated relapses into crime are more frequent with Austrian women than single relapses. While in the case of male criminals, the two are about equal, the same thing is observed in Prussia, where 16% of the female cases are of women arrested for the first time, 17% of women arrested after the first relapse, 24% after the sixth, and 30% after seven or more relapses. In conclusion, we may affirm, first, female delinquency is only a fourth or fifth that of men, and only one sixteenth if we consider simply serious crimes. Second, Female criminality reaches its highest point as compared with male criminality in advanced age, the period of youth coming second, and middle life last. Taking the criminality of women absolutely without reference to that of men, we find the maximum old age only for the more serious crimes. In both sexes, the proportion of crimes committed in youth is very high. Third, in comparing the criminality of the two sexes, we find women participating more often in crimes which require less bodily strength, less culture, and less intellectual energy. Fourth, in both sexes, youth leads to crimes resulting from sudden anger and maturity in crimes that require premeditation. With women, however, the period of maturity leads to murder, homicide, and arson. Middle life, from 21 to 50 years, exceeds the two others in the total number of crimes. Fifth, the figures for crime in general, as well as for each class of crime, for each sex and in each country, are in general very consistent. In Italy, however, among the men, serious crimes are decreasing. Minor offences increasing among both sexes, but in the case of the women, serious offences are on the increase also. 6. Abortion and infanticide appear to be committed by women with more feelings of shame and less from ancient custom the more civilised the country. Thus, in northern Italy, these crimes are more common in youth, and in southern Italy, they are committed by the mature. Seventh, the effect of great cities upon the increase of crime is also marked in the case of women, and shows itself especially in the multiplication of assaults, highway robberies, and thefts. Eighth, prostitution largely takes the place of crime for women, thus explaining why women seem less criminal than men and also giving a probable reason why female criminality is greatest in old age, when prostitution no longer offers a profession. End of section 14